On the way here, I heard two nobles discussing where to hide. They think someone is stabbing all the nobles who dare to go to see Tanalasta and leaving them to die in the palace or to crawl out. Darve nodded. I heard that, too. It seems one made it as far as the royal gardens yesterday before collapsing. I can crown all. "'Rolligan said grandly, holding up a hand for attention. "'A guard in the palace, who's been stationed close to the dying king, "'says that the priests have been defeated by whatever ails him, "'and that they plan to keep our Azun on the throne "'by using dark magic to make him undead.' "'Turlstar snorted. "'Even if you believed the priests could agree with each other to do that, do you think the people would stand for it? Would they accept a regency where Venture de Hast rules after marrying Queen Filfabril? Tassara asked. I've heard that rumor several times. Yes, yes, Turlstars said disgustedly. And the purple dragons, the war wizards, and the nobles are all planning to seize the throne. Red wizards and Zentarim have been seen openly walking the promenade. Well, they have, Rolligan said sharply. I myself saw a man I know to be a Zent mageling. I've heard that a man walking north of the court, near the royal gardens, was seen to change shape. If that isn't the work of a wizard, Tassara sighed. So... The realm is falling apart as we watch, and loyal Venger de Hast is to blame, either because he's causing it, or he's not stopping it, Turlstars agreed heavily. Donath had been sitting silent behind his tankard, listening with growing horror, and then, slowly, a rising anger. How cynical these folk were, all of them. Did the king's life mean nothing? Did they believe no words spoken by any one of the court? He saw again a Zoon laughing in his saddle, arms spread wide, and heard a voice saying angrily, From where I come from, the word loyal is not an empty joke. The crown is worth upholding, worth fighting for. It is what makes us better than the money-grubbing Sembians or the savages of Tunland. Have a care for your words— for I will fight to see that King Azun's name remains unsullied. The young noble blinked. They were all staring at him. He had half risen from his seat. It seemed that the angry voice had been his own. Ah, he said in some confusion, noting that even Glarestir Rolligan was gaping at him, and sat down again. What I mean to say is that Lord Vangedehast is older than the mountains— why would he be a traitor? It sounds to me like he's just trying to keep the court running until the king is well again. Tassara's dark eyes narrowed. That's a peculiar way for a Marley ear to talk, supporting the crown. What do you mean? Donath asked softly, feeling a trembling rage surging up in him. Without thinking, his hand reached for his blade. His fingers met the cold edge of a drawn sword, blocking his way to his own scabbard. Tassara's eyes were as wintry as the steel under his fingertips as she said, "'Does your family not speak of such things as their war with King Dalmas, or the Prince Regent Salember, or do they prefer not to deal with past defeats?' "'I—' Donath began hotly, and then fell silent because he realized he had nothing to say. His family didn't speak of such matters, and this woman looked as if she knew exactly what she was talking about, as well as how to handle a sword. He'd not even seen her draw the blade that she was now slowly pulling back, tip lifted a little, to catch his gaze as a warning. He looked past it and into her eyes, and suddenly he thought how beautiful she looked, hard and confident, and— He knew he was blushing again, and managed to say— "'Lady, I meant no offence to anyone here. "'I was simply shocked by the way all of you spoke lightly of the realm,' "'Rolligan said roughly. "'Lad, that doesn't mean we don't love it. 
The short silence that followed his words was broken by a drawl from Darvey. Well, it seems the young high boots is a panther after all. Someone started to laugh, but fell silent. The entire snout room joined in the sudden, tense stillness. A man had come into the room, walking alone, a stout man in a plain brown robe, bound about it at the waist with a tasseled rope of the palest mauve. He looked about, his brown eyes almost stern, and Donneth felt as if the man's brief glance had named, measured, and taken inventory of all the clothing and gear of a certain young Marla ear. Though many would not have called the paunchy, bareheaded man in robes impressive, everyone in the roving dragon had fallen silent, and stayed that way as Vanjurdahast, the royal magician of Cormier, went to the table where the mercenary captain was sitting. They exchanged wordless nods, and the wizard sat down, favoring the room with a wry little smile as he did so. Abruptly the sounds of chatter, creaking cartwheels, and shouting street fenders filled the room. The sounds of the promenade outside somehow brought in to swirl about. Magic, of course, to keep others from overhearing. Donneth gaped at the stout wizard, who was leaning forward, elbows on the mercenary's table. They talked briefly and quietly, then nodded and rose together, striding out without looking around or acknowledging a tentative hail from Rolligan. The sounds of the street went out with them, leaving the end room of the roving dragon silent again. It was Tessara who broke the stillness, asking in a low voice, Now, why does the Lord High Wizard of Cormir need to hire mercenaries? To fight off rebellious nobles or purple dragons? Yes, and dragons loyal to whom? Turlstars said grimly. We'll know soon enough, I fear, Rolligan said almost wearily. He looked up at Donneth. You picked a bad time to come to Suzale, lad. The young noble shrugged, affecting a confidence he did not feel. If the realm needs me, Tassara smiled suddenly. It saves riding here, you mean? She shook her head and added, You may be called on all too soon. The realm needs strong, orderly rule, or your fellow nobles, locked in feuds and rivalries that go back past all our memories, will tear it apart like hungry wolves. I've never seen darker days in Suzale, Turlstars said heavily. What I want to know most of all is how can the realm survive? Sixteen. The King's Touch. Year of the Sea Princes. 432 DR. It's never been this bad, thought. Elvarin, crown silver in the darkness. How can the realm possibly survive? She looked around the night-shadowed forest. Here were the last of the great house of Oberskir, huddling in the dark, waiting for a traitor to bring them their first victory. Their first victory in three long years of being hunted through the king's own forest, or their final defeat. It had all begun with Beorobel's death, of course. Everything was always traced to the death of the original High Mage. Without his steadying hand, every wobble of fate seemed to bring the realm closer to its destruction. He seemed to be eternal, Cormir's protector, forever. And then he was gone. Amadehast, his student, was the best mage Crown Silver knew, but she was a mere shadow of her mentor. And how could they have known that their proud, prosperous kingdom was a merest soap bubble, which must be constantly protected from the harsh realities of the outside world, lest it collapse and swallow them all? A plague came first, borne by merchants from Marsember, decimating the folk of the countryside and turning bright Suzale into a charnel house, 
where the dead lay in heaps on the streets. At first, the priests fought it as best they could, but when the sickness spread so fast, and they had only so many healing spells and so many prayers left, the holy folk chose to keep their healings for themselves. A bad decision, since the city dwellers had more swords. When the dust cleared, there were no priests to be found, save those of Tolona, who spread the plague further. Then dragons descended on Suzale and Arabel, and every small encampment from the mountains to the sea. Great blues settled upon the fields, and tore apart houses, and massive reds laid fiery waste to entire regions. Greens raided the few ships and caravans that sought to reach Cormir. Even the mythical purple dragon was reported in an attack on the western settlements. Arabel was gone in a night, this latest rebellion championed by a Merchant's Revolutionary Committee. But now other holds and homesteads had risen and rebelled as well. It was hard to send men to aid the beleaguered crown when half the population was dying and the other half fighting dragons in the fields. Crown agents were killed and government coffers looted. Then the orcs arrived, driven south by some nasty battle in the Stonelands. Normally such a threat would bring Arabel back into the kingdom, but now there was little in the way of a Cormirian army to send aid. The goblin kin seized the heart of the king's forest, and when King Duar set out to defeat the orcish army, his own father-in-law, Meloneth Tarkassan, sold the city of Suzale to the pirates for five hundred sacks of gold. His majesty destroyed the largest of the orcish armies, but returned to find his throne stolen and the gates of his city barred against him. Worse, the pirate lord, Magrath the Minotaur, kept the crippled city as his prize and plundered the treasury for mercenaries to expand his reach into the rest of Cormir. That was three years ago and in three years those loyal to the crown had seen their numbers ebb, from battle losses, from treachery, and from raw despair. Many of the nobles, crown silver included, had shipped their families north to the dales or west to Waterdeep. The loyal nobles broke into smaller groups and still smaller bands. Duar's present band numbered only twenty. Elvarin looked about the glade in the full moonlight. She and her cousin Glorin True Silver, Jotor Tarkassan, who had broken with the rest of his treacherous family, Omelra Dracohorn, and Dintheron Bleth, the men were the last of the purple dragons, their adventuring group from before everything collapsed. The rest of their ragged band were non noble swordsmen and retainers, and King Duar, of course, and Amadahast. Duar waited in the darkness, looking more like a funereal statue than a living soul. He was a giant, even among Oberskiers, but his great muscular shoulders seemed weighed down by more than the crown he still wore. The betrayal of Meloneth had almost broken him, and it would take a long time for him to truly recover. The death of the Tarkassans later that year, at the hands of their treacherous allies, eased the pain only a little. He slept in his armor, and his tabard and robes were tattered and grimy. The only new item on his person was the sword Amadahast had crafted for him, Orbine, the Edge of Justice, which slept for the moment in a battered sheath. Duar had truly become king of the forest country a refugee hiding in the broad expanse of the king's forest. The orcs and goblins soon learned that this was not a land to settle in and retreated to the north. The dragons, too, had gone, returning to whatever slumber engulfed them after a rampage. And while Magrath the Minotaur put a prize on Duar's head, higher than what he'd paid for Suzale itself, he had few takers among the fearful common folk. The common folk. Crown Silver shook her head at the thought. 
entire hand counts of noble families, switched sides at the drop of a crown. Cities like Arabelle declared their independence with fickle regularity. But the common folk, the people in the farms and the villages and isolated homesteads, they always rallied around their king. Their group might be battered and beaten, looking little better than the brigands who now prowled the road from Suzale to Arabelle. Yet one look at their grim king always brought out the best food and hidden weapons and the secret supplies. Despite threats and bribes, the common folk stood by their king. And finally they heard some good news. Word came from her cousin, Agrast Huntsilver, that the high horn had fallen into their hands, and the military units there were willing to throw in with the king but only if Duar could produce a victory, and produce it fast. Crown Silver, His Majesty, and the Mage frowned over the maps for all one long day before choosing the site of the attack. It was central to the kingdom, lightly guarded, and most importantly, it was held by a noble family that had thrown in with Magrath's pirates, House Dioler. Elvarin frowned in the darkness, Duar's own grandfather had elevated the dealers to nobility, and they'd spent the next three generations plotting and planning and scheming. They gained the right to put their stockaded settlement in the heart of the forest, and then did everything in their power to undermine the crown. When Suzale was seized, House Dealer swore fealty to Magrath in an instant. There was a noise in the distance, no more than the snapping of a twig. Everyone stiffened at the sound, but Amadehast. The wizard stood up silently and looked in the direction of the noise. She had elven blood in her veins, but of late Elvarin was sure it was ice water. Rumor had it that some Cormirian noble had broken her heart at a young age. Elvarin just hoped for her sake— that said noble was not a crown silver. Amadehast looked like a woman who held grudges. Everyone held his breath for a moment, as something moved at the opposite edge of the glade. A lone man appeared, moving cautiously. He was dressed in a cotton blouse and patched woolen pants, and his unkempt gray hair jutted in all directions from beneath a shapeless cap. He held an unlit lantern in his hand. He was clearly visible in the moonlight, as were they. The old farmer waved the unlit lantern slowly. Amadehast duplicated the motion in return, and the farmer limped forward, smiling. Duar arose from where he'd been sitting. Upon seeing the king's face, the old farmer threw himself to his knees in respect. The king walked up to him and knelt as well taking the old man by the shoulder and lifting him to his feet. Crown Silver had seen this many times now. Duar had become very good at it, and it sealed the loyalty of the peasants he embraced so. The touch of a king still held great power. The two engaged in a conversation of hushed whispers. Amadehast and Crown Silver reached them at the same moment. Magrath is there! said Duar, smiling. So our information was correct, said Amadehast solemnly. Aye, said the farmer. He's a hulking beast, sire, with horns long as my arms. He's got his men up there as well. They're in the main feast hall, and will be for the next several hours. There are a lot of them. So the victory will be that much sweeter, said Duar. You knew— said Elvarin. You knew Magrath would be there. We suspected, said Amadehast. It was one reason we chose Dealer in the first place. We'll get Highhorn's troops if we win a town. But we can throw all the pirates into disarray if we kill or capture their leader. And what of the disarray if we lose you? thought Crown Silver. Instead, she said, Is this wise, Your Majesty? We are but twenty, and it's a full moon night. We'll be spotted as soon as we break cover. 
spotted by drunken guards and watchmen, more interested in what is going on within the settlement than without. Do you remember where the feast hall in Dealer is? I said Crown Silver stonily. I also remember the twenty-foot wall around the hold. What are we to do about that? Does Amadahast here have a spell that will allow us all to pass through walls? The wizard shot Crown Silver a look that froze her blood, but Elvarin did not care. If she was going to die following her king, it would not be because they had forgotten so simple a thing as the main gate. The plan is already well in hand, said Duar quietly. Trust me and follow me, as you have followed me thus far. With that, the farmer set off, followed by Amadahast, Duar, Crown Silver, and the others. They left their horses behind. Elvarin knew that if they needed mounts this night, it would be because their cause was already lost. Dealer was surrounded with a stout stockade, rising protectively around the warehouses and homes of House Dealer, the traitor house. Elvarin remembered what she could not yet see in the darkness. The place needed the protection of its wall, for even in the best of times, goblins and other monsters came wandering out of the king's forest. Inside now would be Lord Dealer, his loathsome and reptilian sister Pella, and Lady Threna, a cormeral who'd married into the household. Of the lot, Threna was the only one worth more than a bucket of warm suet. Elvarin hoped she would survive this night. But then she hoped all of the folk with her, advancing cautiously through the forest, would survive this night. The feast hall would also be the main warehouse, emptied for the revel. It stood to the right-hand side of the stockade, facing Dealer Manor on the left. A large and ugly sprawl of pretentious turrets and wings built on the ruins of a temple that once stood there. And whose temple had that been? Elvarin thought for a moment. Moander, Threna Cormeril, had told her. Some minor and malicious deity of rot and decay. Such a god would have a good home here, dealer was surrounded by low, peaty bogs and patches of marsh. This, more than any stockade wall, served it as protection. The farmer knew the way, and they kept to a series of forested rills, the ferns of the undergrowth slapping against their armored legs and thighs. All through their journey, Elvarin was concerned they'd be spotted, but if anyone noticed their passing— no alarm was raised. They reached the clearing that surrounded Dealer. The rebellious nobles had ordered the forest cut back a hundred yards in all directions, but had not maintained their vigilance since that burst of good sense. Already ferns and spindly saplings were growing in the blasted land. Still, one had a clear view of the stockade, the gatehouse, and a crudely built watchtower. Despite the full moon, Elvarin could not determine if the dark wooden structure was occupied. What now? Was Amadahast going to make herself invisible, fly over the walls, and open the gates for them? Elvarin could not believe the king would risk his last surviving mage. Duar said something to the wizard, and the farmer drew close with his lantern. Amadahast muttered something short and sharp, and a flame appeared at her fingertip. The farmer held the lantern steady. Its shutters closed. The mage lifted the glass globe and lit the wick. The farmer faced the settlement and opened the shutters of the lantern, then closed them again immediately. Then a second time, this time a little longer, then closed again. Short, long, short, long. There was a pause during which all in the royal party held their breath. Then there was a response from the guard tower itself. Short, long, short, long. Duar gave the signal to advance. The entire party, blades drawn, moved forward into the clearing. The farmer remained, and Duar turned to him. Elvarin passed near as the two talked. 
You have the thanks of the rightful king. What is your name, good man? Dead luck, sire, said the farmer, and he spelled it. King Duar nodded and said, When the victory is ours, you will be remembered. He laid a hand on the man's forearm, and the startled farmer clasped arms with his king as equals. When Duar released his grip, the man dropped immediately to his knees. The king clapped him on the shoulder and hauled him up again, and with that he and Elvarin joined the others. Elvarin's breathing was tight and ragged as they crossed the blasted field by moonlight. Duar had a spy within, probably another farmer like Deadluck, or perhaps a guard who'd volunteered for watch duty while the others were occupied. Or perhaps it was all a trap, and they'd arrive at the stockade with no open gate and no ladder or rope to gain entrance. Then archers would appear over the sharp rim of the palisade and cut them down like a farmer scything barley. They were almost at the wall when a shadowy line appeared in it. The gate had been opened, not fully, just a crack. The opening would have been invisible if the moon had not been full. They reached the gate, and Amadehast pulled it open enough to allow two men to pass through at a time. Elvarin was among the first into the encampment, alongside the king. They were alone on the other side of the gate. Of their benefactor, there was no sign. Behind them, Amadehast stepped inside, closed the gate, and drove the bolt home. Then she spoke a few words, and the lock flared with a brief yellow-green radiance. She had locked them inside. No one would be leaving this battle until it was over. The manor stood on one hand, and the large, improvised feast hall on the other. Crates and barrels had been removed for the celebration honoring Magrath, and were piled untidily at the ends of the warehouse. There was no sign of any guards. The manor was shrouded in darkness, but the thin, high windows of the warehouse were lit from within. The shouts and laughter of drunken men, muffled only slightly by the walls, streamed from the interior. Duar pointed at three of the common soldiers, and they crept forward with torches, again lit by the high mage of the wolf woods. A pile of canvas sacks provided tinder, and the flames licked at a pile of crates bunched against the side of the warehouse. They caught fire almost immediately, and a deep roar began. Flames flickered hungrily upward, and the thatch roof flared with a crackle. The reaction was almost immediate. There was a great chorus of shouting from within, orders were bellowed, women screamed, and the celebration became pandemonium. The main doors of the warehouse, facing the manor house, burst wide open, and a press of humanity streamed out, serving girls and cooks, merchants and toadies, all sprinting and stumbling, and behind them, led by Dealer himself, came the household guards. Behind those armored forms, framed in the growing radiance of the fire, was the shadowy hulk of Magrath himself. The women and servants fled from the reaching flames to the manor, sobbing, and Duar's men let them go. The warriors saw their waiting foes and strode forward without pause. With a cry, the purple dragons engaged them. Dealer, resplendent in black plate armor, brought all the way from Chondath, charged Duar. The chaste and fluted armor was Dealer's pride and joy and he'd apparently wanted to impress his guests by wearing it. The renegade noble's helm was down, and he looked like an angry clockwork figure. His blade was long and slightly curved, and its edge glittered in the moonlight. Duar stood to meet him, blade held out to one side, his tattered robes barely covering the chain-mail beneath. The gold circlet gleamed on his head. As Dealer rushed at him, Duar stepped aside, with a grace that belied his large frame. The renegade lord's blade sliced through the night air, the force of his cut turning him halfway around. Before Dealer could recover, the king's blade arched upward. Orbine's own soft glow rivaled that of the moon as it rose. 
there came the wet scream of cloven steel and flesh, and dealer's body and helm fell to the ground and bounced in separate places. Elvarin's enjoyment of the traitor's demise was hampered by her own difficulties in the form of three of Magrath's crew, two men and an orc. All wielded short blades, and one had a hook for a hand as well. Her sword gave her a longer reach than any of them, but they surrounded her, one keeping at her back at all times. She was forced to wheel, beat back an attack, wheel again to strike aside another attack, and turn swiftly once more to avoid yet another blow. They'd tire her out quickly at this game, and then close in for the kill, she realized, thrusting in unison. They knew her fate as well for exultant laughter was rising from their drunken lips. Hook-hand was at her back now. He lunged. Elvarin did not turn quite fast enough to avoid the blade, and she could feel the sharp burning sensation of the chain links of her vest being driven through her sweat-soaked fabric undershirt and into her flesh beneath. The sword's cutting edge had been stopped, but she could feel the wetness of blood oozing out between the links. Hookhand's blade snagged for a moment, caught in the ravaged chain mail, and Elvarin took advantage of the distraction to sway back from the slashing blade of one of her other attackers and reach out with her free hand as she did so. She grabbed the hooked hand of her assailant and pulled. The startled man snarled and tried to wrench free but Elvarin planted her feet firmly and jerked him off balance. Hookhand let out a cry as he was dragged by his hook. Elvarin swung him in a wide arc toward the orc. That twisted humanoid, the most drunken of the lot, only had time to look up and grunt a vague curse before his companion-at-arms slammed into him. Both crashed to the ground. With two down, the third pirate was child's play. Two quick slashes, and he lay on the soft earth at her feet, moaning and clutching vainly at the deep wounds in his belly. Twice Elvarin thrust down pitilessly. Hookhand and the orc would not be getting up. Almost as an afterthought, she slashed the third pirate's fingers away from his dagger, flicking both flesh and steel away out of his reach, and stepped back firmly bidding the pain in her side to be gone. She looked around. The manor yard had become a proper battlefield around her, and carnage pooled and flowed in tight little knots. True Silver was on the ground, his inert form being beaten with furniture by three goblins. Dealer lay beheaded not far away. King Duar was engaged with Megrath now, the Minotaur keeping glowing Orbine at bay with a huge double-headed axe. Of Amadahast there was no sign. Fifteen or so other small battles between king's men and renegades swirled in the space between the burning warehouse and the manor. Then Elvarin saw her a figure in dark robes moving stealthily opposite the fire, a flitting shadow in the night, circling to attack the king from behind. Her hood was down. It was Pella, dealer's sister, her cruel lips set. No doubt she was as poisonous and foul-tempered as ever. For a moment her hand showed in the full sleeve of her garment, and a dagger with a wavy, crooked blade glittered in the firelight. The king did not see her approach, but Magrath did. He worked to keep Duar busy, not pressing his attack, but hammering down so many quick, darting blows that the king was held in one place. Time and again Duar would lunge forward, only to have his blade turned aside by the battle-axe's thick ironwood haft. Pella circled around, placing herself behind the king. Elvarin shouted and charged forward, leading with her unwounded side. She did not try to use her blade, but instead slammed into Pella with her shoulder, sending the woman sprawling. The wicked dagger spun away into the darkness. The force of their meeting sent the staggering Elvarin to the ground as well, losing her grip on her blade. 
Capella recovered before she did, and in a moment she pounced on the crown silver warrior with serpent-like grace. Throwing herself on top of Elvarin, with thrusting knees, she clawed at the warrior's face. Elvarin heaved and gasped, trying to shift the woman off her. But Pella seemed to have the strength of a huge beast, not the puny might her fairly small frame should have commanded. Then one of those clawing hands drew back to strike, and Elvarin saw the horror of Pella's palms. Instead of unbroken cupped skin below her fingers, Pella dealer's flesh was split with twisted mouths filled with sharp teeth and framed with oozing green lips. Elvarin struggled frantically and turned her head to one side, but Pella brought her open, toothy palm down on the crown silver's bare cheek. Elvarin screamed as needle-sharp teeth bit into her flesh. Pella's hag-like laughter rose harsh and shrill around her. And then the laughter broke and ended. A slender hand had taken Pella by the hair, pulling her backward. The dealer noblewoman was unprepared, and the jaws closing on Elvarin's face loosened for a moment. Elvarin blinked back tears of pain and shook her head to shake away the blood and let her see. Amadehast was hauling Pella over backward by a hand locked in her hair. The noblewoman was clawing the air vainly, trying to reach the wizard, as she was peeled bodily away from Elvarin. Then the high maid shouted a spell, and her free hand burst into a ball of cold blue flame. Pella clutched at Amadehast, but the fangs in her palms seemed unable to gain purchase on her. Amadehast shoved the small fireball into Pella's face. The noblewoman screamed and writhed as roaring flames spread along her cloak and into her hair. The high mage let go and stepped back. Pella tried to rise, her eyes glowing holes against an ashen skull beneath. She staggered forward, faltered, and with a banshee's wail collapsed in a tattered heap of burning rags. Pella's final scream distracted Magrath the Minotaur, and that was all Duar needed. He drove his blade forward, glancing off the axe to catch the minotaur at the base of his breastbone, and shoved the steel upwards into the creature's ribcage. The great beast was pinioned on the blade like a bug on a needle. The great axe fell, and a choking howl burst from the pirate leader as blood gushed from his mouth. Then, slowly, the minotaur sagged down on the blade, flung up one arm, and twisted around, convulsing. Finally, he fell backward. With the death of Magrath, the fight went out of the rest of the defenders of the hold. Some laid down their weapons immediately, while others, particularly the goblins, sought to flee from the stockade. They were stopped by Amadahast's sealed gates— the would-be escapees tried to make a stand, but the king's men grimly cut them down where they stood. Elvarin stood up slowly and painfully, retrieving her blade. The wound in her side and the deep cut on her face rivaled each other for pain. The gouge on her cheek would likely scar, but at least she'd have a tale to tell for it. Amadehast could probably tell her what spell or curse had given Pella Diolur biting mouths in her palms, and if the wound itself was poisoned. There was a flash of blonde hair and blue cloth from the manor house door. Elvarin raised her blade, but Amadehast put a restraining hand on the swordswoman's shoulder. Threna Cormeril dashed down the steps and embraced the bloody duar. The force of their laughing embrace spun the weary king around, and he almost fell over. Elvarin chuckled, pain making the sound harsher than usual, and said, "'So that was our inside agent. I should have guessed. There has always been more than one way to conquer a town.' Amadehast made no reply. Elvarin looked at her. The high mage was stony in her silence, her brow furrowed deeply as if she'd been revisited by some old pain. 
Without a word, she turned and walked away, making for where the wounded were being gathered. In the light from the blazing warehouse, Elvarin watched the king and the lady holding each other. Victory! They had captured Deolur, and with Threna's aid, they'd be able to hold it. The forces from High Horn could then commit to a forest campaign, and with Magrath dead, the pirates might even abandon Suzale rather than face a siege. The days, the years ahead would not be easy, but Cormir might survive after all. Never underestimate the power of the king's touch, thought Elvarin. Using her sword to support herself, the warrior limped to where Amadahast was already unpacking the healing potions and poultices. 17. Meetings, Year of the Gauntlet, 1369 D.R. The man in the gem-studded tunic and cloth of gold breeches knelt, drew his sword, and laid it at the feet of the silent man in robes. Still on his knees, the gaudily-dressed nobleman looked up and said firmly, "'I, Embrin Crown Silver, being mindful of what I do, solemnly pledge my honour, my blade, and the arm that wields it, to support you as Regent of Cormir. I will fight to bring about the downfall of the decadent Oberskirs, who have ruled far too long. His last words rang around the small, high-ceilinged antechamber. "'Take up your sword,' the man he was kneeling before said quietly. "'Your words will be remembered.' Rather uncertainly, the crown-silver noble rose from his knees, jeweled blade in hand. Sheathing it with a flourish, he turned, half-cloak swirling, and strode hastily away. The man in robes watched him go. The nobles of this realm certainly talked to one another swiftly. That was the fifth pledge this morning, and nothing had been said in public yet about a regency. Not that such a silence was all that surprising. To many, in Suzale especially, the word regent was synonymous with tyrant, or one could just say solember. Vanger de Hast, the royal regent. The robed man smiled thinly and struck a dramatic pose, shading his eyes as he stared at the far wall of the chamber, an imaginary crown on his brow. Then he snorted in self-mockery and turned back to his spell-books. Strange things happen to kingdoms when folk start getting ideas. Not all that far away from the palace, in the nearest wing of the court, one nobleman turned to another and said, "'If my son ever gets back from traipsing around the wilderness with Princess Alasair, I'm going to send him away from the realm for a month or so. I don't want someone thinking he might make a good king, then sliding a sword through him to preclude that chance. "'A scatterhawk on the throne?' Sardin Wintersun mused. "'You know, I can see that. Does your son still think the moon, sun, and stars ride in the heart of the wayward princess?' Narbreath Scatterhawk looked a little smug. "'He does, my lord, and I can say more. A purple dragon she sent back from Evening Star with their last report says he saw her kiss him right on the lips and hungrily, like a tavern wench in front of everyone. Sardin chuckled and ran a hand through his white-streaked hair. I mean no slight to our friendship, my lord, but it's not for nothing that the common folk say Alasair would kiss her horse if it trotted up to her. The head of House Scatterhawk laughed, a little stiffly, but whatever he might have said was swept aside by a cheerful greeting from behind them both. "'Well met, this fair day, pillars of the realm!' Sardin rolled his eyes once in silent eloquence before he turned, and Narbreth almost sputtered with laughter. Almost. 
Andrin Dracohorn was resplendent in flaming scarlet, his swept-sleeved tunic open clear down to the waist to reveal a heavy row of golden spangle stars and medallions that resembled, but did not exactly duplicate, some of the medals awarded by the crown to valorous soldiers. The hue of his wardrobe was matched by the daringly slit gowns worn by the ladies on each of Andrin's arms, ladies whose beauty both of the other nobles had admired at feasts and revels before. They were the finest that discreet money could buy in Suzale. Their graceful elegance made the little man strutting between them look like a puffed-up peacock. Neither Sardin nor Narbreth bothered to tell him that, of course. Their houses, the scatter-hawks and winter suns, were minor nobility and country nobles to boot, and it would be ungracious to offend one of the more established city families. Instead, they put on broad smiles and said, "'Andrin, old friend,' and, "'How goes the Dracohorn all men of sense listen to?' "'Things couldn't be better, my lords, couldn't be better,' Andrin said with an airy wave of his hand. "'I've just heard that Embrin Crownsilver has been to see our court wizard about a certain matter.' The heads of House Scatterhawk and House Wintersun exchanged glances. "'We've heard about that affair, Andrin. You can speak freely,' Sardin replied, and then winked at one of the hired ladies. Said lady, a safe pace behind Andrin, and a head taller, was mouthing a wide-eyed and silently dramatic, "'No, please, no,' plea against his invitation to Andrin to talk. Andrin chuckled like the man of the world he was. "'I have secrets that I dare not yet reveal, even to such old and trusted friends as you. I'll say only this.' He leaned close, like a small boy furtively passing secrets, and whispered loudly, "'You'd better go see the royal magician. I'm setting him up as regent, you know.' Andrin's supposed regent was, at that moment, slipping behind a curtain in the guard robe attached to his chambers. The little corner of the room facing him held a marble bust of a bored-looking bearauble on a pedestal to Vanjur de Hast's left, and a shelf full of neatly folded towels and dishes of scented soaps on his right. A row of carved gargoyle faces, which bore an uncanny resemblance to the four previous high mages of the realm, ran along the wall, and the floor here was tiled in a chessboard pattern of alternating dark and light squares. Ignoring Beerobble's unmoving gaze, the royal magician put one hand on his head, stretched forward uncomfortably to touch the fingers of his other hand to a certain gargoyle nose, and then touched the toe of his right boot to a particular tile square. Silent radiance rose and sparkled around him. When it faded, he was somewhere else, Somewhere piled with towels and soaps was the servant's closet off the retiring room in one of the royal apartments. The voices he'd hoped to hear came clearly to his ears as he made a certain gesture, then sat down comfortably on nothing to listen, his generous behind perched on empty air. I know things seem dark, Tana, Onadar Bleth was saying soothingly. But Cormir has faced tougher times than this and survived. If the gods gather in your father, you'll just have to take the throne and rule as well as he would have wanted you to. The young princess's only reply was a royal sob. Whatever you decide, I'll be here, Onadar went on in a low voice. He was probably holding the crown princess with one hand and stroking her hair with the other, the wizard thought. He almost smiled, but instead the young Bleth's next words made him stiffen. I, and a few others like me, will stand with you, whatever the old wizard tries to do. He's gathering the nobles to proclaim him royal regent, you know. 
I've even heard he's going to use spells to fabricate some document or other signed by your father, authorizing him to rule. A document whose signature magically comes from some other writ, of course. He'll say he just plans to run the realm until you feel better able to do so, or until you produce an heir. But once he gets his hands on the dragon throne, no one of Oberskir blood will ever sit on it again. There was another sob, and then an agonized, whispering voice. But what shall I do? He has all those spells, and he knows where all father's magic and wealth lies hidden, and— and just what old feuds and embarrassments and promises will make all the nobles dance to any tune he plays. Not at all, Lady Highness. Bleth's voice was firm. Some few men stand ready to defend the cause of right. Some valiant few. I count myself fortunate to stand among them. When the realm needs me so, when you need me so, dove of my heart, oh, Onadar, the crown princess said with a thankful, tearful sigh. I don't know what I'd do without you. All of these grim men stride around, demanding that I make decisions, and all the while they're waiting for me to say one thing wrong. One thing! Then they can smile and nod and say, Aha! I knew she wasn't fit to rule. See what a mess she's made of her land! "'Best she be slain forthwith, or sent to one of our beds, "'to produce an heir we shall rear to be a proper king. "'I think you are fit to rule, my princess. "'I stand ready to fight with this sword to give you your chance, "'and I'll face all the wizards in Faerun, if that's what it takes.' "'Oh, Onadar!' Tanalasta gasped again. "'In the gloom of the servant's closet,' Vanjudahast made a mock-vomiting mime of disgust. If he had to listen to much more of this, the wet, murmuring sounds that were coming to his ears now meant that they were kissing, long, hungry, tightly embraced kisses, of the sort that made ladies-in-waiting swoon and old crones go all bright-eyed with nostalgia. Vanjudahast almost tore the closet door open and growled at them to get on with it. Then Onidar spoke again. I must leave you now, my sweet. The wizard's plots and schemes are relentless, and spread even as we speak. My friends and I must work against them tirelessly, or not a noble house in the land may be truly loyal to the new crowned Queen Tanalasta. Onidar, don't say that, the princess protested. Father's going to get well, and— "'Of course,' the young nobleman said quietly. "'And when he does, you'll be able to show him a decisive, even-handed, masterful stewardship of the realm, your work of devotion during his infirmity. I know you will. Fare thee well, Tana, until next our lips meet. Oh, Onadar, do take care. The wizard's folk are everywhere. Keep safe, will you?' Princess, I will, the young Bleth's voice came distantly, and a door closed. Tanalasta erupted into sobs. Vanjudahast listened to her for a time, pity on his frowning face, and then shrugged. So she wanted to be a true Oberskir? Then twas time, and past time, that she showed her mettle. Rule over a realm was not something to be played at. He opened the door soundlessly and walked to the low divan where she sat bent over, her face in her hands. It seemed to be her favorite place, and no doubt had seen much use over the last few months, what with the young Bleth sitting sideways on it, holding her hands between every court meal. Vanjudahast sighed loudly, and sat down with a thump beside the princess. Tanalasta's head jerked up. Her face was as white as a statue, except where two silvery trails of tears ran down her cheeks from red-rimmed eyes. "'You!' she said in horror. "'How did you get in here?' 
ventured to hast, gave her a merry smile. "'Magic, Lady Highness, you know, waggle the fingers, and it's what keeps Cormir strong.' Tanalasta drew herself up, then rose to stand facing him, eyes glittering with hatred. "'Are you threatening me, wizard?' The royal magician met her dagger-like gaze calmly and said, "'Child, I never threaten. I promise.' Tanalasta's lips drew together in a tight line. "'I ought to have you thrown in irons, whipped, and then beheaded for bursting into a woman's chambers unbidden. You might be here to get an heir for yourself.' Vangita Hast rolled his eyes. "'Nothing so energetic, Lady Princess. No, I'm here for another reason.' He reached into the breast of his robes and drew forth a folded parchment. Tanalasta's eyes widened when she saw the royal seals. Then they narrowed. "'No, this is not the forged writ that young Onodar has been going around telling people I was making with magic,' the wizard said testily. "'If you care to examine it yourself, you'll see that the seals are unbroken and that none of them are azooms.' He held out the parchment, and after a swaying moment of indecision, wherein she obviously feared some sort of magical trap, the princess snatched it from him and stared at the seals. The state seal, the old court seal, which was in the keeping of her mother, the queen, and Philpharel's own seal, with the two small obersker pendants she always added. Impatiently, Tanalasta broke them, froze for a moment for fear that she might have ignited some waiting magical trap, and then, when nothing happened, unfolded the parchment. "'As you can see,' Vangita Hast said almost wearily, "'it is a fresh writ of regency, signed by your mother, Queen Philpharel. Since both you and your young Bleth seemed so contemptuous of King Azun's own authority on an earlier document, and that of his father, Rygaird, I took the precaution of procuring yet another authorization for my authority. As you can also see, it awaits your signature. My first concern, as always, is the safety of the realm, but I have no interest in ruling over the strident objections of the Oberskir heir if I can possibly avoid doing so. You expect me to sign this? The princess snapped, nostrils flaring. I expect you to consider the implications of everything you do with the greater good of the realm, and not what you may personally want, always foremost in your mind. It's what your ancestors, and the wizards who have served them, from Beorobble the Wise to, well, myself, have always done. It's what sitting on the dragon throne has always been about. You just want to force me into giving you the crown, Tanalasta whispered, her voice trembling with rage. No less, I don't, the wizard said flatly. If wearing the crown were all that mattered to me, I could take it in an instant. You know that, as Onodar never tires of reminding you, I do have all those spells. "'Then why haven't you taken it, or named yourself Regent?' Tanalasta almost screamed. "'What is your game, wizard?' "'Life is my only game, Tanalasta, the life of the realm, and of every last scheming noble, tame dog, and silly princess in it. I work to make Cormir ever stronger, not larger, not more decadent, but always a better place to live.' It's a long, long game, but then I've never been a short-bet man myself. Tanalasta frowned, and with her eyes steady on the wizards, slowly started to crumple the parchment. There was a flash, a soft, numbing movement through her fingertips, and she was holding empty air. Vangerta Hast was holding the parchment himself. In fact, he was waving it at her. He raised his eyebrows and asked, I take it you'll not sign this? Never, Tanalasta spat. I don't know what vile magic you used on my mother to get her to sign it, but you'll never get me to give in to you and your schemes. What have you done with her? Vangerda Hast blinked. Done with her? Nothing, child. You read too many hot romances. Get out, 
Tenelasta shrieked, pointing an imperious arm at the door. Just get out! The wizard rose. You can't run away from problems forever, you know. If you don't bother to rule the kingdom, someone else will step in and do it for you. Such as you, perhaps, the crown princess said with a sneer. The royal magician shrugged. Or anyone. If you don't care who does it, literally anyone could take the throne. A grasping Sembian merchant, perhaps. Or a Zentarim, a priestess of Laviatar, who might find it fitting that royalty feel pain every night. Who knows? Deciding to rule or not to rule, and what to do if you do wear the crown, is a decision you must make. And, Princess, it is best for the realm if you make it alone, not with Onadar, not with your ladies-in-waiting, not with Alafandar or Dimswart or even me. Otherwise, it won't truly be your decision. The door still awaits you, Tanalasta said coldly. Vangerdehast bowed his head, then sketched a bent-knee court bow. "'Until next we meet, princess. I hope that's never!' she cried, the fury building in her voice. "'Shall I say, until you make a decision, then?' he asked mildly, his hand on the door. A moment later he was through it and striding away." listening to the shattering of expensive glass and china as the weeping princess hurled perfume bottle after cordial decanter at the closed door. "'It's always so tiring,' the Lord High Wizard told no one in particular, as he wearily walked the halls back to his own apartments. "'When one has to deal with children, there is such a thing as sheltering little girls too much from the world.' Then he thought of Alisair, as he'd once far scried her, hacking through a band of brigands, her hair flying around her, and her half-naked body drenched with blood, and said wryly, "'And then, of course, there's the other way.' When the radiance faded this time, Vangertahast was a safe few paces outside whatever wards the Magus cat— might have set to protect Redstone Castle. The front gate stood ajar, of course. He stepped inside, glancing critically at the gardens, and noted approvingly that Lady Wyvern's spur seemed to have taken things strongly in hand. Wearily, was a wizard's work ever done? He strode up to the hall. As he approached the steps that led up to the front doors, they opened— and Gyogi Wyvernspur stepped out, resplendent in fawn-colored leather breeches, a purple shirt with cloth-of-gold sash and half-cloak, and a pair of old, battered, comfortable-looking brown boots. Vangertahast sighed with relief, just whom he'd wanted to see. Now there wouldn't be an hour wasted on challenges and servants' questions and little lads goggling in awe at the mightiest wizard in the land. Gyogi sniffed the air, smiled happily, and glanced about, nearly falling off the doorstep in surprise when he saw the old bearded man in plain robes looking up at him from a few steps away. Gods! What? I mean, hey-ho! Fanchi, Ah, Lord High Wizard, he said with a grin. How's the ruling Cormier from behind the throne business these days? That's what I've come to talk to you about, Vangita has said gravely, taking the noble by the arm. Do you still have some of those silly stone benches about? Giyogi sighed. This sounds serious. You're going to talk a bit, aren't you? He pointed and sighed again. Over here. They sat, and the royal magician said quickly, "'You may or may not have heard that Duke Beru is dead. Baron Thomdor hangs on the edge of his grave, and the king is gravely ill and expected to die, too. Rest assured that this much, at least, is the truth.' Giogi grew somber at once. "'We had heard rumors, even out in the countryside, but no details. How?' "'A hunting accident involving possible treason.' Vangertahast said grimly, "'Which we haven't yet gotten to the bottom of. I'll tell you more later, but first I must tell you why I'm here. 
Gyogi was still gasping like a fish on the Immersea docks. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, for the good of the realm, Vendrita Hast said gravely, I think I must assume the title of regent at this time. Filfarel's out of her head with grief. Alasair's nowhere to be found. And Crown Princess Tanalasta is head over heels in love with a grasping young noble who'd love to tell her what decisions to make for the realm. Unfortunately, she wants to do more crying than ruling, so I feel I must rule from the foot of the throne for a time. Giyogi's eyes narrowed. And so... And so I need to know who will support me as regent. In particular, if Princess Tanalasta or a large group of nobles says I should not be or presents rival temporary rulers for our land. If Venture de Hast declares himself regent, will I have the support of the Wyvern Spurs? Silence fell. Giyogi cleared his throat finally and said, Uh, well, this is all so sudden— "'That's more or less what Tanalast has been saying as the days pass,' Vendrita Hast said dryly. "'I need to know, Giogioni, and I need to know soon. Where do the wyvern spurs stand?' "'Uh, ha!' "'Well,' Giogi said, floundering, and stood up to pace. His hand drifted to his sword, and he suddenly looked down at the old wizard, his hand on his hilt, and asked sharply, so, Thondor's still alive. The king lives too. Yes, and yes, the royal magician replied, nodding. And Princess Alasair, she's on a foray up in the Stonelands, isn't she? Have you sent her a message? I have, Vendrita Hast confirmed. Why do you ask? I can't speak for my kin until I have enough answers to give, so I don't appear a complete fool, Giyogi replied. So what did Alasair say? There has been no reply, Vangita Hast said gravely. The wyvern spur frowned. There's something you're not telling me about this. What is it? Vangita Hast's brows drew together in a frown. Many nobles of Cormir, folk of good families, with reputations for honor that go back generations, have gladly given their support for my regency without demanding answers to a lot of pressing questions. He stood up slowly, a glint in his eye. If you don't feel you can support me, say so. But if you want Cormir to be a friendly home for you and yours in the future, perhaps you'd best get on the boat, or it just might sail away without you. Yogi's slim, jewel-pommeled rapier slid out of its scabbard. The wyvern spurs, so far as I can recall right now, have always been loyal to the crown, he said coldly. And that's not going to change while I stand ready to defend the realm. I challenge you, wizard, in the name of Azun, rightful king of Cormir. I shall fight you here and now unless you promise you'll do everything in your power to keep the king alive. And if you fail... You'll then support an Oberskir to assume the throne and obey her as loyally and as diligently as you did her father. The old man in robes looked up at him with disgust on his face. Do all you young idiots keep your brains in those slim scabbards? What good will challenging me do? I'm not in the habit of making promises under threat, and if you believe anyone will keep such promises, you are the fool you've so often been labeled. He matched the angry nobleman's swordsman's stance, empty-handed, and added, "'Besides, I fight with spells, not swords.' Sudden radiance flickered around one of the royal magician's arms, flowing up and down it like racing flames. Giyogi gulped, threw his sword behind him, and suddenly became a rising, shifting thing of red scales— his sleepy eyes became large and golden, and his arms began to meld into wings. The gift of the wyvern spurs, sometimes called their curse as well, was the ability to transform into the winged, dragon-like beast they took their name from. For all his apparent foolishness, young Lord Wyvern Spur knew what he could do in wyvern form. Oh, no, you don't! Vangita Hast said levelly. Let's not play at battling old mages this afternoon, thank you. 
The flowing radiance on his arm raced down into his sleeve and touched a wand that hung half-concealed there. The wand flashed, shuddered, and spat forth a stream of eerie golden-green light that swirled around the rapidly growing form of the wyvern, and suddenly there was another blurring and a strange singing sound, and Giogione wyvern spur stood in his own form once more, blinking at the royal magician. Before this continues, and one of us does something extremely foolish or gets hurt, Vangita Hurst said, I'd best... The Lord High Wizard of Cormir was not young, and had seen his share of spell battles. Moreover, he was very quick and expecting trouble. It never seemed to take him too long to find it. Wherefore, when he heard the first whispered syllable from up the steps and off to his right, he willed his ready spell-shield to coalesce. The spell that should have hurled him clear out through the front gates of Redstone Castle, instead, struck the mystic shield, and simply washed over the wizard in flickering, impotent streamers of radiance, then faded into the air. "'Well met, Cat,' he said calmly, turning from the dazed Giyogi, to face the furious, copper-haired woman at the castle door. "'I've just been talking to your Giyogioni here.' "'Talk!' Cat snapped, her green eyes blazing. Gods, but she was beautiful, the old wizard thought. Was he himself the only homely male who wove spells in this kingdom? Is that how the royal magician talks to people? Vangitahas made a gesture, and Giyogi's rapier flew smoothly up to its owner's hand. Still looking dazed and shocked, Giyogi slid it back into its scabbard. The old wizard nodded. Good. I hate trying to talk to folk who are trying to kill me. What is this all about, Lord Wizard? Cat demanded, hands on hips now. You come here and attack my Giyogi right on his own front steps? Vangitahast held up a hand to halt her angry torrent. Please desist. Accept my apologies. You have every right to be furious. The Lord High Wizard of the Realm humbles himself before you. But not too much, Giyogi added, managing a smile. The old wizard's face split in an answering grin, his first real one that day as it happened, as he clapped the noble on his shoulder and urged him up the steps to the waiting, still angry cat. If you'll protect me, "'Against your good wife,' ventured to Hast, said gravely. "'I'll have the chance I need to talk to you both, for the good of the realm.' "'Trying to convince us you'll make a good regent?' Giyogi asked grimly. But he did not slow their climb up the steps together. Ventured to Hast shook his head. "'You have made your choice, while most of your fellow nobles of Cormier are still sizing up the contenders. You have queried—' while others have gladly grasped. We must talk, young Wyvern Spur. You're not going to try to keep me out of this? Cat asked in a dangerously soft voice. Lady, the royal magician replied in solemn tones as the three retired to the halls of Redstone Castle. I'd not dare to. Elsewhere, a man fidgeted nervously in a hidden room, waiting for his assignation, rubbing his hands nervously as he paced. He couldn't spend all afternoon in some broom closet. Where was she? The broom closet in question was a small secret chamber, unused for years. The dust lay heavy on the low stone bench and polished duskwood table that were its only ornament. A pair of narrow passages, so narrow that only a child could move easily through them, led off to either side. The man's candle flickered, and he was aware she was coming. The air over the table thickened and curdled, turning into a ball of serpentine smoke. At the center of the ball lay a pair of eyes, the color of flaming jets, black with red pips dancing at their centers. Hail, Cormirian, 
said the eyes in a soft, purring voice. Brantara, snapped the man in response. He was sure that name was no more her true appellation than the writhing mass was her true form. I trust that everything has gone smoothly. Not smoothly enough, said the man. The king still lives, and one of his damnable cousins as well. Your clockwork toy did not work as well as hoped. Not my toy, said the swirling mist calmly. Only my venom carrying its deadly disease. The golden creature is known to Cormir, if not to its current rulers. I think that an extremely amusing jest. How fares the king? Badly, said the man. There is little hope for him, though for now there is no way to get near him. He is surrounded by guards and priests and other nobles at all times. If you are to kill a king, you must strike surely with the first blow, said the soft feminine voice. Your venom was supposed to do the job at once, hissed the man. A poor workman blames his tools, said the voice, and the man was sure there was a smile on the lips that spoke those words. Regardless, said the man, Azun, lingering on his deathbed, does not help our cause. The king's wizard is already meddling and dabbling. Can you not do something? Now the voice laughed. Do something, like magically teleport myself into that sick room, flinging fireballs and loosing lightning bolts. If I had the power to destroy Vangela Hast and his war wizards, do you not think I would use it? Nay, patience is the better course here. Brantara, began the man, but the voice made an urgent, shushing noise. Patience, it said. We will both get what we wish. In the meantime, I have another toy for you. A tendril of mist extruded from the smoky mass and touched the table. When it withdrew, there was a large ruby glittering on the duskwood surface. When you first activated the Abraxas, you sacrificed one of your own servants to bring it life, said the voice. This ruby will allow you sacrifice another at a distance. But the Abraxas has been dismantled, said the man. The remaining pieces have been locked away. Hush, said the voice. Give the stone to another, not a royal and not a wizard, someone who will be near you when the final confrontation comes, with that overweight slug of a royal magician. When the time is at hand, you will know how to use it. The man picked up the stone, turning it over in his black-gloved fingers gingerly, as if it would explode at any moment. I do not trust you fully, he said at last. Nor I you fully, said the mist. Yet we trust each other enough to join together for a common goal. Maintain your act, your lordship, and all will come to you. With that, the fiery lights within the smoke dimmed, indicating the audience was over. The man looked again at the blood-colored gem, then placed it in his pocket. Then, carefully, using his candle to guide his path, he slid back along the narrow passage, heading for more populated parts of the castle. After he left, the smoky lights flared briefly, and the flame-jet eyes opened once more. "'That one has spine,' said the glowing eyes softly to the darkness, "'and magical protection of his own now.' Perhaps it is time to pull the strings of other puppets if the throne of Cormir is truly to be mine.
18. Cats and Wizards, Year of the Empty Hearth, 629 D.R. Thunderahast, newest member of the Brotherhood of the Wizards of War, eased himself carefully along the ledge. He could have used a simple spell to allow him to climb the side of the building, but he trusted Luthax to have wards against spells and those who used them. So it was back to the old ways of his childhood. The chill autumn wind whipped around and through him, and he wished he were wearing something heavier than his dark shirt and leather leggings. A cloak would flap with an incessant thunder in this thin, stiff breeze, and a full set of wizard's robes would catch in the wind and send him spiraling head over heels over the slate roofs of Suzale like an errant kite. Luthax would be amused by that, but then Luthax would be amused by anything that involved maiming his junior officer. "'Listen, orc spawn,' Luthax had said on Thanderhast's very first day. "'The only reason you're here is that your auntie Amadahast is the high magus, but that doesn't cut clean with me, and I'm going to be on your back like a tick on a bullock until you decide to take up another line of work.' His relationship to Amadahast was distant, but distinct, though there were few wizards in the line. Indeed, Thunderahast would rather be picking through the ruins of ancient Asram and Hlondath, or studying in the elven libraries of Mithdranor, than playing spy on the lonely roofs of Suzale. At first, Thunderahast thought Luthax believed that his junior mage was competition, Beerobel, the Venerable, had chosen one of his bloodline as his successor, and possibly Luthax worried that Thunderahast would be a similar replacement to the aging High Magus. But it went deeper than that. Luthax was mean, clear through to the bone, and he obviously enjoyed assigning the younger mage the most unpleasant and difficult of tasks, and telling others, including Amadahast, of his failures. Most of the court already thought Thunderahast was a fool, thanks to Luthax's slander. There were footsteps on the cobbles below, and Thunderahast froze, holding his breath. A pair of purple dragons, the king's own elite, were on patrol through the district. Their deep violet capes were bunched tightly around them, and they looked neither right nor left as they passed along the row of stone townhouses. Looking up the hill at the castle, Thunderahast waited until the armsmen had rounded the corner. Rebuilt, along with most of the rest of Suzale after the pirate years, Castle Oberskir sprawled over the low hillocks, surrounded by broad lawns and concealed redoubts. No one would sneak up on the Oberskirs again. Thunderahast considered returning to the castle and waiting for Amadahast's return. She was away on court business, as she was so often these days. Thanks to Luthax's malicious gossip, Thunderahast's stock at court was none too high, so he had to play spy on his own. Luthax was up to something. Of that, Thunderahast had no doubt. The burly wizard, senior mage in the kingdom behind Amadahast, was the Castellan of Magic and the effective leader of the Brotherhood. Yet he was a nasty customer, unctuous and fawning to his betters, boisterous and bragging to his equals, and Gehenna on a plate to those he thought his inferiors, like junior officers, like Thanderahast. But for the past month his actions have been even more intriguing, mysterious comings and goings, particularly with the other noble houses, sudden retirements of high members of the order, and the promotions of Luthax's friends to brotherhood offices. The junior officers and lesser mages were being treated more as pawns than as students. Thanderahast had mentioned all this to Amadahast, and her only response had been, "'Then you had better keep an eye on him, hadn't you?' which brought him to this wide stone ledge on the outside of a noble's house in the city on a cold autumn night. He edged forward and almost pitched off the side of the building as one of the shadows moved before he set his foot down. 
a night-black cat jumped up from its hiding place, stretched, and meowed irritatedly at the young mage. What was a cat doing on a third-floor ledge? wondered Thanderhast, at least after his heart had regained its normal rhythm. Cats were everywhere, it seemed. The high magus had imported them after the last plague from Marsember, and their presence seemed to have acted as a talisman protecting the city from other such diseases. Amadehast favored cats, and during visits to his notable ancestor, Thanderahast had noted that there were always about a dozen running free in her chambers at any one time. If they weren't hissing at each other over stacks of spellbooks, they were regarding the young guest scornfully from high, secure shelves, or dancing their way through forests of glass alembics and other delicate instruments. King Draxius Oberskir, on the other hand, did not like cats. It was no ill experience or sneezing sickness that motivated him, folks said, just a disdain for their familiarity and their lack of devotion. If cats would act like dogs, the king would have no problem with them. Amadehast remembered that the king had once banned cats from the castle, until the vermin grew so numerous that the cooks complained. The black cat, thin and untherian in origin, shivered and laced itself around Thanderahast's ankles. It had a typical cat's ability, the young mage noted, to put itself just where you wanted to step next. The small creature looked up, revealing a white dollop of fur beneath its chin. It regarded his with emerald-green eyes and mewled imploringly at him. "'Sorry, Kitty, I have no food,' Thanderahast whispered. But the cat would not be denied. Circling around his ankles, its meows becoming louder and more urgent. Finally, the young wizard picked up the cat and cradled it against his breast. The lean black cat was a ball of furry warmth, and immediately cuddled against him, purring loudly. Thanderahast gave a mighty sigh, and then inched onward. Why couldn't Luthax have chosen to have his clandestine meetings in a basement somewhere? His goal was a set of thin windows along the front of the building. The house belonged to the Emerask household. One of the noble Emerasks, Elmariel, was a trusted crony of Luthax's, and so, of course, he had now risen to be almost as powerful as Luthax himself in the Brotherhood. If this house matched a dozen seemingly identical others scattered throughout the city, the street side of the third floor would house the reception parlor. Thanderahast was not disappointed. The closest of the thin windows, mostly lead and iron and wrapping bits of colored glass, had been cracked open. The warmth of a fire and the smell of wizard's pipes spilled out. The cat, Thanderahast held, yawned deeply at the smell, gave a cat-sized sneeze, and resumed its slumber against the young wizard's chest. "'Weakness!' Luthax was saying. Thanderahast could identify that booming voice across a crowded hall, and the senior wizard was in full form. "'That is what we are worried about. "'The court wizard grows older and more enfeebled with each passing year, "'and we remember what happened when Beorobel passed on. "'Without a strong mage behind the throne, "'the kingdom quickly falls to ruin. "'The vaunted Oberskir blood provides the realm no protection "'without the power of magic behind it.' "'Thanderahast leaned forward to survey the room. "'There were about thirty people inside.' The top six officers of the Brotherhood were there, in their black and red robes, festooned with eldritch symbols and self-awarded medallions. The rest were lesser nobles, and some of the most prominent merchants in Suzale. But Thanderahast's eyes widened as he recognized members of the Bleth, Daunting Horn, Elance, and Goldfeather houses, plus one or two minor crown silvers a powerful group to be gathered in such a small room. Luthax stood by the fire, Elmariel Emerask at his side. All eyes were on Luthax. 
powerful, broad-shouldered Luthax. The robes hid most of his paunch, and the hearth accentuated the deep crags in his face and over-large nose, making him look all the more serious and wise. His beard was long and reddish-brown, and it was said he shaved his head daily to make himself look more sage and puissant. "'When magic was not strong,' said Luthax, "'the kingdom was not strong. Kings and princes are irrelevant to stable governance of the realm if good spellcrafting does not exist. This is one reason we formed the Brotherhood of the Wizards of War.' Thanderahast stifled a snort. Amadehast formed the Brotherhood, not Luthax. She did so to supplement her own abilities with a school of mages loyal to the crown, but also to keep track of the wizards who were appearing in greater and greater numbers in the forest kingdom. "'Popping up like mushrooms after a good rain,' as she said to Thanderahast once. Luthax paced as he spoke, punctuating his points with an upraised finger. Now the high magus grows feeble, and spends her time with her spells and her travels. She is more often than not away in some distant plain, as she is this evening. She has lost interest in Cormir and its petty kings, yet she still refuses to step down. There was a murmur of assent in the room, and a sudden steaming of hard-drawn pipes— Thanderahast did not like where this was going. Luthax continued, At the same time, Draxius himself has passed harsh laws against further logging in the king's forest, and denied the rights of the noble houses there. And while he conquered Arabel, he did not give those lands to the nobles who fought beside him, but rather left the noble families there in place, as if their defiant rebellions had never occurred. And this— at the recommendation of the senile high magus. More murmurs, and a hear, hear, probably from one of the Ilances. So, the blood of the Obarskirs has run thin, and the high magus of the realm has become an old crone, leaning on her staff and weaving insane plots. More shouts of assent. Luthax was twisting the hearts and minds of this audience, using his own personal charm and argument to make his points. Thanderahast bridled at the description of his seven times great aunt. Amadahast was no crone, nor did she need any support. The day I need a staff is the day I die, she had told him once. Now is the time for action. Now is the time for heroes. Now is the time for a new way of doing things in this nation, if Cormir is to survive. Luthax coughed and then raised his voice again until it rang from the rafters. "'You, gathered here, are the vanguard. You are the best and the brightest of the merchants, the nobles, and the mages of fair Cormir, who have labored all too long in the shadows of foolish kings and vain high wizards. We have it in our power to take command of this land and lead it to greatness. All we need is the proper weapon.' Luthax was pacing now, back and forth, his favorite mannerism when speaking. My companion, Elmariel, has returned from exploring the ruins of Netheril with an elder prize, the senior mage said triumphantly. A bit of magic from the lost days when mages ruled the world. With this weapon, we can rid ourselves of those who would impede us. Luthax's voice caught for a moment. Thanderahast ducked away, then froze. Had he been spotted at the window? No, the senior mage resumed his discourse, and when Thanderahast looked again, had taken up pacing again, too. We are truly the wise heads of Cormir, Luthax proclaimed, and waited for the assenting murmurs of the crowd before continuing. We can rule more wisely than any blood-tainted king or everlasting magus. We judge ourselves on merit and on real tangible power, and we must be ready to move and move quickly when the time comes to take the reins of power from old, enfeebled hands. 
Thandera Hast would have wanted to hear more of Luthax's schemes, but the cat against his chest began to squirm and howl, not the mewling cry of an imprisoned feline, but rather a deep-throated grumble that spoke of immediate threats. The cat's tiny claws pierced his cotton shirt and drove shallowly into the young mage's flesh. Thandera Hast stepped back from the window and pulled the cat away from his breast. Its fur was all on end, and its eyes were wide. It did not try to struggle against Thandera Hast's grip, but instead spit and hissed at the autumn air. No, not the autumn air, the young mage realized. Rather, the cat hissed at something hanging in the air. It appeared as little more than a ripple in the starlight, a slight flickering of the few windows still lit. It was wholly invisible, save for its edges, which shone like a soap bubble to reveal its troll-like form and its teeth, which gleamed like clear icicles. Thandera Hast retreated two more steps along the ledge, cat at his bosom, mind racing through his memorized lore to identify the creature. This must be Elmariel's creature from Netheril. He'd been spotted after all, and this beast had been dispatched to take care of him. The junior mage began an incantation of protection, but it was already too late. The beast swooped down upon him and gathered him up in invisible arms that coiled around him like serpents. Thandera Hast choked back an involuntary shout, for those in the parlor would not come to his aid. The invisible beast pulled Thanderahast off the ledge and suspended him over the street below. Thanderahast hung there as the night lights of Suzale swam all around him. Then it threw him to the pavement from three floors up. The young mage clutched the cat and screamed. He landed too soon to have fallen that far. It appeared to be a dimly lit hallway. He had not fallen more than three feet, and he had struck not rude cobbles, but solid flagstones. The chill was gone, and the wind as well. He was inside a building, and a sharp pain was blossoming in one shoulder, where he had struck the flags. The cat had leapt out of his arms when he struck, and was now calmly cleaning itself a few feet away. He knew this place. He was not just in a building. He was inside the castle itself, could the netheril creature have thrown him that far, or magically transported him there? You must get to the king, said the cat. Thanderahast shook his head, certain that a speaking cat was the result of wits dazed in his fall, and looked at the cat. Its eyes were glowing a radiant green, and it spoke with Amadahast's voice. You must get to the king, it repeated, before Luthax's beast does. He is in his quarters. I will take care of the conspirators. The glow faded from the small creature's eyes. It resumed grooming itself, oblivious to the spell that had surrounded it. Thanderahast nodded and scooped the cat up, starting down the hallway. This part of the castle was strange to him, since he had never been in the royal wing. But all knew where the king's quarters were. The light from that room's fire would burn long into the night. The hallways were empty, and Thanderahast's soft-soled shoes slapped hard against the flagstones. Right, then left, then an immediate right, and there would be a hulking guard in the violet and ivory of the purple dragons standing before the door that led to the king's chambers. He held up one hand. A war-axe gleamed in the other. "'Hold, young wizard,' he said, eyes stern. "'Why are you here at this late hour?' Thanderahast drew a deep breath. What could he say? He'd been spying on the leader of the war-wizards, and a cat had told him the king's life was in danger? Instead, the mage thrust the cat up into view. As the guard stared at it, Thanderahast barked a series of short syllables that were old when Netheril was young, and thrust out his free hand to touch the guard on the forehead. 
The guard managed to let out a mild curse as he slumped against the wall and then sagged there, snoring softly as magical slumber claimed him. Thanderahast burst through the doorway into an empty antechamber, then through its low arch into the king's own private quarters. There was an immediate squeal and a flash of pink flesh and blonde hair as the woman in the king's bed burrowed deeply beneath the covers. His majesty himself was standing before the fire in a long nightshirt, a poker in hand, turning with a frown from tending the fire. Beyond him, the window was open to better vent its smoke. Draxius's expression began with bewilderment, and clouded toward anger. "'What is the meaning?' he began. Through the open window, stars rippled, and Thanderahast caught sight of a flash of icicle-clear teeth in the darkness outside. He threw the cat at the shimmering stars— the small creature screamed a high-pitched howl as it flew across the room. That challenge was matched by another, throatier roar as the cat's claws dug deeply into invisible flesh. The cat seemed to spin in the air, raking the unseen assailant. Long tears of blood appeared in mid-air. Apparently the creature's interior was not as proof against vision as its skin. The beast bellowed again, and the cat let go. The feline skittered across the room to the far side of the fire. The blood remained, marking the creature's presence. Draxius charged and laid into it with the poker, battering it as if the cold-wrought iron was a battle mace. To Thanderahast he shouted, "'My blade! By the bed!' The wizard snatched up the blade, oversized and unwieldy for his slight frame. When he turned back, the monster was more visible than before. Blood painted a battered, teardrop-shaped head with a fanged mouth. From the bed came a muffled sob of hasty, fervent prayers. Thanderahast shuttered a warning, and the king stood back. The wizard threw him the blade, sheath and all. Draxius caught the sword and spun it once to shake it loose from its sheath. Then he dropped the poker and returned to the fray. Now the king of Cormir cut long, deep slashes into the creature's blubbery hide. He roared in exultation as his blade bit deep. Advancing across the bedchamber, Thanderahast was shouting as well, old spells taught by the high magess and spoken in forgotten tongues. Thanderahast's hands gleamed with pearly blue light, and out of its glow spewed a battery of darts made of solid magecraft, which leapt from his fingers to lance into the beast's flesh. The creature stumbled, tried to rise, and stumbled again. Its teeth were sharp and visible now, coated in its own blood. King Draxius stepped forward, and with one last mighty blow cleaved the monster down the middle. Sudden stillness fell in the room. The Netherese beast was dead, the last of its lifeblood, a spreading pool before the fire. King Draxius looked down at its corpse, with his blade ready in his hands, panting slightly, until he was sure that the ichor-stained beast would never move again. "'Well, that was a bit of excitement,' the king said at last, exhaling deeply. Then he looked up at Thanderahast. "'You're a Manadahast's young whelp, aren't you? "'How did you know to come here?' "'Thanderahast stammered for a moment. "'The cat,' he began. "'Your Majesty,' interrupted Amanadahast. "'And the young mage nearly jumped. "'Even the king gasped and took a startled pace back. "'No, his teacher was not in the room, "'but her magical image was.' She hovered, ghost-like, in the bedchamber air. Her hair was a silver rain, wild and free, down her back. She had a staff at her side, but did not need it for support. The illusion of the high magus spoke again. I have sent my successor, the young mage Thanderahast, to you to prevent a magical assassination attempt. If you are hearing this, he has been successful. 
I would have come myself, but I will be dealing with the conspirators who sent this evil creature to you. They are powerful mages, and if I do not return, know that the young mage has my complete confidence. Then the image faded. Thandera hast swallowed. He'd never seen her so grim, her face drawn so tight. She could defeat Luthax, of course, but rank upon rank of treacherous war wizards. Then he remembered the staff and her words. The day I need a staff. Outside the window there was a bright flash, the magical detonation of a lifetime of spells ignited in a single moment. Its brilliance overpowered the fire in the room, and for a long moment Draxius and the mage were etched in sharp white relief. Then the sound came, a huge rolling boom that shook the very stones of the castle. By the time Draxius reached the window, a column of flames was rising from the lower city. He turned to Thanderahast. Wait outside. I'll get dressed and join you. Two minutes. The young mage nodded and headed for the door. He knew what had happened there and what they would find. The top of the townhouse would be blown out by a single blast, created by a powerful magess breaking a powerful staff over her knee to release the energies within. The bodies of all the others would be sprawled around the room, the torn tatters of their shattered magic drifting around them. The message would be clear to any conspirators fortunate enough not to be in the room at the time. The price of treason was death, and no sacrifice would be judged too difficult to bring about that payment. The sleeping guard had slid entirely down the wall. Thanderahas let him lie in peace, and in the promised two minutes Draxius emerged, dressed in a fine shirt and simple leggings. He had his crown on now, and his scabbard belted to his side. "'Come on, lad,' he said. "'We may have to call out the war wizards on this one.' "'No,' Thanderahast replied, and met the king's eyes squarely, feeling the weight of his new responsibility settling onto his shoulders. If he were as loyal and true as the high magus had been, only his death would lift that burden. "'The war wizards,' he said firmly, "'or at least the Brotherhood's leaders, were the conspirators. I heard that myself.' Draxius looked long and hard at the wizard, then nodded. "'Then we'll manage on our own, as we always have. And, lad,' he added, placing a friendly hand on the young man's shoulder, "'I know you'll think long and hard about what happened here, and tell your stories about it accordingly.' Then the king kicked the guard awake, and bellowed that an armed, full-strength party should be ready to investigate the explosion immediately. The groggy purple dragon hurried off, and the king strode along in his wake, bellowing orders to the bleary-eyed staff as he passed. "'Think long and hard?' repeated Thanderahast. Did the king not want it known he could handle a sword, or that there existed invisible creatures of ancient magic, or that the war wizards themselves had betrayed the throne?' Then he thought of the flash of blonde hair and pink flesh in the king's bed, and realized what Draxius meant. The queen had red hair, and was as tan as a polished duskwood tabletop. Thanderahast smiled slightly, and went off after his liege, following the sound of shouted orders. 19. Chess, Year of the Gauntlet, 1369 D.R. Two men sat in an antechamber of the palace. Ostensibly they were off duty, enjoying a quiet game of chess in the quiet of the royal wing. In reality, they were war wizards, and they were very much on duty. They were here to ensure that none of the nobles gathered to see the dying king wandered where they weren't supposed to, such as into the presence of the crown princess. With both the royal cousins dead, or nearly so, 
No one but a war wizard could comfortably order about a noble of the realm without unpleasantness. War wizards could, however, because they were experts at unpleasantness. The drifting silvery spheres in the water clock patiently marked the passing minutes as Kirthrin Shandarn frowned over the forest of tall, spindly white pieces, sculpted of moonstone. They were emblazoned with the purple dragon of Cormir, and the carved features of the king were said to be a good likeness of the long-dead King Galaghard. That wasn't going to help his position much, though. He sighed, moved the turret carved with the arms of Arabelle along a file of the board, and looked up. Huldil Rother met his gaze and made his move without hesitation. He was a short, stout man, whose temples were almost always beaded with sweat, but he was a better crafter of new spells than Kirthrin, and they both knew it. For all that, Kirthrin outranked him. The war wizards were funny that way. A lot of enforced teaching and learning of humility went on, and there were still a lot of covert tests of loyalty. Those who failed such things usually simply vanished. Kirthrin frowned down at the board again. Then, reluctantly, he moved his other turret, the one that bore the arms of Marsember, and sat back to survey the board. Haldil's bat-riders, mounted wizards on oversized bats that were the counterparts of Kirthrin's noble knights, were slashing through his line of soldiers. Haldil moved a bat-mounted wizard and took one of those pawns now. "'One little dragon down,' he announced calmly. Kirthrin nodded absently and frowned down at the board again. The palace was as silent as a tomb around them, with the king still dying and all, and they'd both had ample opportunities to lose games of chess to each other yester-eve and today. The other shift of war wizards, Imblaskos and Durnderv, were dice and cards men, who played wheel of spells and chased the dragon and left the chess pieces undisturbed which had led to this long, multi-shift match and Kirthrin's present grim position. Damn these dark days for Kermir, anyway, Kirthrin tried to concentrate on his increasingly muddled defenses, noting that one of Haldil's death-priests was threatening to slash in and take any one of three of his little dragons if he wasn't careful. A shadow flickered at the edge of the mage's vision. Kirthrin looked up to see Onadar Bleth stride past, on into the royal wing. The young nobleman was frowning, and seemed to have acquired new lines on his face over the last few days. Kirthrin looked over to Haldil, who had obviously been watching Bleth's approach for some time, and the junior war wizard met Kirthrin's eyes and shrugged. Technically, the young noble was one of the very people they were here to stop, since he was a young noble. But then this particular young noble was the favorite of the crown princess, perhaps the next king of Cormir. No, he'd be called a prince consort, wouldn't he? Neither of the mages felt like denying Tanalasta what little comfort she could find just now, or offending the possible future queen. Moreover, Tanalasta was Azum's eldest daughter, and word was going around the palace that the Lord High Wizard Vangedahast himself, head of their brotherhood, was a traitor to the crown in her eyes, trying to make himself regent while Azum lay dying downstairs. Fear made few folk love war wizards at the best of times. If the people came looking for scapegoats, Suzail, Nay, all of Cormir might suddenly become a very unsafe place for those in the purple robes of the war wizards. So, where did the royal magician stand now? Several nobles had said loudly that any man who tried to climb on the dragon throne while the king lay stricken in a bed, not far off, was a scoundrel, even if pieces of paper protected him from the charge of open treason. Such a man was morally unfit to be lord of anything, let alone the most powerfully ranked mage in all the land, whatever his true magical might. 
One war wizard, an earnest young man from the Wyvern Water's shores called Galados, had even confronted old thunder spells about it last night, and had not been seen since. Whispers were spreading among the Brotherhood even now, wild rumors about a lot of things. Unable to concentrate on his game, Kurthrin Shandarn rubbed his eyes and voiced one of the rumors now. "'Anyone heard from Galados yet?' he murmured across the board. Haldil did not look up. "'Nothing,' he said in a low voice. "'Yet remember, none of us has been able to find Princess Alasair either. "'She must be shielded. I wonder why?' Kurthrin shrugged. "'Who knows what precautions she usually takes in the Stonelands?' They say Zentarim lurk thereabouts all too often. I'd carry a magical device to hide my presence from other mages if Lord High Thunder spells did spare me one. Haldil grunted. When you rise to such importance, let me know. Kurthrin chuckled and made a mildly rude gesture. Haldil returned it idly and asked, Are you going to move another piece tonight, or shall we just talk? I'm thinking, I'm thinking, as the sage said to the serving girl, Haldil responded wryly. Old Thunderspells is probably fretting behind a shield of his own right now. Fret? Him? Why? Kurthrin moved a noble knight, and then, seeing the weakness he'd left, winced. Haldil shrugged and moved his death priest to topple one of the little dragons, ignoring the move Kurthrin had feared he'd make. Our elder wizards, ventured a hast among them, can't even get any straight answers out of Princess High and Mighty about the governance of the realm. Kurthrin's eyebrows rose, and he looked involuntarily over his shoulder to make sure that the outermost door of the chain of rooms that led to Crown Princess Tanalasta's apartments was closed. It was. Couldn't Lespira Inthre penetrate the royal thoughts? Haldil smiled thinly. She could, if Tanalasta and her fiancé Bleth weren't both wearing spell shields, taken from Azun's personal cache of seized and pillaged magic. It was Kurthrin's turn to shrug. Ah, well, if you got it, use it. Handy, being king— down through the years you can seize a lot of magical gewgaws from the disloyal. He looked down at the board in front of him and moved one of his bishops out of harm's way. Mother Lespira, Haldil said admiringly, now there's a woman I could wish was younger, and I older. What a worker for the realm, and mother to us all. And naught has been seen of her for days— she has gone missing in all this, said Kurthrin, like Alafandar the sage, and like Galados, added Haldil, snaking a hand over the board. His death priest moved again, and another of the little purple dragons died. Kurthrin sighed at the discarded chess piece as his colleague set it down beside the board, the latest member of a slowly growing group. He laid his hand on his queen to move it in front of old Galaghard, but the piece felt somehow warm and wet and uncomfortable under his fingers, and he drew his hand away again. Studying the board, he suddenly saw the sly attack Haldil had prepared, and he hastily moved his king instead. The bishops and the noble knight were just going to have to take their chances. Haldil smiled. I'm glad we don't use that foolish rule the Kalashites prefer. Touch it, and you must move it. Oh, yes, Kurthrin responded. Small-minded etiquette for small-minded folk, eh? Then he sighed again as Haldil's smile widened, and the junior war wizard brought that damnable death priest back across the board again, to menace both Kurthrin's turret of Arabelle and his other knight. "'Who taught you to play this game, old thunderspells himself?' Kurthrin protested, looking down at the shambles of his position. 
Haldil was going to be able to strike down his choice of at least two pieces, while Curthrin tried to move the rest of the glory of Cormir out of the way. He peered across the board at the enemy witch-king. Gondigal, some called it, secure behind the pair of black turrets, and sighed. There was just one chance. Time for a little distraction. He leaned forward to deliver his most juicy secret. His colleague was chuckling smugly. Curthrin stilled that sound and left him gaping with his soft-spoken words. I've been told that certain senior priests in this city, with the aid of a powerful archmage whose identity they are keeping secret, have discovered the cause, the poison that killed Baru and bids fair to kill both Thomdor and the king, is a liquid-born toxin that works through the bloodstream inside a man. The reason spells have failed to neutralize this poison is that it generates its own dead magic zone. He moved his knight. Haldil whistled low. The dead magic zones, proof from any spell-casting, were a legacy of the time of troubles, when the gods walked Faerun. So can they foil it now? Haldil asked, wild-eyed, leaning forward over the board in his excitement. Curthrin shrugged. They're working on it. The junior wizard sat back, rubbing his chin. Who could have crafted it? A red wizard of Thay, perhaps? Or another powerful lich or archmage? But who did it? Almost absently, he moved one of his pieces. "'Who's trying to become ruler of Cormir?' Curthrin responded grimly. Haldil threw up his hands, barking out a short, mirthless laugh. "'Every third noble between here and Arabelle, that's who. There's no shortage of those who might want to.' He rubbed his chin again and added thoughtfully, "'And when subterfuge, plotting, and poison are the means—' Those who might not have spells nor swords strong enough to take the throne might have their chances. You mean this man who's wooing Tanalasta might really be after the crown? Curthrin shook his head in disbelief. If it's him in truth, why does Bleth not marry her first and make his claim clear before starting all the bloodshed? It could be someone else, Haldil said, with another shrug. I mean only that soft words and velvet handshakes have won as many thrones as the rising and falling of blood-drenched blades. Curthrin waggled his eyebrows. Been reading too much Tetherian poetry, have we? He moved his knight again. Haldil snarled in mock rage. Aye, the same place you were reading books on how to play chess. His death priest slid delicately across the board to slay Curthrin's advancing knight. So much for sneak attacks, good my lord, the junior wizard added. With a weary sigh, Curthrin moved one of his bishops. If this game bore any relation to reality, Cormir had not long to last. So what do you think of this young Bleth? Haldil shrugged again. It's the princess who has to kiss him, not I. You know how I feel about sneering, lazy, idiot nobles. Granted, he's been crisply and ably delivering what few orders Tanalasta has deigned to decree thus far. But who's to say how much of those orders are his intentions or embellishments? She never steps out of her chamber of sorrows to check. Sounds like the Oberskiers need a bit of steel in the old bloodline, Curthrin murmured. Huh. The line forms down the hall to marry the crown princess and father a long line of strapping sons, Haldil said sarcastically. Shall I save you a place? Nay, I fear, good my lord, that I lack what is most needed, Curthrin replied, mimicking the tones of a cultured court official. Stamina? Deafness, Curthrin replied flatly. Have you heard Tanalasta when she's in one of her moods, such as when she is going over the account books and finds a three-silver-piece error, or hounding down some delinquent creditor or slipshod contractor? Nothing's worth years and years of that. 
not Cormier, not fabled Mythdranner at its proverbial height, not gold-buried Waterdeep right now. Haldil chuckled and moved his much-traveled death priest back to a safer spot. So, what's the latest out in the city? Kirthrin's senior rank brought more reports to his ears than Haldil ever heard, and he shared the relevant bits of the most recent one now. Well, our esteemed Vanger de Hast does have some significant and slowly growing support for his regency, the old heart-of-the-realm noble houses mainly, but this Bleth, pet hound of the crown princess, is lining up nobles as fast as he can hand out bribes and twist arms on behalf of Tanalasta ruling as queen. So, who will win? Haldil asked quietly, and before Kirthrin could even lift his shoulders to shrug, added, "'Nay, forget I asked that. Instead, tell me, who do you think offers the better road ahead for the realm?' "'I've thought about that a lot,' Kirthrin admitted. He grinned weakly when his colleague made a silently sarcastic, "'So who hasn't?' gesture. "'Both sides have their merits.' I think Vanger de Hast has the wisdom and experience to be much the better ruler, and without courtiers and senior nobles and royal cousins and what all, between him and us, he can use us, of the war wizards, far more swiftly than Azun could move us to his will. Cormir will be less corrupt and faster to respond to crises. Yes, but will the people believe that? Kirthrin frowned and shook his head slowly. No, they won't. They never do. They'll never trust magic, because they think of it as something their nasty neighbor would use against them if he could. And they're always afraid the lot of us are as bad as their nasty neighbor. And with respected bards reminding them from time to time of how High Magus Amadahast died all those years ago, battling the first war wizards, who can blame them? Moodily he moved his king again. Haldil was nodding in somber agreement. "'There's another thing, too,' he added. "'With a clear, unbroken, obscure line, "'everyone knows who has the right to sit on the throne. "'The moment a regency muddies the waters "'and someone marries one of the princesses, "'a rival noble will think he's better suited to rule "'than the one who snared the princess. "'And once that starts, we won't have a Cormier.' unless the land can somehow endure every last noble family in it, killing off all their rivals, until there's no great house left. Then one of us will have to choose a commoner to wear the crown. Ah, yes, Kirthrin agreed grimly, choosing the right commoner. The fun never ends, does it? We probably won't have to worry about having to make any such choice, Haldil said. Remember, this whole thing has been forced upon us by a treasonous murderer, or perhaps a band of murderers. You really think they don't have something of their own in mind for Cormier? We'll be lucky if we even find out who they are before they have our heads bouncing and rolling down the banks of Lake Azun. I think it's Sembians, perhaps with help from Westgate or even Amn. Merchants, anyway who look upon Cormier as a rich little bread-basket that they can empty faster if they don't have a king in the way of their grasping hands, Kirthrin said. They may have bought or duped a few Cormerians, and they'll probably put a puppet noble house on and around the throne, but it's outlanders doing this to Cormier. I'm sure of it. I'm not, Haldil replied in a voice of doom. This has all the feel of a home-brewed plot. How so? Kirthrin asked dubiously. You think some old noble with a grudge or ambitious young one can get his hands on a dead magic toxin? Someone who's very powerful in magic must be involved. Someone better than even our Lord High Wizard, or he'd have cured the king by now. Unless he's behind it all, Haldil returned. Who better place to lead priests astray? And those of us who tried to help, too. All your point about the means of slaying really tells us is that the traitor or traitors have money enough to buy powerful magic, 
The deadly means might have come from anywhere in Faerun. Perhaps the far Tweegan wastes, or the lands of the far south, or across the seas to the west. What better place to find something that'll baffle our best healers? Kirthrin nodded. That feels right, that argument. But nothing in your words really proves its traitors here at home. Cormir has no shortage of foes who'd like to see it gone. Rich Sembians who'd like to expand their holdings in particular. Ah, Haldil said, leaning forward. But which of those outsiders wants their prize of Cormir damaged or ruined by strife? None of them who can't see any way to what they want but strife. Someone who dwells here and has a place in society he knows he can't be budged from. And who would benefit most from Azun's death and chaos in Cormir? Well, Kirthrin responded, Who? You tell me. Alisair doesn't really want the crown. She's happiest playing lady adventurer across half Faerun, at her own whim. Apparently, Tanalasta doesn't want it either. This Bleth would probably be happy as Prince Consort, but he dare not move quickly to take real power, or half the nobles in the realm will set him straight, and have him murdered if he ignores their rebukes. All of the nobles would probably like to strengthen their influence, wealth, and holdings, but no one noble house will be allowed to rise above the rest once the Oberskiers are gone. They all regularly backstab each other, and they have no central leader. Their distrust of each other is so strong that they could never have one. Go on, O oh master plotter, Haldil said eagerly, waving at his friend to continue. Kirthrin took a deep breath and added, The military is loyal, by and large, to whoever sits on the dragon throne. The people always suspect us war wizards of treachery against the crown, but surely if there was some plot within our ranks, we'd have heard of it or smelled something. Besides, Vangerdehast keeps us on a short leash. It all comes back to Vangerdehast, doesn't it? Haldil said grimly. They nodded to each other, both facing the same unpleasant possibility. The Lord High Wizard was powerful enough, perhaps— to create the deadly poison. One war wizard who'd confronted the old mage about his planned regency had disappeared. Vanger de Hast was spending a lot of time trotting around, whispering with nobles, but he had said nothing, beyond a few curt orders, to his own war wizards. Moreover, he was usually a master at spreading rumors and swaying the people. Yet this time he'd done nothing in that line, even with the folk of Suzale blaming the royal plight on any wizard who was handy. What was the old vulture's game? Well, Kirthrin said heavily, at least we know, at last, what has laid the royals low. If I know old thunder spells, and he is as loyal as I believe him to be, we'll probably have a cure for it in days. Too late for Baru. Too late for him, but we could even lose Baron Thomdor and survive. So long as the king does not die, Cormir will see itself through this crisis, as it has through so many others. Even a king lying abed for years will save us from civil war, I hope. You have more hope in you than I do, Haldil said gloomily. And— Whatever else he may have said was lost forever, as a lone figure in blue and silver, stumbling a little, came forlornly up the hall toward them. It was the priestess of Timora, Gwyneth, coming from the direction of the royal quarters. She was as white as Kirthrin's chess pieces. The war wizards exchanged a look, and Kirthrin put out a gentle hand. "'Lady, is there aught we can do for you?' Pray, the priestess said in a trembling voice, pray for me and for him and for the realm. I have failed. Baron Thomdor is dead. She shook off his comforting hand, burst into tears and strode away, sobbing out a prayer to Timora. The two wizards looked at each other again. Check. 
Haldil said bitterly, moving his bat-mounted mage to threaten Curthran's king. Slowly, Curthran reached out and tipped Galaghard over to signify his surrender. We'd better go see, he said wearily, and they got up in a swirl of robes and strode down the hall. Although they hurried, there was really no need to hurry now. When they were gone, the Moonstone Queen that had felt odd to Curthran's fingers earlier pulsed, shifted its position slightly, and then slowly flowed, like syrup, down over the edge of the board to the floor, where it rose, growing with terrifying speed, to become a woman in a plain, dark, revealingly cut gown. She wore a locket on a black ribbon at her throat, with hair the color of honey, and eyes like warm flames. Emthrara the Harper, who, with Laspira, had unlocked the secrets of the Abraxas, unclenched her right fist. In her hand was a white chess piece, the queen she'd been. She set it on the proper square of the board, murmured, Check indeed, good sirs, and glided to one wall of the antechamber, where her deft fingers probed, pushed, and finally opened a hitherto hidden door in the paneling. Without a backward look, she slipped into the darkness beyond and was gone. The door shut behind her with the faintest of clicks, leaving the room dark and empty. Once more, this part of the palace felt like a tomb. 20. Battle of the Witch Lords, Year of the Thirsty Sword, 900 D.R. It was not a meeting they had time for, thought Aosin in True Silver, but then it was not a meeting they could afford to miss, either. By rights, King Galaghard, his noble court, and High Wizard Thanderahast should be seeing to the last details of the planned assault in the morning. But these were elves, and these elves demanded immediate attention. Their appearance was both ominous and telling. For the past three months, the glory of Cormir, the army of the king, had met and routed the witch lord's armies time and time again, at the fords of Walloon, at the Forgotten Temple, at Juneril, and again at the Manticore's Crossing, each time overrunning the witch lord's position and trampling their undead troops beneath the hooves of good Cormirian steeds. Yet their foe had risen from the dead again. And again, literally, from each battle, the most powerful witch-lord necromancers slipped away to regroup with forces of moldering fighting men freshly disinterred. Now the glory of Cormir had ridden to the limits of their supplies and trapped the remaining human mercenaries and levies of the witch-lords flat against the western verges of the vast swamp. A victory here would break their power in Cormir forever, and free the eastern half of the realm from their threat. Yet, on the eve of the assault, a rider arrived, with the news that a great pavilion had suddenly appeared behind the king's forces. Its green and yellow spires rose like new mountains in the darkness, lit from within by their own radiance. These were not simply elves of the woods, who had always passed through the kingdom, more so since the fall of their greatest city. They were noble elves, the first to arrive in Cormir since the fall of Mithdranor, noble elves who demanded a reception. They couldn't have picked a worse time, muttered Thanderahast as they drew near the entrance, save for the wizard. Everyone in the small party of Cormorians approaching the pavilion was in full battle armor, including the king, the high priest of Helm, and several nobles, among them Aosinin Truesilver, the king's cousin. "'You would snub them, then, and risk seeing their forces arrayed alongside those of the witch-lords?' asked the king in a low voice. "'We may see them there yet, sire.' said one of the daunting horns. The elves have always been treacherous. Not fifteen winters ago they repelled the Sembians and their Chondathan mercenaries in the Battle of the Singing Arrows, despite the fall of Mithdranor. 
Don't speak nonsense, snapped the wizard. The Symbians were logging elven lands heavily, thinking that with their cities gone, the elves would be weak. The power of the elves has never been in cities, but in the forest itself. Now hold your tongue, for the ears of the elves are as sharp as their skin is thin. One of the Ilances made a joke about the sharp, pointed nature of elven ears, but he was shushed by his fellows. The party entered the pavilion. Its interior had a ghostly, ethereal quality. There were elves on all sides, lounging on broad pillows. They sipped fluted glasses of glowing fluids, regarding the passing humans as if they were mongrel dogs who had wandered into a dinner party. Then the elves turned their attention back to their own dealings. Somewhere in the distance, a sad lute was being played, joined by a wispy, thin, haunting voice that just caught the edges of their hearing. The greatest chamber of the pavilion was nearly empty. A pair of guards stood at the entrance, clad in finely made but archaic chain mail. Across the chamber stood the twisted stump of an ancient tree, a living throne into which three seats had been carved. Two of the seats were empty. The third, the farthest to the right, was occupied by a single cadaverous figure. Eosinin reached for his sword, thinking this was one of the witch lords, and that they were standing in the heart of an enormous trap. He relaxed only when he realized that the figure was an elf, though a very ancient elf, it seemed. The figure on the throne was clad from head to toe in chains its ornately shaped links, as fine as any that could be crafted in Suzale, even by dwarven hands. Its design, like the mail worn by the guards, was archaic, and many of the links were thin enough from wear to appear nearly translucent. The elf's face was elongated, his cheeks and eyes deeply sunken, his remaining hair silver-white and flowing from a receding forehead. Eosinen had never seen an elf this old before, and yet something about the figure seemed familiar, like the mage Thandera hast. There was something similar in the elf's fluid, well-practiced movements, the grace of, well, a near immortal, Eosinen supposed. The elf lord waited for the royal party to reach the foot of the throne before speaking. His voice sounded like an old book, opening for the first time in a century. So these are the children of Undeath and Ferlthen. Somehow I expected more. The king took a pace ahead of the others. I am King Galaghard III, royal head of Cormir, called the Forest Kingdom, the Wolf Woods, and the Land of the Purple Dragon. This is my royal wizard, Thanderahast, of the blood of Beorobel himself, and the mightiest men of my noble court. The elf regarded the humans for a long moment, and Eosinin wondered if these elf lords could cast death magic without moving an eyelid. At length, he said, I am Orthorion Kiov, last of the house of Ilafar Nelnuiv, the Lord of Scepters. Do you remember me? Thanderahast stepped forward. We know of the tales of great Ilafar and of that first coronation of Ferelthan nearly nine centuries back. I fear we have lost much of the records of his court, but we welcome you back to Cormir. The elf regarded the wizard stonily. You are the blood of old Beorobel, elf friend. The blood must be thin indeed by now, though I believe something magical pulses through your veins, allowing you a long life as old Beorobel had. Instead of replying, the wizard chose to ignore the venom in the remark. The same magic that probably pulses through your noble brow as well, Lord Elf. I am surprised to see one so ancient outside the elven homeland of Evermeet. The Elf nodded. I have resisted the call of Evermeet the Fair for many years, 
in order to fight against the human incursions, to fight against the fiends of the pit who claimed myth Drunner, and lately to fight against the southerners who sought to claim our forests unasked. King Galaghard stepped forward. May we ask why you are here, Lord Elf? I thought to do a little hunting, said the elf. Tell me, do you still have forest buffalo here? Thanderahast broke in. I fear not, O venerable Orthorian. They vanished long ago. Giant owl bears, then, suggested the elf lord, or envenomed pumas, or great rocks. They are no more as well, Lord Elf, the wizard replied. Authorian Keov regarded the humans coldly. You haven't really taken care of our lands very well, have you? Now the king stepped forward once more. We tend to the land as best as we are able. There are still great forests in Cormir, which cannot be said of neighboring Sembia, and trees here that stood when your lord of scepters was here last. The forested domains are smaller, but they have served us well and have been well tended and mastered. Thanderahast tried to speak, but the king gave him no chance, continuing... We have defended this land from dragons and from orcs, from pirates and from evil sorcerers. On the morrow, we set out in one last battle against the evil forces of the necromantic witch-lords. We have protected this land and its people, because long ago we made a promise to your liege to do so. We have nothing to apologize for to any elf, lord or no. Eosinen thought he saw a small smile break across the elf lord's face. I see the blood of Ferelthan runs thick and true in his descendants. Your first king had such fire, and his words were sharp, while those of Beorobel were cloying and tricky. It is pleasant to see that threats and bold speech, at least, have not changed. Am I not welcome to hunt within your woods? You are welcome, Athorian Kiev, said the king quickly. Welcome as an old friend of the land. I apologize in advance for not keeping sufficiently dangerous creatures at hand for your return. I ask only that you trouble none of the citizens of this land, nor harm them in any way. For they, like the land, are in my trust, and I am obligated to protect them. The elf nodded silently, and the king continued. If you will excuse me and my brethren, then, we must prepare for our own hunt on the morrow. There are few hours between now and then, and we must make the best use of them. The elf lord nodded and raised a hand slowly in dismissal. Thanderahast said quickly, The battle tomorrow, O elf lord, we could use any aid you could muster. A wintry smile twisted Athorian's lips. The witch-lord's representative has been here and gone already with a similar invitation, hedged with hidden threats and blatant promises. I will tell you what I told him. I am here for the hunting. But that one did give me a message for you, child of Beorobel. He said that Luthax sends his regards. The mage's face went pale, and he stiffened visibly. Then he bowed low and joined the others in leaving the tent. None of the elves paid the grim, armored humans any attention. The ride back was a time of low whispers. They did not talk of elves, but rather of the upcoming battle. Marsember had sent some desperately needed infantry, fresh but untried. They would stand on the left flank. The veteran purple dragons would hold the right, backed up by Thanderahast's apprentices. Arabelle had sent troops, but even their marching was a shaky, undisciplined affair. They might well prove unreliable. Their ranks would be seasoned with veteran militia from Suzale and placed in the center 
near the king and the main vanguard. Those nobles, not leading specific units, would be mounted and go into battle flanking the royal forces behind the central troops. They returned to the camp to find nothing amiss, though there had been activity, and many fires in the witch-lord encampments. The goblins and orcs in the necromancer's host preferred to fight in the dark, but the presence of human troops meant that they would have to wait until daylight. The nobles congregated to confirm the battle plan one last time, then broke for the evening. The nobles who had brought their own units returned to their camps, and the wizards retired to their meditations. Soon only a handful were left. Throughout, King Galagard was mostly silent, marshalling his words as if they were strength, even after the others had dispersed. At length he rose. I want to check the perimeter one last time. True Silver, walk with me. Eosinin strode alongside the king, and the two paced in silence along the hard-packed earth. Finally, True Silver could contain himself no longer, and asked, Cousin, who is Luthax? The king looked out over the wide valley that come the dawn would be their battlefield. High fires blazed in the witch lord's camp, and he could imagine the orcs and ogres and trolls dancing about the flames. He said, Luthax is an old rival of Thanderahast's, I believe, from before he became the High Wizard. I cannot imagine anything still being around from before Thanderahast was High Wizard, said Eosinin. Galagard smiled in the moonlit darkness. Wizards live forever, and their rivalries longer than that. I worry that the wizard will forget his loyalty to the crown in the heat of battle, particularly if an old foe has aligned himself with the witch lords. Yet many beings in Faerun are older than Thanderahast. That old elf lord, for one, he was hunting here before our ancestors arrived. I didn't think elves lived that long, said Eosinin. They don't, responded the king. I think he has some of the same magic that keeps Thunderahast and the other wizards going for centuries. Yet he, the elf lord, expected to return here and find all as it was. Forests instead of fields, monsters instead of cattle, trees instead of homesteads. It makes me worry. Worry, sire? asked Eosinin. The two passed a guard. Salutes were exchanged, and Galaghard continued only once they were well past. All that we have achieved, all that we have built, has happened in his one lifetime. Were we to fail tomorrow, to fall to the necromancers, would any record of us be here in another nine hundred years? Would the forests reclaim our fields, and the monsters lair in our ruins— and no one remember our names? We will not fail tomorrow, said Eosinin quickly, unsure of what else to say. We have been on campaign for three months, said the king. Three months of living in our saddles and sleeping in our armor. If we fail tomorrow, would I rather have spent those three months with my family, with my wife, with little Ryagard and Tanilar and Kathla? And will it matter in the long run who truly rules Cormir? Eosinin was silent. Thanderahast was obviously not the only one shaken by the elf lord's appearance. We will not fail, my lord, he repeated at last. You know you have the loyalty of every Cormorian on that battle plain tomorrow. They look to you for support, for leadership. If you are sure of yourself, they'll follow you into the pits of the abyss itself. And if I am myself unsure, asked the king, if I feel tired and unwilling to go another step, what then, cousin? Then I will stand by your side, cousin, Eosinin replied, and remind you of your duty to protect the land of Cormir. If we fail, no amount of time will eradicate the curse of the witch lords, and I will remind you that I am sure you know what you are doing. They passed the last of the sentries. The sentry was little more than a boy, 
but he snapped to attention at the king's approach and saluted crisply. Eosinen saw the lad's eyes in his small watchfire. They glowed with pride and respect. Eosinen looked at his king. Galagahard's features were lit by the flames. His jaw was firm, and his eyes sparkled. He managed a small fatherly smile. The men would follow him, and that was important, Eosinen thought. After the battle, the king could retire to his home and hearth and family, and his worries would be laid to rest. And if they failed in the morning, they'd all be beyond such worries in any event. That morning came all too soon for Eosinen and the others— with the first touch of redness in the eastern sky, the squires were up and about, and soon roused their masters, as the troops, most of them sleeping little themselves, donned their shirts of mail and leather, and saw to their weapons one last time. For some of them it would in truth be the last time. The squires brought Eosinen and the rest of the nobles their great suits of plate mail, and slowly ratcheted the bolts home, encasing the valor of Cormir in steel. Metal covered their outer legs, their waists, and torsos, and a combination of plate and chain wreathed their upper limbs. Eosinen chose his open-faced helm, as would Galaghard. Despite the risk of arrows, the king needed to be seen, and Eosinen and the rest of the royal nobles would not let their cousin take a risk they were unwilling to engage themselves. Across the vale there was the sound of drums and horns. The enemy was preparing, too. The sun's disk was just breaking the horizon when the troops of Cormir formed their battle lines. Patriarchs of Helm the Watchful strutted along the line each with an attendant acolyte and a bucket of holy water. The patriarch would dip a hollow mace, its head pierced with a hundred tiny holes, into the barrel, then fling the water over the waiting troops, blessing them en masse with the tears of helm. Eosinen was on his brown gelding by this time, a huge, heavy beast, barded with interleaved plates, heavier than his own. His squire secured the last of the bolts and latches, then retreated to ready himself. The squire, one of the young daunting horns, would march with the infantry, providing some backbone to the Arabellan troops. The men of Arabel looked nervous, but resolute, Eosinen thought, eager to prove their worth, and banish the last vestiges of the term Rebel Arabel. Yet a mantle of fear hung on them, that even the blessing of watchful helm did nothing to dissipate. The troops from Marsember were descendants of the original smugglers and pirates who had founded and refounded that swampy, independent city. They looked fully capable of taking on the witch-lords by themselves. Indeed, if the king hesitated any longer, they would do exactly that. The mages signaled that their preparatory spells were complete, and Thanderahast rode to join the king. The wizard's mount was a light pony, a dappled veteran of many battles. It had been trained to retreat if Thanderahast left the saddle, and it had survived a number of nasty frays as a result. The king was mounted on his black charger, a magnificent mount clad in ivory-shaded barding. The charger's armored headpiece had been fitted with a unicorn's horn, no doubt further enchanted by the royal wizard to protect the rider. Galaghard's own armor was polished to a luster that caught the sun's rays and threw them back like a mirror. On his chest was the painted symbol of Cormir, the purple dragon, adopted officially since the years of pirate exile. Across the shallow vale, the horns grew louder and the drums began to roll, a long, ominous sound that would end in a charge. The witch-lord's troops would not wait for the sun to fill the vale. Their inhuman troops preferred to fight in the shadows. They would move soon. There was one last lingering blare of horns, and the drums fell silent. 
The armies of the witch lords roared in unison and surged forward down the gentle slope. Goblins and orcs trotted on the flanks, their ranks sprinkled with the hulking forms of ogre captains. In the center ran the human troops, bolstered by a few knots of loping trolls. There was no visible sign of the witch lords themselves, but then there hadn't been at any of the previous battles either. The Marsembians started to advance in response, only to be hauled back by the shouted curses of their noble leaders. Marleir was the name, Aosanen thought. The king held up one hand, his eyes locked on the advancing line of non-humans and traitors. If he had any doubt in his heart, it did not show on his face. The opposing forces had reached the bottom of a shallow delve and were now slowly working their way up the other side. King Galaghard lowered his hand, and the silver horns of the Cormirian army roared out in response, like one vast amorphous creature spread out over the hilltop, the glory of Cormir spilled into the valley. Aosinin rode in the main vanguard, alongside the high wizard on his pony. An eager-looking young scatterhawk rode on Thanderahast's other side, paired with an older, grimmer thundersword. As they rode, both nobles waggled the blades of their swords to flash reflected sun into the eyes of their foes. They had closed about half the distance to the enemy line, when the bats appeared. The ungainly creatures lofted up from the back of the enemy lines, great fur-covered giants with twisted faces and dead white skin, shadowing the morning light with their numbers. Humans rode the backs of the daunting beasts, humans wearing dark helms bedecked with stag antlers, the lieutenants of the witch-lords. They swooped over the Marsembian troops, and lightning bolts laced down. The bolts were erratic, gouging the soft, peaty earth more than the troops, but for every two Marsembians who fell, only one rose again. On his left, Aosinen heard Thanderahast let out a shout of anger, then call out Luthax's name. His personal enemy was among the bat-riders, though how the mage knew, Aosinen could not guess. Thanderahast began to bark the ancient phrases of a spell. Aosinen realized what the mage was doing and reached out to stop him, but his armor did not allow him such swift, stretching, overbalancing, and the mage finished the spell and lofted himself out of his saddle, flying upward to meet the bat-riders. The pony, as trained, immediately halted and started to trot back up the hill. Aosinen bellowed at his cousin, and the king nodded grimly. From other wings, Thanderahast's pupils were rising as well, abandoning their troops in order to join in the airborne carnage. Ahead, the witch-lord's troops halted on the near slope of the valley. Ogres were bellowing orders, and orcs and goblins were desperately trying to form a line, spear points out, to break the Cormirian charge. Most would not complete the maneuver before they were struck down. Above their heads, the bat-riders and flying mages wheeled and dodged. Lightning cracked across the clear sky, and the royal wizard's pupils replied with gouts of fire. Here a human form would plummet to the earth, and there a flaming bat-wing would flutter downward, trailing ink-black smoke down to its death. Thanderahast had removed the danger of any unopposed, concerted attack from above, but at the cost of any protection of the line troops on the ground, if the witch-lords had any other tricks up their sleeves. The next horror of the necromancers was apparent when the two armies fully closed. At first Aosinen thought he faced humans, traitors, rebels, and mercenaries— they might have been once, for he recognized some badges on the armor they wore. But now they were marching dead things, the remains of their eyes hanging bloody in their sockets, and their flesh drained of all blood. To a man 
they had deep slashes across their exposed throats. The walking dead. Zombies, Aosinen realized with a groan, magical creations under the control of a powerful necromancer. And unlike the animated skeletons they had fought in previous battles, these were recently made, and still had some of the power they held in life. The noble thought of the fires and the drums of the previous evening, and realized that it had not been a rallying celebration, but a grisly enchantment. The witch-lords had consumed their own living troops to provide fodder of the utmost loyalty for this crucial battle. The Arabellans in the front line quailed when they saw what they faced, and several began to retreat. Galaghard rode among them to the front of the line, raising his arm and sounding the attack. The Arabellans stiffened at the sight of the king and, with a shout, pressed forward into the undead. Eosinen spurred his horse forward to follow his king, and all around him the battle lines disintegrated into the usual chaos of hacking and thrusting and dying, as the ranks of soldiers broke into a swirl of smaller conflicts, man against goblin, against ogre, and against undead abomination. The true silver wasted no breath on battle cries, but set his teeth and hacked at the butchered humans, seeking to carve a path to the king, who wheeled and slashed again and again against the undead horde. At the king's flanks rode two priests of Helm the Watchful. Golden lights danced from their palms as they drove the animating essences from the fighting corpses. As Eosinin watched, one of the priests was overwhelmed by a wave of clutching undead and dragged from his mount. Eosinin did not see him again. Instead, the true silver found himself beset on all sides by swarming goblins who were spilling into the heart of the Cormirian host in the wake of the undead, slashing at zombie and Cormirian with equal abandon. The world became a small, blood-red, frantic place of wheeling and cutting and slashing, Eosinin's horse bucking under him like a mad thing. He trampled foes who sought to gut his mount and drag him down. He made little charges to nowhere, wheeling as his mount lashed out in all directions with steel-shod hooves, then surging back along the line of destruction he'd already cut to reap more goblin lives. Twice he was nearly torn from the saddle, and once his gauntlet was ripped clear from his hand. A goblin tried to climb up on his mount, its claw-like fingers scrabbling against the horse's barding, clawing at Eosinin's face. The true silver cursed and ran the small creature through. As the goblin fell away, Eosinin saw young Scatterhawk, transfixed by three black goblin blades, topple from his horse, knocking over three zombies. There were yet more of the undead to swarm over the fallen noble's body, and more orcs and more goblins. Eosinin's world was reduced to the length of his sword. When True Silver did have time, and breath, to look up again, he was wet with blood clear up to his gorget, and half the nobles of the glory of Cormir were down. Cormayrils, daunting horns, and crown silvers had vanished from their saddles, and now lay dead and trampled beneath feet and hooves in the battle. The king was farther away now, driven apart from his cousin by the weight of the advancing undead. As Eosinin cursed and fought to bring his mount around, he saw a huge shape rise up from among the heap dead, a monstrous troll larger than any Eosinin had seen, cunningly hidden among the undead troops and goblins, surged into battle with the king. Galaghard's mount reared, whinnying in fear, and the king fought to keep it under control. Another horseman spurred into the space between the king and the troll, one of the bleth boys by his markings. To the troll, one human was as good a victim as another. One swipe of its huge claws unhorsed the impulsive bleth, and another ripped his armor open from neck to waist. Blood fountained, and the young noble threw back his head in a cry of agony that Eosinin could not hear. He fell out of view, 
lost in the press of staggering zombies and desperately thrusting Arabellan billmen. Bleth's sacrifice bought the time the king needed. Eosinan realized that, besides himself, Galagard was now nearly the only mounted knight left. The king wheeled his charger and brought his sweeping blade around, nearly level with the troll's neck. As the horse plunged forward, the monster's head was cut from its shoulders and bounced into the throng of advancing goblins. That would not kill the creature, thought Eosinan, but the loss would keep it busy for a while. Indeed, the troll had already abandoned its attack on the king, and was now throwing goblins about like handfuls of straw, searching in the confusion for its lost head. The king wheeled again, this time facing Eosinan. Seeing his cousin, he raised his sword in salute, and the true silver returned it, seeing Galagard give him a bloody smile. There were no doubts in his liege's mind this day— no hollowness in the king of Cormir. The king used his uplifted blade to point to the left flank, where the Marsembians were slowly being driven back by a wedge of orcs and goblins. Were that wing to fail, the witch-lords could drive around behind the Cormirian lines, surrounding them, and force the glory of Cormir into a knot of men too tightly packed to fight. Then the outermost could be slain at leisure, while those on the inside were crushed or trampled to death. Eosinan rallied a small band of Arabellans with hoarse shouts and windmilling waves of his sword. By the gods was his arm going to fall off, and led them in a charge across the field of heaped and broken bodies, seeking to reinforce the Marsembian foot-soldiers. The Arabellans took heart for the first time that day, and began to shout as they came down on the orcs from one side. Their cries were drowned out by the sound of horns, shrieking like great hunting hawks. Eosinan had heard only one horn sound like that, a trophy horn carved all of one piece of crystal, as smooth as glass, that resided on a cushion in a room deep in the palace. An elven horn! Heart rising in sudden hope, he stood in his stirrups as his faithful steed raced along, and he looked beyond units of snarling, hurrying ogres in time to see the elves arrive on the battlefield. Some were flying, and these joined the wizards in their airborne struggle with the bat-riders. The remainder rode great stags, giant elk whose heads were heavy with iron-tipped antlers. This was the true glory of Cormir, Eosinan realized. The army of the elves glowed, as their tent had the night before, in a scintillating pattern of green and gold. They were few in number, but to an elf— they were heavily armed and armored. The witch-lord line disintegrated as they struck it, full force, the ogres falling like crops at harvest time under the wicked, slender blades of the elves. In mere moments they were slain, and the elves were through to the heart of the wedge of orcs. Without their leaders, the goblins and orcs dropped their weapons and tried to flee, only to be cut down as they ran. Eosinan heard exultant singing, and realized that it came from the elves. More of the goblin troops fled at the sound. The glowing wave of death caught up with Eosinan's band, and passed on by, and the true silver urged his arabellans to join the flank of the stag-riders. One entire wing of the witch-lord's army was in flight before them, and individual elves were breaking away to chase down stragglers. Now the charging elves struck the zombies at the heart of the witch-lord's host, troops too mindless to run. Bright blades flashed, and graceful bodies leaned and slashed and rose to slash again in a deadly dance that separated limbs from bodies and forced the dead to fall. In less time than Eosinin would have believed possible, the undead had also fallen beneath the hooves of the rushing stags. The Cormirian infantry could clearly see what was happening now, and raised a great cheer as they hacked at orcs and goblins with renewed heart. 
the elven riders swept up to the king of Cormir, whose mount was picking its way gingerly over a mound of undead and goblin bodies that the royal sword had slain. Galaghard raised his bloody blade in greeting, and bellowed, "'We appreciate your aid!' "'Aid?' Othorian Keov grinned down from his high saddle. "'I said I came here to do some hunting, "'and when I awoke this morning, "'I decided I had a taste for orc, goblin, ogre, and undead. "'Care to ride with me?' The king spurred his own mount alongside the elf-lord's stag, and together they swept down on the surviving wing of the witch-lord's army. It was mired in combat with the Suzale militia, but it shattered like ice as the elves and men bore down on it. Weary Cormerians from all over the field trotted over to be in of the kill. Few foes of Cormir would be slipping away from this last stand overhead. The surviving bat-riders wheeled and fled into the vast swamp. Two were immolated as they flew, but another half-dozen outran the mages and elves and disappeared into the misty bogs beyond, flapping frantically. Their mounts exhausted from the charge, Aosinin, Galaghard, and the elf-lord rode slowly to a low hillock overlooking the battle. Below... The priests of Helm were tending to the human wounded and dispatching dying orcs. Several smoldering piles marked where trolls had fallen. They would have to be immolated later to make their deaths final. Thanderahast landed nearby, his robes bloodied and scorched. He nodded to the king, and Galaghard saluted him formally. Words would be exchanged later, Eosinin knew about the high wizard abandoning the knights of the court to pursue his own personal vendetta. The elf-lord turned to the king and said, "'A good day's hunt?' Galaghard shrugged his heavily mailed shoulders. "'It is good to see that Cormir still offers something suitable to your tastes.' "'It does in many ways,' said the elf." and then, after a visible hesitation, he rode nearer and laid a slender hand on the king's arm. "'Hear me, human, for I have altogether too much wisdom bought over long and bloody years. It is easy to rule from a distance, but difficult to lead from the front of a battle. It is easy to order, but hard to inspire.' It is simple to conquer, but hard to rule. That is why you triumphed this day over the unseen necromancers. I had my doubts as to your fate and your worth, until I saw one of your brother humans sacrifice himself in the fray to purchase you time. Such loyalty is more precious than all the gold in your vaults. "'Aye,' said the king huskily, smiling. "'And here?' he thumped his chest with one bloody gauntlet. "'It is valued more than all the gold in all the cities of humans all over Faerun. "'I can believe in my power, my just authority, only as long as others believe in me.' "'He looked at Eosinen. "'You probably don't know how important this is.' the old elf added. But I have to say you've done a fair job with this tract of land. Ilafar would approve, and probably Beorobal as well. Will you be staying, then? asked the king. You will be most welcome, for I shall ensure that all Cormir knows that the realm survives because of your aid here today. The elf waved a dismissive hand. "'For a year, perhaps two, we shall abide here,' a Thorian replied. "'But no true elf can resist the call of ever meet forever. "'Yet in these fair forests I think there will be good hunting for a small while.' "'As the three men and the elf went slowly down from the hill, "'their trembling mounts moving no faster than the walking wizard,' 
Men of Cormir walked about on the bloody field under the bright sun of morning. The foot soldiers gathered mementos and told their companions about how they'd almost died here and had hewn that one down over there, and as the tales went on, the tellers were already expanding their heroisms. By nightfall, all of them would have personally rescued the king and led the elves onto the battlefield in the charge that won the day and preserved the realm. 21. Spells and Politics Year of the Gauntlet, 1369 D.R. The royal magician's eyebrows rose. Impressive shielding spells, he said, watching the three hired mages at work. Two were Kalashites, whose sash symbols showed that they were both exalted masters in at least two schools of sorcery, and the third was a Nimbrin. By the looks of the rippling prismatic domes and spell-top fields they were weaving around the room, any two of them could probably defeat him in a battle of spells. The house of Cormero spared no expense in seeing to the safety of its own, or in attempts to impress their Lord High Wizard. The man he was here to meet inclined his head and smiled slightly, a smile that did not reach to his eyes, which were hard, black, and cold. "'One can never be too careful,' he murmured, and went on waiting, leaning casually against the wall. One after another, each of the wizards signaled that his spells were complete. Vanger de Hast's hosts gave them each the same hand sign in return, and each sat down on a bench facing Vanger de Hast, drawing out a pair of wands to hold ready. Their purpose was clear. If the Lord High Wizard didn't keep to his best behavior during the interview ahead, he would not be Lord High anything for very long. Vanger de Hast smiled slightly, to let his host see that he'd understood the rather unsubtle point, and sat down on a solid bit of nothingness he'd conjured. That opened some eyes over on the bench. None of them had seen him do the necessary casting. Perhaps this old fool was mightier than they'd thought, their eyes seemed to say. The old fool crossed his legs, leaned back with his behind resting on empty air, and said, "'I'm sure you already know why I'm here.' The cold-eyed young noble lazily pushed himself away from the wall with one boot, and set down his slender tall glass of dragon-dew wine on the ornate table that bore the arms of his family. You'd like to proclaim yourself Regent of Cormir sometime during the next two days, Gaspar Cormeril replied coolly. Or has the information reaching me been incorrect? You've stated my aim, Vanger de Hast agreed. I can, and shall probably have to, wait as long as six days or more. He met Gaspar's gaze and added, "'To achieve this at all, however, I'll need support, the support of prominent nobles, such as the House of Cormiro.' Cold eyes met his steadily. "'I'm sure you're used to a lot of coy and flowery speech, Sir Mage,' the young noble said. "'But I've grown enamoured of rather more direct talk these days. In particular, when every fleeting breath we take costs me coins.' He inclined his head toward the three watchful mages on the bench. Vanger de Hast nodded and spread a hand, indicating that he should continue. The gesture caused at least three wands to lift warily. Gaspar smiled thinly. Know then, that it is my intention to support you as regent of Coromir, on a permanent basis if you desire, so long as you meet my conditions. I'm not one of those who hates or fears the idea of a mage-king. In fact, I consider that your lot have demonstrated wise and deft statecraft through the years, and may save us all from a lot of the nonsense attendant on the vanity and, er, uh, lustier side of the Obarskir monarchs. Vanger de Hast nodded. I am pleased to hear this. May I know your conditions? Gaspar smiled again. 
It is a pleasure to work with someone so practical. My conditions are this. As regent, you must agree to work with a small council of nobles, a dozen or so, no more, whose initial membership I must approve. Have no fear of facing an outrageous roster. I realize, as I'm sure you will, the necessity of recognizing the noble families of Bleth, Cormeril, Crown Silver, Daunting Horn, Emerask, Hawkland, Hunt Crown, Hunt Silver, Elance, Rowan Mantle, and True Silver. He paused in his leisurely litany, and turned to fix Vanger de Hast with a direct gaze. The old wizard noticed that his position ensured that none of the mages on the bench would have any trouble firing both of their wands at Cormier's Lord High Wizard. "'Before we proceed, tell me, my lord, do you have any essential dispute with this notion?' "'None.' Vanger de Hast replied. This, as outlined thus far, at least, corresponds with my own prior intention. No regent should attempt to rule without the direct aid and support of the people of the realm. The young Cormeril nodded. It is good to hear that. It is my intention that the families I have named— and I believe I could agree to one or two more, perhaps the houses of Winter Sun, Marla Ear, or Wyvenspur, be free to send any designate of their choice to sit on the council. Initially, of course, the heads of the houses will want to attend. Later on, I suspect that most will delegate this duty to more junior family members, or those who particularly enjoy intrigue. Gaspar allowed another small smile that did not reach his eyes to cross his face, and continued. This council of nobles will advise you on all affairs, and meet at least once a ten-day. Every third afternoon would seem to be more appropriate. You must agree to place all major matters of state before it, including any measure involving taxation, the war wizards, the purple dragons, envoys of the realm to external powers, and measures that alter the powers of the crown in any way. No royal business, or rather the business that was formerly royal, is to bypass the council or be concealed from it. The royal magician of Cormier nodded. I agree. This is to be a voting council, I take it? Gaspar smiled thinly again. It is, and by any majority vote, it will hold veto power over all decisions and decrees of the regent. All decisions, my lord. His eyes flicked to the three wizards and back again, in another not-so-subtle warning. Vanger de Hast smiled politely. So far, this seems not unreasonable— I trust matters of scrutiny and reportage can be worked out in the council once we begin? Gaspar inclined his head. Indeed, an integral part of council powers, in my view, will be the right of every sitting member to employ as personal bodyguard one mage of his own choosing, whose name and sigil will be known to you, but whose other particulars will remain secret from the regent, the war wizards, other council members, and all other arms of state. Venture de Hast's eyebrows rose. On the surface, an understandable guarantee of autonomy, yet in the long run, I can see this as a grave source of trouble for the realm. You deem this wise? I deem it necessary. Gaspar's calm was glacial. Rest assured, Sir Mage, that none of my thinking in this has been hasty. Yet prepare. I have not yet enunciated my two more unusual conditions. Vanger de Hast almost smiled. The lad was uncanny in his maturity and cold-blooded poise, but a young and excited boy underneath, none the less— and these are, you will attend all council meetings and have a vote. However, and this you will keep secret, revealing it to no one upon pain of death. Your vote will always be cast as I, or another Cormeral family representative acting in my stead, directs. In other words, House Cormeral will have two votes, 
ventured a hast, said softly. A public one and a private one. Indeed, the young noble replied. The other condition must also remain secret, for obvious reasons, and also depends upon your ability to act convincingly. Although you must never betray this by your manner or words, you must place no credence in the counsel given by House Ilance. Chief among the current enemies of House Cormiral, Van der Hast murmured. Are there other conditions or details? Gaspar took up his glass again. None. I take it you find these conditions somewhat more restrictive than you'd intended to place upon yourself? A trifle, Van der Hast admitted. And yet they are not unreasoned, nor are they unworkable if the council acts with alacrity. May I in turn demand that no council member, including, I suppose, myself, have the power to delay votes by absence or protest, and that any efforts to delay decisions require at least a two-thirds majority? Gaspar frowned slightly, then said, I think that provision is reasonable enough. You need a council that cannot bring the business of the realm to a halt out of spite or internal bickering. Vanger de Haast nodded. I do. I agree to that, then, Gaspar replied. He sipped at his wine and added, Of course, no mention of this meeting or our arrangements must ever pass your lips, or— He inclined his head meaningfully towards the wizards on the bench. I have been the essence of tact for some years, sir, Vanger de Haast replied gravely. "'and fully understand such things.' "'Gaspar smiled, looking very like a satisfied snake, "'and said, "'You're now wondering just how you can evade these conditions, "'or whether you need the support of the Cormerals at all, "'given this rather steep price for your title. "'No, Sir Mage, that I have been very busy over the last few days.' and, in other ways, for some time before that, in discreet inquiries among certain of my fellow nobles, be advised that I have seen to it that the major houses I have mentioned, beyond, perhaps, the three royal houses, which will tend to prefer the crown princess on the throne to any sort of regency, will never support you unless you agree to my conditions— you can abandon all thought of formal rule. I predict that the Crown Princess will shortly banish you from the realm, for she has been soliciting support for such a decree from my house and others. Or you can be regent, but only under my terms. It certainly sounds as if you've fully prepared for this, ah, uh, discussion, Van der Hast said mildly. I hope you won't be overly offended if I express my surprise that so young and hitherto non-prominent member of the Cormerals should hold such power within his house. Can you really speak for your entire large and far-flung family? Gaspar gave the royal magician his serpent smile again and replied with a question of his own. I presume you are acquainted with both Almer Cormeril and Sorgar Ilance? Van der de Haast nodded. Almer was an outwardly respectable patriarch of House Cormeril, given to kidnappings within the realm for the purposes of slavery, illicit smuggling dealings with pirates, and the mistreatment of young female slaves who came within his reach. Sorgar Ilance was a cruel ex-adventurer, now balding and bitter, as well as cynical and cultured, who'd risen to become head of House Ilance, a position that had not slowed his compulsive thefts and love of slaying men in brawls. "'I know rather more about both men than I care to,' he remarked carefully. Gaspar smiled once more. "'Then you will probably not be overly distressed to learn that both will die mysteriously tonight.' I shall take no part in it. You may observe my revels, if you wish, at the newly opened Cormeril Club Dining Hall. Await the news, and come morning, 
you'll see how effectively Gaspar Cormeril can rule the house of Cormeril. Vanger de Hast raised an eyebrow. I'd not be upset to hear of such unfortunate demises, yet I'd be concerned for any noble in Cormir who might begin to fall too much in love with boldness, and so start off on the trail that leads, sooner or later, to overstepping oneself. Too many nobles dying would be suspicious, my friend. Gaspar shrugged. Whereas overmuch caution, as practiced by the incumbent heads of all our noble houses, leads to bitter, building resentment and unrest, and the slow decline of the realm into the chaos we face today. The man was as cool as the depths of an icy cave. The royal magician raised one last warning. Whenever kin die violently, there arises the dreadful prospect that one could awaken to find his family torn apart in clan strife, as has indeed happened before to those who have forced their fellows to choose between blood and country. Gaspar set down his empty glass gently and came to stand over the Lord High Wizard for the first time. He looked down. "'Far worse fates can befall a kingdom,' the young Cormeril said softly and menacingly. "'When its senior families have long reaches, deep pockets, and surprising allies.' And with those grand words, Gaspar turned on his heel and strode away, gesturing to his hired wizards. The two Kalashites rose and faced Vanger de Hast with leveled wands, while the Nimbrun hastily sheathed the two he held and brought down the shielding spells. The Kalashites looked at Vanger de Hast with open contempt. This realm of Cormir must be barbaric indeed if one fat old man with such paltry magic can be its titled high mage, one remarked loudly. The other chuckled. Their chuckles died abruptly, an instant later, when Vanger de Hast stood up and made a rather rude gesture, and the two mages suddenly found themselves surrounded by a ring of over thirty identical Vanger de Hasts, all of whom licked their fingers, made another leisurely impolite movement, and then waved a cheerful farewell before fading away. Vanger de Hast faded back into solidity elsewhere. The tower of the balconies, at the front of the royal court, to be precise, just in time to look out of its windows and down into the courtyard to see Gaspar Cormeril saunter out of the dragon door and stop to talk with Onadar Blath. The two greeted each other as old friends and chatted casually. The young Blath reached into his pocket and pressed something into Cormeril's hand. From a distance, it appeared to be a large crystal, the color of sunset, or perhaps a small decanter or large piece of jewelry. Long reaches, deep pockets, and surprising allies, thought the wizard. Long reaches, deep pockets, and surprising allies, Vanger de Hast said quietly to the unhearing figure below. And far worse fates indeed. Twenty two. The Last Dragon. The Year of the Dracarage. Ten eighteen DR. I hate this, pouted Crown Prince Azun, the second of the royal line to bear that name. We're sitting here like conies waiting for the hunter. Your objection is noted, the young mage Joran Hast said icily, and duly ignored. "'You don't want to be here either,' said the crown prince. "'You are correct,' the wizard replied, his voice verging on a snarl. "'But I have to be here to protect you.' The wizard had no love for this crown prince, and deep in his heart he hoped that Thanderahast would hang on to life long enough that Joranhast could be the court wizard of the next king of Cormir after Azun. But not this one.' Any king but this one. 
to swear fealty to such an egotistical, pampered, self-centered child, to call him sire and liege and master. Joran Hast shook his head. Even the young prince's voice was shrill, tinny, and irritating to the mage's ears. Only three years separated the two in age, but the young prince still sounded like a petulant child. The bickering pair waited on a low, windswept hill outside Suzale. They made an odd pair as they sat astride their light message ponies. The crown prince was whipsaw-thin and gangly, the apprentice wizard broad-shouldered and well-muscled. An impartial observer would probably have judged that the lean, hungry one was the mage, and his larger companion had oberskier blood in him. Behind them, low on the horizon, the smoke from the wreckage of Cormier's capital city spiraled up into the warm summer air. The great rage of dragons had descended on Cormier without warning and without mercy. Arabelle, Dedlook, Evening Star, and a score of other settlements had gone up in flames. Small hamlets were reduced to kindling, and the roads would likely once more become haunted, dangerous paths through lawless wilderness. But it was Suzale that had suffered the worst— Three great dragons, red worms of huge dimensions, had descended on the city like eagles among sheep. The docks and the lower wards, built mostly of wood, roared up in flames. Most of the stone buildings weathered the initial blasts, though glass melted and scorched wooden doors caught fire from the heat. Those buildings that still stood— the dragons ripped apart with their claws, seeking the humans cowering within. Castle Oberskir sat above the conflagration, separated from the flames by wide gardens now wilted from the heat. Protected by generations of spells, wards, and glamours, it became the rallying point for the city. Here the nobility fled, and here, in the scented chambers of King Arangor, the response was launched. Three wings of purple dragon guardsmen had erupted from the secure doors of the castle. King Rangor, barely fitting into his own armor, led one wing south to the docks, accompanied by Thanderahast. The future King Azun II led a similar wing of troops to the west, where the smallest of the three dragons was ravaging the warehouses and taverns. The third wing struck north and east, where the noble manors were clustered along the base of the hill. This was the smallest of the groups, but contained many of the nobility of the realm, the crown silvers and true silvers, the dracohorns and daunting horns, the bleths and illances. This group was led by Lord Garen Wyvernspur and aided by Thanderahast's pupil, Joranhast. Each of the groups met their dragons and triumphed. The crown prince's soldiers drove out the dragon to the west. The dragon on the docks was trapped against its own burning work and slain, but at a heavy cost. The king was sent flying from his saddle in the fray and severely injured. Lord Garin's party found the third red dragon prowling the cobblestone streets of the noble district like a huge hunting panther, sniffing its cellar stairs to discern which houses had plump aristocracy hiding in the basement. The noble knight struck hard and fast, and Joran Hast barely had time to unleash a few spells before they had run the dragon through. Jorinhast was standing over the still cooling body of the red dragon in the wreckage of House Illance when a great shadow passed over his face. He looked up to see only darkness as a great shadow blotted out the sun itself. A fourth dragon, larger than they had seen before, descended on Castle Oberskir. It had come out of the north, and Lord Garin's party saw it first. The nobles and their retainers could do naught but gawk at the immense size of the creature, as if one of the moons had been pulled down and now hovered over their city. Jorinhast was caught in the spell as well. It was the largest creature the Cormirian-born mage had ever seen. 
All they could do was watch as the monstrous creature banked its mighty wings and settled over Suzale. The new arrival was three times the size of the great elder worms they had previously fought. Its once ebony scales were purple and gray with age. As it beat its wings, the rushing winds extinguished some flames in the lower city, fanned others, and caused many damaged buildings to collapse. It landed on the castle, and the west wing collapsed beneath its prodigious weight. The purple dragon, the true purple dragon of Cormir, had returned. Lord Garin, strongest and most noble of the knights, was the first to recover, shouting out a curse as he began to run up the hillside. Jorinhast and the others, wounded and tired, followed more slowly. Elsewhere, the sorely wounded king and the crown prince were also rallying their troops and climbing the low hill to the place where the dragon that was too large to be true was destroying the Oberskir family home. Jorinhast stumbled after Lord Garin, trying to shake the image of the beast in flight, blotting out the sun itself from his mind. The dragon was immense to the point of being overwhelming. The mage racked his brain for a proper spell to use against a beast so huge, but all he could come up with was a name. Thoglor. Thoglor the Black Doom. The purple dragon continued its slow, leisurely destruction of the castle's western wing. Ancient stonework crumbled under its weight, and the slate roof shrieked and crashed inward. Jorinhast was relieved. Most of the noble refugees were in the east wing. The west wing contained the guest quarters, the scriptorium, and the library, and Thanderahast's spell chambers, filled with all manner of dangerous devices and explosive magic. Jorinhast forced himself into a panting run, catching up with powerful Lord Wyvernspur halfway up the hill. Behind them trailed the armored knights, struggling in their heavy armor. The young mage opened his mouth to warn the Wyvernspur lord. They were too late. The dragon crushed something better left uncrushed, probably in the wizard's chamber of alchemy itself. There was a fierce white flash and a roar, and the ground beneath them rolled and surged. Their boots had already left the ground behind. The two men tumbled end over end, blown halfway down the hill by the force of the explosion. The brightness of the flash was later reported to have been seen in Arabelle, a brief, flickering star on the horizon. By the time Jorinhast had recovered his wits, the dragon was gone, and the rest of the castle was in flames. The great purple dragon, the black doom of myths and legends, was a large blot flying north and west, still huge even at a distance. The refugees who had sought the safety of the Oberskir fortress now spilled out the doors and windows, seeking to escape the flames that raged unchecked within. Jorinhast and Lord Garin reached the front of the castle, and the Wyvernspur noble started shouting orders, telling the screaming courtiers to clear the area and make for the noble houses. Jorinhast remembered feeling at the time that Garin Wyvernspur embodied all that was noble in Cormir. He was strong, brave, and utterly fearless, not an overweight relic of the past like the king or a wastrel like Arangor's only son. Jorinhast heard screams from above. In an upper chamber window, one of the younger ladies-in-waiting was sobbing for help. The wooden frame of the window had already been touched by flames, and smoke poured out from behind her. Jorinhast worked a minor magic then, one of the few spells he still had. He cleared his mind of the smoke and the noise swirling around him, and muttered a few ancient words. Then, slowly, carefully, he began to walk up the wall. He reached the open window less than a minute later. The lady-in-waiting was red-eyed from the smoke, and in a trembling panic ready to jump. She wrapped her arms tightly around the mage's neck and held on with all her strength, practically throttling him in the process. Jorinhast gasped calming words 
and slowly brought her down to the earth. By the time the pair of them had reached firm ground, the other knights and nobles had reached the summit as well, and they were beating back the flames with tapestries, cloaks, and whatever came to hand. Garin had organized a bucket brigade down to the lake named after the first Azun, and Thanderahast was working a spell of weather summoning, calling thick, rain-bearing clouds to Suzale to help battle the blazes that raged at the castle and across the city. Upon reaching the ground, the young maiden refused to release her tight grip and pledged eternal love and loyalty to her brave rescuer. Jorinhast accepted the praise and kisses warmly, then lifted his head to see the crown prince staring at him icily. It was then that the broad-shouldered wizard suddenly remembered the young lady was one Azun himself had been courting. Carefully, the wizard disengaged himself from the young woman, but the damage had already been done. The crown prince was not as handsome, as tall, or as well-mannered as the apprentice mage. Jorinhast could feel the burning royal jealousy. Indeed, had not young Azun driven off a dragon, only to find the wizard had been declared a hero thanks to some bit of parlor magic? That was three days ago. Since then, the citizens of Suzale had buried their dead, put out their fires, and picked through the remains of the city for survivors and salvage. A full half of the buildings in the city had been destroyed, and a third of the population killed. A quarter of the castle was shapeless ruins, and most of the rest was smoke-gutted and scorched. Yet some god or other had been smiling on the Oberskiers, it seemed. The throne room had survived— as had the shrine of the four swords and the great treasures of the kingdom. The heart of Cormir had survived the flames, but just barely. Arangor, whom Joranhast thought had grown fat and lazy in his long peaceful rule, lost no time in regaining order. Outriders and heralds were posted to all the major towns and villages for reports to determine the extent of the dragon's depredations. Most of the noble knights, led by Lord Huntsilver, rode north to Arabelle, where a pair of green dragons had emptied the city. Then the word had come from the marshalling grounds near Jester's Green, once known as Soldier's Green. The purple dragon, Thoglor, had been spotted in the king's forest, apparently licking its wounds from the explosion of the castle. It had not flown off into the mountains for a long slumber, as it had apparently done many times before. It had remained within striking distance, and might, when it recovered, strike at Suzale again. A council of war was held in the king's quarters. Despite the efforts of the best surviving priests of the city, Arangor was unable to walk more than a few paces without great pain. Pillows were tucked in on all sides of his throne, and a heavy blanket was spread across his legs. He accentuated every statement with a low moan. A weak king, thought Joran Hast. His mentor's words of loyalty to the crown rebuked him for such thoughts. Thandera Hast had to have served forty kings in his time. Were they all as mewling and sad as this one? That... "'Purple dragon is behind all of this,' said the king, planted firmly among his pillows. "'Thoglor is leading this attack.' Lord Garin Wyvernspur shook his lean head. "'No, dragons don't think in terms of leaders and attacks. They are much more independent.' "'How do you know what dragons think?' asked the king sharply. Garin looked at the royal wizard for support. Thanderahast put in, "'Lord Garin means that what our sages know of dragons states that they swear fealty in matters of recognizing territory, but they do not band together in organized attacks. I think whatever roused these dragons to attack Cormir also brought Thoglor back as well. He is not leading the attacks, but he is benefiting from them. The wounded king put his head in his hands. Why now? Why did he suddenly appear now? The unspoken words in his anguished query were, 
during my rule. Thunderahast shrugged. No one knows why there are flights of dragons, and this one is as bad as any previously recorded. As far as Thoglor the Black is concerned, he has been sighted before. Before, repeated Arangor bitterly, out in the wilderness, far from any city and any king, and each time his appearance has marked a weakness in the crown and the nation. What are the people saying now that the purple dragon has attacked the castle itself? What matters now, said Thanderahast calmly, is what we are going to do. The decision that followed had brought them both to this wind-whipped hilltop. Joran Hast, armed with one of his mentor's wands, and the young crown prince, lightly armored. They sat in the saddles of their spindly-legged ponies, waiting for the dragon to arrive. The elder wizard had set out with Lord Garin to flush the dragon out. "'I don't like it,' said Azun. "'You've said that before,' said the wizard in training. "'Why didn't you say such things when it was proposed?' "'And have everyone think me a coward?' protested the crown prince. "'Best to speak up and be thought a coward than to fail in action and be proved one,' said Joran Hast calmly. The slender young prince looked hard at the mage. Loudly he said, "'And I don't particularly like you, either.' "'I don't believe they make you a court wizard based on popularity,' said the mage, turning in his saddle to face the younger man." It's sort of like kings that way. Ah, but I am popular, the prince replied, smiling tightly. With the ladies, I'm sure, snapped the wizard. Ah, uh, some of them, at any rate. He allowed himself a small smile and ignored the fuming prince. If I'd been there, I would have rescued, Azun began, but the rumbling cut him short. The sound seemed to rise out of the ground itself, and both young men could feel it through their saddles as well as hear it. It was a roar that seemed to envelop their world, coming from the east. Both men looked to that direction, where a small dot blossomed on the horizon. It was on top of them in an instant. In fact, there were two airborne figures, one pursuing the other. In the lead was Thanderahast, mounted on a wyvern's back. The wyvern was a smaller kin of dragons, lacking four legs, and this one was marked with orange and red striations. Of Lord Garin, who had accompanied the mage into the woods that morning, there was no sign. Behind the wyvern and mage came the dragon. Joranhast clearly saw it approach, and it still looked huge. Its ancient scales reflected in the morning sun in shades of lavender and lilac, belying the powerful muscles that lay beneath them. It beat the air heavily and steadily, as opposed to the wyvern's quick, panicked wing thrashings. The purple dragon was gaining. Magical energy danced from the old wizard's fingertips, and the bolts of power he hurled ricocheted off the dragon's ancient scales. Prey and predator were over their heads in a heartbeat, the windy wake of their passing carving furrows in the tall grass. The wyvern banked sharply after it passed over them, and the great flying behemoth banked in pursuit. Its large size took it into a larger turn, and its massive wings nearly scraped the ground as it swung about to follow its smaller prey. It was even larger than Joran Hast remembered. Now, without the city around him, without the protection of walls and redoubts and buildings, it dominated the young wizard's vision. He suddenly felt very small and exposed and alone on that bare hilltop. Something cold and clammy settled in Joran Hast's stomach, and clung there tightly. The dragon passed over them again, and the wizard was aware that the young prince was shouting something at him. "'The wand!' he bellowed, his smooth, beardless face almost apoplectic. "'Use the damnable wand!' The wyvern-mounted mage banked again, and the purple dragon followed, this time pulling out of its turn almost directly behind its quarry. 
the two young men on the hill, saw the monstrous creature's throat bunch and swell. Azun was shouting again, and Jorinhast was fumbling frantically with the wand. The dragon breathed a huge gout of acid, and the wyvern and mage evaporated. Jorinhast thought he saw his mentor move his arms in sudden spell-casting before the heavy, scintillating spittle struck. Then both wyvern and wizard were lost to view, swallowed in the flow of the dragon's breath. After the acid gout had passed, the great purple dragon was the only thing in the sky. Jorinhast screamed a magical word of old netheril, and felt the wand glow and pulse in his hand. A bolt of flame burst from its tip and lanced upward. Jorinhast did not aim it, but the dragon was so huge he could not help but strike it. The lance of flame raked along the orchid-hued belly plates of the beast. The great monster screamed. The purple dragon convulsed and pulled itself into another tight, air-shattering turn. Fighting for calm, Jorinhast readied his next spell. Beside him, Azun shouted after the great beast's retreating form. "'Hail, old lizard! Think you could defeat the true rulers of Cormyr?' The lad's voice cracked, and Jorinhast would have sworn that the wind blew the remains of his words away. But the dragon apparently heard them well enough. It responded with a great roar. Jorinhast muttered the last phrase of a new spell and slapped the withers of both ponies. The pair sprang forward as if released from a starting gate, their powerful legs enhanced by the magic. The ponies ran as they had never run before, sped by Jorinhast's hastening spell. The dragon surged through the air behind them, but the pair slowly began to increase the distance between them and their pursuer. Jorinhast looked back. All he could see was the dragon's open jaws, a huge fang-toothed mouth surrounded by ancient wattles of flesh. He turned around again and bent low to spur on his mount, urging it to even greater speed. Then he heard laughter and looked to his right to see the crown prince smiling in the racing wind. Had the dolt lost his mind? Jorinhast turned in his saddle again. They had gained more distance, and now the dragon was gaining altitude behind them. Jorinhast pointed the wand and shouted the eldritch words again. The wand pulsed, and a lance of flame streamed over the great creature's head. The dragon dodged it easily, but came down lower now, only slightly higher off the ground than the two riders ahead. Jorinhast and Azun plowed forward up a shallow wash. On either side rose grass-swept slopes topped with brush. At the far end of the wash the ground climbed to a small hillock. Both young men dug spurs into their mounts, and the message ponies once more increased their speed, topping the end of the wash with a few dozen strides. They reined and wheeled in place, and the young Azun raised his arm, sword in hand. The dragon was coming in low and fast, nearly touching the trees beneath it, gliding with its wings outstretched, grazing the soft hills on both sides. Azun dropped his arm in a short, chopping motion. The brush lining the ridges on either side dropped away, and two lines of Cormyrian archers unleashed steel-tipped volleys against the great beast. Had they aimed at the creature's scaled body, their shots could have done little more than annoy the beast. Instead, they shot for the wings, riddling the tough membrane with a myriad of holes. A few shafts caught at lucky angles and tore great gouges in the wing surfaces. The dragon was coming in too low to recover as the air beneath its wings suddenly streamed through the holes. It tried to land on its massive haunches, but it was moving too fast, and sprawled forward as it landed, its head and long serpentine neck plowing a furrow along the base of the sod-covered wash. There was a sound like a ship's mast being rent in twain, and Jorinhast knew it had to be one of the dragon's massive wings doubling under it. They had knocked the creature out of the sky. 
the soldiers on either side of the wash threw down their bows and snatched out their swords. They lowered their helms over their faces and, with a single shout, spilled down from both rises to where the wounded dragon thrashed. Azun dismounted and pulled out his own blade. The mage nearly fell from his mount, trying to stop him. "'Those are my men,' said the crown prince angrily. "'I should fight with them, and further risk the loss of the heir to the throne?' Joran has dismounted and put a firm hand on the young man's shoulders. "'I think not. Let them wear the beast down. By then Thandrahast and a real warrior, Lord Garin, will be... Oof!' The crown prince moved more swiftly than the wizard had thought possible, elbowing him sharply in the gut. Joran Hast felt the air rush from his body as he fell to his knees, gasping helplessly. By the time the world stopped spinning around him, the young royal warrior was halfway to the battle. The soldiers swarmed over the great dragon like ants, and with about the same effectiveness— they hacked at the great beast's scales, and occasionally an armsman would loosen one sufficiently to strike at the meat beneath. For Thoglor, it was akin to being stung to death by gnats. The great beast had its own bag of tricks. The one good wing swept a half-dozen attackers into dazed and bruised ruin. Its tail smashed another two. Its claws gutted a pair of warriors where they stood and its huge jaws ran bloody as its head snaked out again and again to snuff out the life of another Cormirian soldier. And the only heir to the throne of Cormir was charging into that maelstrom of death. Joran Hast looked around. If Lord Garin was coming, he was taking his damned time about it. Thandera Hast was wounded or dead. The mage raised the wand, but saw that the crown prince was in the way the insufferable, irritating, impulsive crown prince. A lance of flame would burn through him and into the dragon itself. Perhaps Cormir would be a better place without him. Joran Hast paused for a long moment, then cursed and ran down the hill after the prince. Even with all these warriors rushing about, you'd think less work would be needed to get a clear shot at something as large as the dragon— and as he ran, the mage swore to himself that, even under torture, he would never admit he was running to Azun's rescue. The young prince reached the dragon and struck. His blade bit deep. The sword, supposedly crafted long ago by Amadehast herself, parted a scale as if it were jelly, and slid into the creature's haunch, striking to the bone. It was as if the dragon had been struck by lightning. It heaved itself from the ground, shuddering, and tried to roll away from the attack, crushing a half-dozen soldiers and almost snatching the blade from Azun's hands. But the scion of the Oberskiers would not let up. He tore the blade free and cut another long, shallow wound along the dragon's belly. It gave out a great scream and spat a huge gout of acid. Men screamed where the acid struck, but the dragon had little time to enjoy their deaths. Its serpentine neck snapped around, and its jaws closed on the small form of the crown prince. Jornhast shouted, but then he saw that Azun had avoided the fang-like maw of the beast and was hanging by the loose wattles at the corner of the creature's mouth. The dragon shook its head like a dog trying to dislodge a tick, but the young monarch held fast. The wizard saw a white flash of clenched teeth as he stared at Azun's blurred form. Wildly, Joran Hast tore his gaze away and looked about. Half of the soldiers were dead, and there was still no sign of the elders. Where had they gone? The mage was close enough to use the wand of flame, but it might bounce back off the dragon's scales to consume him as well. And if he missed and cooked a certain crown prince, the wizard ran to the gaping wound along the dragon's belly, now seeping thick, deep, purplish blood. He glanced up to see the young prince still clinging to the hide beside the dragon's mouth. As he watched, Azun drove his blade deep into the worm's eye. Dark, gold-flecked fluid sprayed out. Joran Hast hastily bent his head away from the bloody rain he knew would come, and shoved the thin wand into the open wound, and shouted the command word. 
The wand pulsed, and a jet of flame shot deep into the creature's body. The dragon spasmed, its body arching and flexing from the agony of the ravaging fire inside, and the blade in its eye. A huge clawed paw swept Jorinhast off his feet. He lost his grip on the wand, and his last sight was of a zoom driving his blade deep into Thoglor's reptilian brain with both hands. Blackness overwhelmed the young mage when he struck the ground. It seemed to last for only a moment, but when he picked himself up, the dragon was sprawled, dead on the floor of the wash. Priests moved among the fallen soldiers. A priestess of Lathander put her hand on Joran Hast's shoulder, but he shrugged it off and stumbled back toward the dragon's flank, where Garin and Thanderahast stood talking to a zoom. Lord Wyvernspur was badly burned, the left side of his face and entire body raw and bleeding beneath the slimy ointments of the priests. Thanderahast was similarly burned and anointed, and, in addition, sported purplish ridges rising along the side of his head, bruises from some sudden impact. Azum seemed unharmed by his adventure. Jorinhast wondered at the luck of children, fools, and royalty. "'You are back with us, lad,' said the elder mage. "'We could not return as soon as we'd hoped, but I see the pair of you were capable of handling things.' "'It was a good plan,' said the young mage, still light-headed. He blinked hard in the sunlight, then added, "'I lost your wand, I'm afraid.' Thanderahast chuckled. A small loss, easily forgiven. Azun told me of your bravery in charging the dragon, and in waiting for the right moment to strike with the wand. We were worried you had panicked. Jorinhast stared at the younger man. Hadn't he told them the mage had frozen up when the dragon first attacked, that he tried to stop Azun from entering the battle? Azun cocked his head and said, "'It's good to see you back standing up. Want some help looking for that wand?' Jorinhast gaped at the young prince for a moment, and then slowly nodded. Garin and Thanderahast flagged down the priestess of Lathander for information about the wounded, leaving Azun and Jorinhast alone. The two young men paced off to the trampled area near the dragon's body. They made vague sweeps in the splayed grass with the sides of their feet, looking for little and finding less. At length, Jorinhast said, I only charged in after you because you were going to get yourself killed. I know, said the slender man, and they probably think something like that, but they never have to know. Despite it all, you did pretty well today. Words burned in Jorinhast's throat like the black dragon's bile. Finally, he spat them out. So did you. And then he added, Sire. Azun flashed a wide smile. Mind you, I don't trust you, and I still don't like you, but with the beating old Thanderahast has taken, it's likely you'll be my wizard when my time comes. So I might as well get used to you. The young wizard sighed, and I to you. But do me one favor, my lord. No more charging into combat. Only when you're behind me with your magic, said the future king, only when you're behind me. The young prince strode away, leaving Jorinhast to think that Azun's voice was not so tinny after all. 23. Encounters and Expeditions Year of the Gauntlet, 1369 D.R. I do believe, dear, that we can finally say that Arabelle has become truly civilized— Darlathine Ambershields declared, opening her violet eyes very wide and waving a ring-encrusted hand. Gems flashed and sparkled in the light of near high sun for a dazzling instant before her hand dipped, rising again with a fresh glass of cordial. "'Why, Darlathine, that outpost of uncultured bumpkins?' Lirla Roaringhorn asked in disbelief, opening her own brown eyes very wide as well. 
Whatever do you mean? Well, Darlacine purred, with the news this morning of nobles found knifed in their beds, and the knives still buried in them, bearing the arms of rival noble houses, I do believe the intrigues of Arabelle are finally approaching those of Susail. No, Blairla gasped, color flooding into her cheeks, and eyes sparkling with fresh excitement. Nobles? "'Knifed in their beds? Why?' "'Darlethine waved a languid, cordial-bearing hand "'and fluttered her long lashes. "'They were dusted with gold this morning. "'They say that Princess Alasair "'led her band of noble young rapscallions "'into the city over the rooftops to—' "'She lowered her voice dramatically. "'Work their deadly slaughter. But why would she do that? Blairla asked, brown eyebrows furrowed in genuine puzzlement. Then she added cattily, I thought she liked nobles in their beds, male nobles and lots of them. Darlethine gave a little crow of laughter that made her several chins shake heartily, then slapped at her confidant's arm with perfumed fingertips. Ah, shrewdly said, Blairla, shrewdly said. Blairla flushed with genuine pleasure and held out her own glass for a refill. Darlethine awarded her with a delicate pouring of her best ruby-hued elixir du vol, and continued, "'Why, dear, don't you see? She's removing nobles who've declared their loyalty to our dear court wizard, because certain noble houses, I've heard, are hiring mages in Sembia, Westgate, and farther afield to organize a raid on the palace. She needs to be sure that the families working for the wizard won't foil them.' Blairla squealed with excitement almost, but not quite, spilling her cordial in her bouncing breathlessness. Her low-cut gown briefly displayed movement akin to a ship breaking up in heavy, rolling waves. Darlethine could only watch in fascination, as the perfume wafted forth from her friend's heavily gem and fine chain adorned front. Blairler asked, "'Raid the palace?' Why, oh, Darlethine Ambershields, before all the gods, tell me why. I have heard they're coming for the king, of course, Darlethine said smugly, to wrest him away, sick bed and all, from Vangela Hast's clutches. Of course, with all the evil spells that have been laid on him by now, they're probably too late. For all we know, Azun could be a zombie under our dear royal magician's control, even as we speak. Oh, Blairla squealed, clutching her glass to her ample bosom. This is all so exciting. She felt the cold glass against her flesh, remembered what she was holding, and drained it in a single gulp. Holding it out for more, she said triumphantly, "'We are truly favoured of the gods to dwell here in Suzale, with the eyes of all the world upon us, while all these dramatic, important things are happening.' Darlethine patted her friend's cheek fondly, seeming not to see the empty glass held out to her. "'Yes, yes, dear,' she said fondly. "'Of course we are.' Had Blairla not been quite so excited, the two fine-gowned ladies might have heard a brief commotion in the street below. The Purple Dragon sword captain, Lareth Guller, a veteran of the Tweegan War, had just nodded a wordless greeting to a war wizard he knew slightly, Incibel Threen, a mild-mannered sort, when out of the crowd strode a noble in deep blue velvet and white shimmer sheen, his fingers bristling with rings. One of the silver swords, Lara thought, wrinkling his brow as he delved in his memories for the man's name. 
He was rather chubby, with long blonde hair and a wispy mustache of the same hue. Gods, don't these young fools know what they look like, with a few brave hairs sprouting from otherwise bare upper lips? No, ventured a hast loving wizard, that it is I, Amanadas Silver Sword, who brings down upon you forthwith your richly deserved doom, the young fop snarled. Amanadas, that was it. Lareth almost smiled at the haughty little puppy for his helpfulness, until he saw the long, glittering skinning knife flash out of the noble's sleeve. The wizard, Ensabal, had turned at the sudden, ringing declaration, and in doing so presented his throat to the blade. The silver sword obligingly plunged the blade into the proffered throat— blood fountained, and the war wizard collapsed like a toppled oak, as screams went up on all sides, and folks scurried about, either to get clear or to find a better view. The silver sword noble made a disgusted sound and leapt back, almost into the purple dragon's arms. Lareth had his own dagger drawn by then. The purple dragon used the dagger's pommel with a heartiness driven by fury, clouting the young noble across the back of the head. A manadas silver sword fell limply to the cobbles, and Lareth stepped around him to see to the wizard. Lareth Guller did not need his battlefield memories to know that Ensabal Threen's life was hanging by the most slender of threads. He sheathed his dagger and waved at people to keep clear, in case violent magic was triggered by the wizard's death. Guller? Guller! For the throne's sake, man, what happened here? The shocked and angry voice behind him belonged to Hathlan, a senior officer of the Purple Dragons. Get a priest. A noble knifed this wizard because he supported our Lord High Wizard, or at least the young fool thought he did. I knocked out the noble, and he might have his wits scrambled a trifle, but he'll live, Lareth replied without turning. His eyes were on the gathering crowd, looking for nobles, or anyone else, trying to slip away. All of them have their wits scrambled a trifle, Hathlin snorted. There have been attacks like this all across the realm these last few days. The nobles are seizing their opportunities and settling scores, real and imagined. Then he was off, bellowing for a healer. Lareth looked at his superior, then at the fallen war wizard. Cormir is balanced on a sword edge, he murmured, with years of red war waiting on either hand, should we fall. Have you heard the news? Some noble just slaughtered a war wizard right out on the street. The speaker, a new arrival to the snout room, was breathless with excitement but not so breathless that he couldn't gasp out news this good. "'It's beginning, then,' Rolligan muttered. He looked as if one of the high-quality turrets he sold had crashed to the ground. Donath Marleyear, the young Arabella noble, was gaping at the new arrival as the man bustled on down the snout room, bawling his news. The man's words had distracted the young nobleman from the warm knee and rather revealing charms of the tavern dancer who sat drinking with them. She was an old friend of Rolligan's, the merchant had said heartily, but was lavishing her affections on Donath. The dancer, Anthrara, kissed Donath on the cheek, seeking to restore his attentions. Donath blushed and hoped the hunger he felt for the young woman wasn't showing too much. He swallowed. What was he doing, thinking about women when Cormir was crumbling into war outside? They're saying, up at the palace, that Princess Alisair fled deeper into the Stonelands, Emthrara said in a low, husky voice. Donath felt smooth skin shift against his arm and swallowed hard a second time. The turret merchant made a small chuckle. Rolligan knew exactly what was going through Donath's mind about the dancer, and did not hide his amusement. Donath tried not to look at the merchant's knowing smile across the table, as Emthrara said quietly, "'I've heard more talk of Vanjur de Hast's possible treachery, too. 
but surprise had seized hold of Donneth. He turned his head to look at Emthrara, and discovered that his lips were mere inches away from hers. He could feel the soft touch of her breath on his face. He swallowed again, grimacing. Stop it, Donneth. This is too important. You were inside the palace? he asked, his voice louder than he'd intended. Emthrara gave him a smile and a nod. Donneth tried not to feel the soft brush of her honey-blonde hair on his cheek. "'I'm often up at the palace, Donneth,' she said, her voice deep and musical with soft mystery. "'I have work there.' "'Oh,' Donneth said, and then realized what she meant. "'Oh!' He hoped he wasn't blushing too furiously, and thanked all the gods that neither Rolligan nor the dancer laughed at him then. He struggled to think about what seemed more and more important, and found himself asking almost calmly, "'Can you get me into the palace, unseen?' "'Why?' Rolligan leaned forward across the table to ask that very direct question almost in a whisper. Donneth was startled by the sudden proximity of those bristling eyebrows and lined forehead, and shrank back. "'Uh, um,' he began auspiciously, and then, irritated at his own discomfort, he brought a fist gently down on the table and said grimly, "'Something dark and treacherous is going on in this realm, and I'm going to do something about it.' The other two looked at him, and Donneth felt a sudden swelling of pride. Again, neither of them laughed at him, nor did they look anything other than serious as their eyes rested on him thoughtfully. "'I know of a way to get into the palace,' Emthrara said then, "'where few folk should see our arrival, a way I know of for professional reasons.' "'I've never been one for waiting over long,' Donneth told her firmly. "'Aye,' Rolligan said dryly. I've noticed. He did blush then, but Emthrower laid a hand on his arm and murmured, Come on, then. Donneth followed hard on the harper's heels. Nothing else seemed to matter any more. Finally he was doing something that mattered, and his skin fairly crawled with eagerness. Finally, after all these years, he truly felt alive. Lie down here beside me the tavern dancer said in his ear, and suddenly she went to her hands and knees and crawled in under the bushes. Donneth cast a quick look around the royal gardens, noting the helms of some purple dragons not far away, and followed her. Patches of bare, hard-packed ground amid the moss told him that this was a way that had been travelled a time or two before. Emthrara was lying on her belly, stretched out along the wall. "'Beside me,' she murmured again, and Donneth hastily lay down as she bade him. Emthrara added, "'Watch, and then follow me quickly,' and stretched out the toe of her boot to touch a certain small stone on the wall. It gave slightly. Holding it in, she reached out her arm until her fingertips touched another stone. It moved just a trifle.' and all the stones between them quietly folded down and inward, revealing a long, low, slot-like opening. Without any hesitation, the dancer rolled sideways into it with a pale flash of exposed leg. Donneth propelled himself after her and promptly encountered soft flesh in the darkness as he rolled into her. Behind him there was a faint grating sound, and then suddenly complete darkness again as the stones rose back into place. He lay there, smelling cold, damp stone and earth, and, just for an instant, wondered why he was doing this. "'Take this,' Emthrara said into his ear, seeming to know exactly where it was in the darkness, "'and put it into your inside pouch.' the one where you keep the gems and the letters of reference your father gave you. Donneth froze. How had she known about that? He'd... Then he relaxed. 
Probably just about every man she meets visiting at court carries pretty much the same things. He felt something smooth brush his fingers, a tube of parchment, a scroll tied with a ribbon. Don't crush it, the tavern dancer murmured. If anyone challenges your presence, show it to them and say you've been hired by a master you dare not reveal. Alasair, if they force an answer out of you, to give this message to the Lord High Wizard Vangerdehast personally. If you crawl straight ahead in the darkness, you'll find steps leading up. Stand up then, but not before, and walk up the steps. There's a door two paces beyond that. It opens inward by a pull ring and leads to a space behind the hangings in the Blue Banner's room. Try not to be seen emerging. After you're out, walk along unhurriedly but purposefully, as if you know where you're going and belong there. Don't run if a guard challenges you. Oh, and try not to burn the place down or kill too many people. Good luck, young hope of the realm. And then a pair of soft, warm lips found his mouth in the darkness, kissed him fondly but thoroughly, and she was gone. Doneth heard a soft swish of a shoe edge on stone, another small sound, and then nothing. He was alone in the darkness, under the very wall of the palace. His place and manner of entrance was probably not what anyone in House Marleyear had intended. Doneth grinned at that, made sure the scroll was secured, and crawled ahead into the darkness. The realm needed him. Adventure awaited, and all that. Who was Emthrara anyway? Oh! Just to see him smiling again, the crown princess of Cormir sobbed, smiling for me. The king, your father, lives yet, Onidar said smoothly, putting a comforting hand on her shoulder. Is that not proof enough of his strength? Tanalasta burst into tears, the deep, racking weeping of a woman who makes no effort to cover her face or hold anything back, and went to her knees on the footstool in front of her. Onadar circled around to embrace her from in front, and she buried her face in his chest and sobbed with such force that his whole body shook. Her fingers were like claws, and Onadar bent swiftly to murmur in her ear as his encircling arm went around her shoulders. Lady mine, all is not lost. Whatever befalls this fair realm, and your ever valiant father, my hand and heart are yours. I shall serve you with all I have, never failing nor leaving you in need, especially now. When your need is greatest, now, as the wolves circle Cormir, waiting and watching for your weakness, be strong, Tanalasta, queen of my heart, be strong, queen of the realm. His voice rose in passion, and Tanalasta raised bright, desperate eyes to him, tears racing down her cheeks, and reached up to him, murmuring his name through ragged sobs. Had the king died? A woman sounded in real grief just ahead. Doneth almost thrust the hanging aside and strode out to offer what comfort he could, but the word queen once and then again stopped him. The hanging suddenly seemed a friendly but all too flimsy shield. He'd wandered through more rooms than he could keep track of, and hidden behind a lot of hangings to reach this place. Surely he must now be in the royal wing. He looked down to be sure that he didn't stumble and make noise. The floor was bare and clear. They even dust behind the hangings here, he thought with amazement. Then a sudden, chilly addendum struck him. When was the last time they had dusted? And would they dust again soon? But the voices came again, and he heard the name Tanalasta, the crown princess, turning to a suitor, it seemed, for comfort. 
A gap in the hangings was just ahead. With aching care, Donneth crept forward, keeping well back against the wall, and peered out. A woman, in a severe gown of the finest make, knelt on a footstool, with her head against the breast of a man whose arms were around her, his head bent over hers, as he murmured comforting words. Donneth knew him slightly. It was Onadar, of the Bleth clan. All the talk he'd heard then was true. Above her head, Onador seemed almost to smile for a moment, and Donneth looked hard at him. No trace of the smile, if it had indeed been a smile, and not a mere twitch of tired lips, came again. But the eyes of the man whose arms were around the princess were cold and somehow triumphant. If I were deeply in love and feeling grief for my lover, would I look like that? Donneth drew back, troubled, but not knowing what to say or do. His discovery, if anyone found him here, could very well mean his death. So he held still, hardly daring to breathe, and listened. If you weren't here, Onadar, I don't know what I'd do. Yet I am here, most royal lady, here and your servant, forever, if you'll grant it so. Let me be the strong shield at your back, the faithful hound who walks at your side in the shadows, and together we shall win through to bright mornings ahead. Donneth winced. Where did the man find such words? The best perfumed chapbooks of Sembian love poems? Oh, Onadar, I must go to him. He may be stronger, and if he should wake again, I must be there. Come then, Lady Highness, Onadar said grandly, throwing wide a door. Oh, Onadar, the crown princess said in loving adoration. Tana, he replied, in a voice deep with passion. My Tana. Yes, she breathed fervently, and they swept out shoulder to shoulder, fingers laced together. Donneth watched them go in thoughtful silence. There was definitely something amiss in this royal house, but he was too ignorant of the everyday feel of things here to put his finger on it. He had to talk to someone. Of course, Rolligan. The merchant would know what to do now. Donneth drew in a deep breath, squared his shoulders, and stepped boldly out into the open, as if he had every right to be there, and was hurrying on his way in the conduct of business crucial to the realm. After all, wasn't he? Glarasteer Rolligan, sir, dealer in turret tops and spires, stone and wood both. You order em and we'll build em, fast and cheap, and they won't fall down. The merchant introduced himself grandly as the newcomer tried to sit down next to him and Donneth. The newcomer peered at him suspiciously, snorted, and turned away from the table. "'I was seeking someone else,' he said curtly over his shoulder, leaving the young man and the merchant in peace. Rolligan gave him a cheery wave of farewell that somehow became an impolite gesture, and then, as chuckles from other tables made the man whirl around again— a signal for more service. A waitress with the longest, smoothest legs Donneth had ever seen on a human drifted over. "'My lord!' "'A flask of fire drake,' the merchant told her, "'and two tall glasses, one for my friend here.' The waitress started to turn, and Donneth gave her a smile that bought him a frank and admiring one to match, before she bustled away to see to warm fire-drake wine and cold, salt-rimmed glasses. "'Well, lad,' Rolligan asked in a low voice as the scion of House Marley-Ear shifted to a more comfortable position in his chair. Donneth shot a dark look across the table. No bodies falling out of doors or knife-wielding clusters of masked nobility, he muttered. But I did hear Onadar Bleth comforting the crown princess. And? Something didn't seem quite right, Donneth murmured. He seemed just a little too happy about the king dying. Rolligan shrugged. 
And why not? If he's Tanalasta's favorite and she becomes queen, he can run Cormir without any of the perils of ruling it. He wouldn't be the first noble to be more in love with a woman's position than with a lass herself now, would he? That's true, Doroth agreed reluctantly and sat back with a sigh, in time to look up with a hasty smile as the waitress bent over him and set their drinks on the table, gave his shoulder a friendly squeeze, and was gone again. Despite himself, he turned his head to watch her go. Rolligan grinned, shook his head, and poured them both fire drake wine, watching the glasses steam and fog as the warmed liquid met chilled glass. Ah, to be young again. On me, lad, he said as the young noble turned his head back to the table. Doneth hadn't even managed to open his mouth to protest that it was his turn, even past his turn, to pay for things, when the merchant asked, "'Did anyone see you? Should I expect purple dragons to come in here hunting young Marla ears?' Dorna shook his head. "'Did you have to show your scroll to anyone?' Dorna shook his head again, then frowned, set down his glass, and reached into the open front of his shirt, and fumbled with the wooden toggle that held his safe pouch closed. When he drew it forth, the scroll was only a little crumpled at one end. He stared at it curiously, turning it a little in his fingers. "'I wonder what it says,' he said slowly under his breath. "'So, open it,' the merchant urged, sipping warm wine. "'Oh, but Emthrara, he started to protest, "'gave it to you to let every hairy-nosed guard who might ask your business have a read,' the merchant put in. "'So?' Doneth looked at him doubtfully for a moment, and then, as if of their own accord, his fingers went to the ribbon that bound it, slid it along without untying Imthrara's knot, and let the parchment loosen of itself. Then, in sudden impatience at himself, the young noble spread the scroll out on a dry area of table-top and read it. There were only a few lines in a fine, flowing hand. The bearer of this note is Doneth Marleir, of noble blood and on a mission of the greatest importance to the crown. If he would see Cormir's future as bright as winter stars above the stonelands, he will meet the azure-masked one in the snout-room of the roving dragon at the lighting of the evening candles. Let him pass in the name of Alasair. Underneath that was a little mark, or a personal rune that looked like a three-petaled red flower, or perhaps a stylized crown. Doneth looked up at Rolligan. Here, read! He thrust the parchment across the table. The merchant read it, let his brows rise for a moment, and then fall again, rolled it up carefully, replaced its ribbon, then handed it back. Well, now, that's handy, lad. "'Twon't be all that long now till they light em. The young noble sputtered. "'Yes, but—but but Emthrara gave me this. How did she know I'd be here? And now—' His eyes narrowed. "'You told her—' "'By the gods, lad,' the merchant protested. "'You're beginning to see conspiracies behind every pillar in Suzale. Drink up and think a while—' Things always go better when your thoughts go ahead of your tongue, if you take my meaning. Doneth frowned. But who does she work for? Is this truly from Princess Alasair? The merchant poured himself more wine. Lad, living high is the art of finding out answers to questions like that without ever asking anyone else. Do you see? Doneth sighed. That's right he said, picking up his own glass. Go all wise and grey-bearded on me. The merchant shrugged. You had to have a woman show you how to get into the palace. I know of more than a dozen secret ways into that place, and I'm no war wizard nor courtier, O oh young wet-nosed conspiracy sniffer. Doneth glared at Rolligan for a moment, then slowly grinned. All right, sir merchant, 
Your sword finds the gap. He sipped fire drake wine and then frowned again. More than a dozen? Whatever answer the merchant might have made was lost forever in the sudden appearance of the waitress, who leaned over their table, making Donneth swallow and try not to stare, to light the candles that were descending on fine chain from the ceiling. She shook her taper to extinguish it, and turned to smile at the young nobleman. Just for an instant, an azure mask seemed to cover her apple-cheeked features, and she said, in a voice not her own, "'The corner back booth, at Ergen's best boots, as soon as you can get there.' Then her face seemed to waver and was bare again, and she gave Donneth a wink and glided away. Donneth blinked. "'Did you hear?' "'Spellcraft, for sure,' the merchant said, draining his glass and pointing at Donna's own. "'You'll be needing a guide there. Come on.' Evening was when most shops in Suzale rolled down their shutters, set their door-bars, and blew out their lamps. But down this short and apparently nameless side street, Ergen's best boots still showed a light over its door. Rolligan clapped Donneth on the shoulder and said, "'I'm off, lad. Try not to get into too much trouble.' Donneth nodded, replied, "'You too,' and taking a deep breath, put one hand on his sword hilt and the other on the door handle. He cast a last look around before entering. Rolligan had already vanished, as if swallowed up by magic. The street was deserted. The young noble frowned, shrugged, and went in. Ergen seemed to have vanished, too. The shop was lit, but deserted. Donneth looked around suspiciously, spotted the curtained changing booths, and headed for them, almost trembling with excitement. He parted the curtain of the corner booth cautiously, using the hilt of his scabbarded sword. Inside stood a woman in a blue gown, her back to him. One of her legs was planted on a stool, and she seemed to be in the process of disrobing. "'Ah, I'm sorry,' Donneth muttered. The woman turned her head as swiftly as a striking snake. Emerald eyes gleamed out at him, her other features obscured by an azure mask. "'What for? Your swiftness is commendable,' was the calm reply as the woman turned to face him and let fall her gown to reveal breeches and a tunic of the same sea-blue hue. "'If you are Donneth Marleyear, I am very interested in working with you. "'I have the good fortune to be Donneth Marleyear, good lady,' Donneth said, bowing low. He cast a look behind him as he rose, but the shop was still bare of purple dragons or anyone else. "'And you are?' "'A friend of the crown.' the masked woman replied smoothly. Her voice was not Emthrara's, but it had a similar husky tone. The masked woman plucked up her gown from the floor and hung it on a wall hook. I know you went to the palace earlier today. Will you accompany me there again? Lady, I will, Don said without hesitation. This didn't look like Princess Alasair either, but then he had never seen her all that closely. The woman seemed to know his thoughts. I am not of royal blood, she said, but I am loyal to the crown. Are you? Donneth met those green eyes steadily and replied, Lady, I am. I am prepared to swear by whatever you choose, if you will it so. I want nothing so dramatic. A man's word is enough, if it is the right man. Her words made the scion of House Marleyear feel good indeed. He grasped the hilt of his sword hard, smiling in pride that lasted only for an instant. The masked woman moved a table aside, as if it were made of paper, rolled back the edge of a rug with her foot, and put two fingers into a hole in the floor. She pulled, and a square of wooden flooring rose, a trap-door common to such shops, usually used for storage. "'Follow me,' she directed simply, and slid into the dark opening. 
Doneth did so, finding stone steps leading down into a small room that smelled of old leather. He had a brief glimpse of shelves and shelves of boots in the radiance that suddenly bloomed into life in the palm of the woman's hand. She was a mage. Emerald eyes met his, and then, without a word, the woman strode away into the darkness. Doneth followed hastily along a narrow, stone-floored tunnel. Such a tunnel was not usually common for such shops, and this one smelled of earth and nearby cesspits. The tunnel went on for a long, long time before it met with a second passage. Doneth and the masked woman turned left, took a few paces, and then turned right again and went on. The walk was even longer this time, ending in a few worn steps that led up before they emerged in a room full of dusty cobwebs and boxes. The masked mage turned to Doneth, her radiance dimmed by the simple method of pressing her palm against the base of her neck. "'Keep close to me, and be very quiet,' she murmured. "'We're in the undercourt cellars, beneath the noble court.' The noble nodded, keeping a hand on his blade to prevent it from swinging and scraping against or knocking anything over. They passed through a succession of dark and dusty rooms, seeing glimmering lanterns in the distance twice, and then the woman in blue held up a hand to halt him and peered around a corner. Satisfied, she waved him on, and together they stepped past the sprawled forms of two guards— dice and cards strewn around them. They won't sleep all that long, she murmured. We must move briskly. Beyond the guards were steps, leading to an iron-banded door, barred on their side. Doneth and the woman lifted the bar down together, and the masked woman touched the lock with one finger. The door clicked once and shifted open a little. Beyond was another tunnel, I could come to master these tunnels were there not so many of them, Doneth muttered. The emerald eyes of the masked woman seemed to smile in answer as her head turned briefly. They went on along a dusty passage that seemed to hold a statue or something ahead. As they drew nearer, Doneth saw that it was a stone block, almost as large as a man, that had fallen from the roof above. He glanced up. The cavity it had come from fitted it perfectly, and a dust-covered chain descended from the darkness of the cavity to the block itself. This had been no crumbling misfortune, but a death-trap. He looked down and saw yellow-brown bones protruding from under the stone, and a skeletal arm reaching vainly for somewhere safer, somewhere forever beyond its reach. He looked up to find the masked face watching his. "'Don't walk this way without me,' she said in a low voice. "'There are two more of these ahead.' Doneth nodded soberly, and they went on. At a certain spot, that to the noble looked no different than the rest of the passage, the masked mage stopped and turned to the wall beside her. She touched something, and then simply stepped into the wall her body passing into the solid stone as if it did not exist. The young noble stared, fascinated, at the hand that reappeared out of the solid wall and beckoned to him impatiently. He went to it, clasped it with his own, and was drawn through nothing. They were in a side passage. He blinked at the masked face and the glowing hand that went with it, and then turned to look back. A sort of veil or misty curtain seemed to hang across the mouth of the tunnel they now stood in. He extended his hand through it and waved his fingers. There was no resistance. The veil must be some sort of magical illusion, an image of a stone wall that concealed this opening. A firm hand came down on his shoulder. He turned and followed the masked mage again, until she led the way up a steep, narrow stair and into a room, where she stopped and turned to face him. "'We're in the palace now,' she explained, or rather, under it, in the vaults that the crown princess ordered sealed. 
We took this last, hidden way to avoid a guard post. I can't risk this light any longer. Stand still. The radiance faded, and Donneth had a last impression of her fingers weaving intricate gestures before two cool fingertips touched his eyelids. Startled, he stepped back, blinking, only to find that he could see clearly in what must be utter darkness. Those emerald eyes seemed to be smiling at him again. Emboldened, he asked, "'But if these are the royal vaults, how are we to get around? The bards always say only the Lord ventured to hast, and the royal family have keys. We'll—' His words died in his throat, as slim hands drew a chain up out of her bodice to reveal a trio of long-barreled, dark, ornate keys. "'It seems the bards are wrong for once,' the masked mage said softly. "'Draw your sword now and keep watch. Danger awaits us.' Three archways led out of the room. The masked mage chose the one to the left, and they entered a room full of small casks, branded with the device of a flying bird encircled by stars. The next room held stacks of crates, and its loftier ceiling was held up by three pillars. A ladder on wheels leaned against the central pillar, and as they approached, something seemed to boil down out of the tangle of railing and platforms at the top of the contraption. It appeared as tendrils of smoke, yet the misty tentacles moved of their own volition. Donneth, strike at it, the masked mage snapped, stepping back. Without hesitation, the nobleman thrust his blade into the heart of the smoke-like mass. His companion snarled out some words, and something like lightning leapt from her hands to touch his blade. The weapon seemed to leap, and then hum numbingly in his hands, and Donneth almost dropped it. But around him, the smoke-like thing seemed to be shuddering and fading all at once. In another moment, it was gone, leaving the vault silent, except for his loud breathing. Donneth stared around to find that the masked mage was already continuing on down the room to the door at its far end. He hastened after her. "'What was that?' he panted. "'A guardian,' said the mage, "'one that my spells would have had little effect against. "'Hush now.' "'The woman in the azure mask muttered a few words, "'and the doors swung wide. "'Something moved in the darkness beyond, "'a war helm hanging in the air "'as if it rested on a man's shoulders. "'It turned a little, "'and then flew into the room like a gliding bird.' right over the mage's shoulder. Fire blossomed from the helm's eye-slits, twin beams of flame that stabbed out at Donneth. The nobleman dodged behind the nearest pillar, hissing something that was half prayer and half curse. Fire scorched the stone, and sparks sprayed and tumbled around his head. Rolling, Donneth tried to get away, keep hold of his blade, and find his feet all at once— and then purple fire exploded overhead, and the room shook soundlessly. He scrambled up, still fleeing from the pillar, to see the masked mage gesturing him to halt. He did, staring around wildly. A pulsing, spitting sphere of purple radiance hung in the air, not far from them. Donneth stared at it. There was a round, dark shadow at the center of the sphere— the flying helm? he asked, his mouth suddenly dry. The mage nodded. Now it will serve as our guide. We stay behind it for the next few rooms, and the guardians waiting there will leave us be, so long as you don't touch any of them. They went on through chambers, and down another flight of stairs, into a long, narrow hall, whose walls were broken by many niches, each home to a silent, unmoving suit of dark plate armor. The purple sphere floated ahead of them, and twice along the passage, unseen magical barriers suddenly flared into violet radiance, flashed white, and then parted. 
The masked mage ignored such displays, striding steadily ahead until she reached a closed stone door. Donath peered at it curiously. Save for a pull ring and a keyhole, it bore no mark. Was this what they'd come for? The masked mage selected one of the keys, murmured something over it, put it to her lips, and then slid it into the lock. Donath didn't know what he'd expected to see beyond the door— Vandra Hast and a dozen senior war wizards bound and gagged, perhaps, but he'd thought the royal treasure vault would have gates and an inscription and guards. The masked mage in blue strode in without hesitation, glanced around quickly, and then stepped aside, the pulsing purple sphere moving with her. Donath followed, his sword raised and ready. Dust rose around their boots and hung heavy everywhere else, though someone, no, several someones, had come in and crossed the room recently. Armed men stood ready for them. No, just old and ornate suits of chaste and gem-studded armor. Donath eyed them warily, then looked around. Along the walls sat massive chests, except to the left— where there was a row of dragon skulls. Small purple gems gleamed along the brow of each of the great bone heads. A stuffed, well-worn minotaur stood guard over a low table where a line of crowns sat, all of them grander than the simple circlet King Azun favored. Donath blinked at the size of the gems in some of them. There was one ruby as large as his own fist— and then glanced quickly around the room again, still expecting some sort of attack. Another wall displayed a row of swords, halberds, and maces. Among them was a small glass case that held the scorched head of a sledgehammer. The footprints in the dust led to an armoire of tarnished electrum that pulsed with a faint blue glow of guardian magic. Its double doors stood open, revealing a fire-ravaged interior where ruined things had melted and dripped down to puddle on the floor long ago. The masked mage was peering carefully at a yellowed map. As Donath turned to look at it, she rolled it up, thrust it back into her bodice, and announced, "'Right, now we start back. My trap sphere won't last forever, and the helm will go free once the sphere evaporates.' Donath frowned. "'We're leaving? Didn't we come here to find something? Something to save the life of the king?' The masked head nodded. "'We did, and we have,' she said, turning to go." We came to find if something was missing from this room, and it is. Now we know much more than we did before. Donna's eyebrows rose in disbelief. We do? I don't. The masked head turned back to him. Come, she said simply, and went out the door, the purple sphere moving before her. He shrugged and followed. The woman in blue reached past him to point and whisper. Her spell made dust swirl up from the floor of the room for a brief instant, before it settled again, hiding the marks of their boots. "'The golden bull that struck the king down,' she said crisply as they swung the door closed again, "'was an automaton called an Abraxas, a constructed creature animated by magic.' One such beast appeared in Cormir in the past and ended up disabled in this room. Now it's missing. And that means that someone who can get down here is responsible for the king's condition, Donna said slowly. Either someone able to work the sort of magic you did to bring us past the guards and barriers, or someone in the palace. His eyes locked with hers. Someone in the palace is a traitor. Quite so, the lips behind the mask said softly. Which brings us to your more difficult task. 24. Sembians, Year of the Soft Fogs, 1188 D.R. 
King Printaller stormed around the campfire, his arms pinwheeling so violently that Jorinhas thought he'd take flight right then and there. If war is what they want, then war is what they'll get, he snarled for the fifth time during this current rant. War is not what they want, the wizard replied calmly. What they want is Marsember. If they can get it without war, then so much the better. The pair stood in the midst of a small encamped band of nobles, clerics, scribes, and guards at the narrowest part of Thunder Gap, the traditional boundary between the land of the Purple Dragon and the Chondathan colonies of Sembia. But now the Sembian cities were colonies no longer, but a nation of merchant cities ruled by expediency and gold rather than kings and wizards. The uplands around the storm-haunted peaks, which had been so much wilderness for so many centuries, were now regularly transversed by merchant caravans. The Cormirian group was camped on the near side of the pass, the Sembians in their oversized wagons on the far side. Their mutual meeting ground was at the Saddle of the Pass, a great field where tents of purple and black had been erected. The intention had been to hearken back to the splendor and power of the elves, but instead of radiant elven pavilions, these meeting tents looked like smoky mountains made of storm clouds. The activity within the largest tent was as stormy as the color of its canvas, for three days the king had met with the representatives of the Sembian houses, and for three days he and Jorinhast had returned to their own fires without a settlement. Each day Printaller's war mutterings grew louder and sharper. The sticking point was Marsember, of course, a nominally independent city-state on the Cormirian side of the Thunder Peaks, it had extensive ties, both legal and less so, with Sembia. The more prestigious Marsemban merchant families, craving respectability, favored merging with the Sembian state, while the nobles and the shadier merchants wanted it to remain an open city. The senior nobility, the Marleir family, sought the support, if not the armies and taxes, of the Cormirian crown. Jorinhast was supportive of an independent Marsember, at least for the time being. There were many times when the business of the crown needed to be dealt with in the shadows of Marsember, rather than braving the bright scrutiny of many noble eyes in the halls of Suzale. A measure of independence was needed for that. Sembian rule would be worse. An established presence of Sembians on the western side of the Thunder Peaks would be an ever-present encouragement for the more adventurous among the merchant families. Once the Sembians had one of their cities on this side of the Thunders, what would keep other cities and towns, such as Arabelle, Cradle of Rebels, from swearing fealty to gold as opposed to the Dragon Throne? After a number of long talks with the young king, Jorinhast had made the point that Marsember must be protected, and called a parley with the Sembians. Officially, they were here to settle the exact border between Cormir and Sembia, but the question of Marsember's status overshadowed wilderness boundary decisions. Printaller's argument was simple and straightforward. An independent Marsember would be good for all sides, and its fate was essentially a decision for the crown of Cormir, since Marsember stood squarely within Cormir's sphere of influence. And every evening, after a day of talk, they returned to their camp, and Printaller exploded with ever-growing rage. Now he stalked around the glow of the fire like a caged lion, spitting out his words like venom. Gold-fisted smart, thieving, lawyer-loving, scheming merchants, he bellowed. How did my ancestors stand to have such worms as their neighbors all these years? They were far neighbors for most of that time, the wizard explained patiently, and spent most of the time in phrase with the elves and the dalesmen to the north, and with their own Chondathan masters. Now that they are free of Chondath's tethers, they seek their own future. 
A future that includes Cormirian territory, it seems, Printaller shot back. Perhaps we should take the battle to them, instead of wasting time on words. The other nobles at the fireside raised a cheer, and Jorinhast saw a few of the servants and his own scribes nodding in agreement. He shook his head in amazement. Printaller, son of King Palaghard, and the warrior queen Enchara of Esperin, had grown strong and true, the very image of his father. He had his father's broad shoulders and piercing blue eyes. He had inherited his mother's fiery temper, however, and her ability to bring the troops to a blood boil, which was, of course, exactly what this situation did not need. Jorinhast sighed deeply. He had grown as well, though most of that had involved an ever-increasing waistline. His shoulders were still broad, and he had slowed the work of time sufficiently to keep his good looks, but next to Printaller the wizard tended to resemble a baker or a contended Lathanderite friar. If Printaller got his troops incensed, nothing would stop them short of war and Jorinhast realized what none of his countrymen seemed to see. In any dispute that went beyond a single battle, Cormirian steel could not hope to prevail against Sembian gold. Jorinhast did not entirely blame his liege's inherited temper for these outbursts. In each of their meetings thus far, the five Sembians had behaved like moneylenders approving a loan, as opposed to diplomats meeting a king. Kodlos was their nominal leader, but he had to check with the others before deciding even on breakfast. The vulpine Homfast and vulture-like Lady Threnka were united in their lust to make Marsember Sembian. Old Benesi was the scholar of the group, and seemed to have every treaty, purchase, and chance meeting of the two nations committed to memory and Jolitha Parr sat there and said nothing, but watched everything, a spider waiting at the center of his web. At no time in the past three days had they received Printaller as a royal personage, or even a head of state. They would not call him Majesty or Sire. They interrupted him often, with the air of merchants breaking into the ramblings of a junior clerk, they asked improper questions that time and again sent Jorinhast to check with his scribes and then challenged their records while the king sat smoldering. Jorinhast felt they did not want war, but their treatment of the king sent them well down the dark road to the battlefield. For his part, as the talks wore on, Printaller had become more belligerent and stubborn. Now he was refusing to even discuss minor matters of tariffs and exports, merely presenting the Cormirian viewpoint and refusing to compromise. Jorinhast understood his mood in the face of the constant insults and spurious challenges of plainly established facts and historical records, but the Sembians were not rebellious minor nobles or haughty representatives of some place so comfortably distant as they. These men had gold to spend, and they would send it to work in Cormir, or they would send it elsewhere, and if they sent it elsewhere, they might use it to buy soldiers. None of these observations would calm the angry king, nor sway the other nobles and guards, so Jorinhast cleared his throat and said, Perhaps we should merely decamp tonight and return to Suzale. Methinks the Sembians would get a very clear message should we not be here next morning. Printaller halted by the fire, as if looking for an answer in its coals. Jorinhast knew that despite his bombast, the king would lose Marsember if discussions broke down now. Finally, the king raised his head and snapped, One more day. I will deal with those accountants and gold misers for one more day. Then they'll see what it is like to anger a purple dragon. He wheeled and stormed into the moonlit darkness. Instantly, two of the nobles, Juarkin and Thessalian Crownsilver, fell into place behind him. 
Printoller thought of them as watchdogs. Jorinhast thought of the two nobles as the king's minders, and, more importantly, as the wizard's informants. They would walk down to the nearby lakeside, and the king would lecture them about how things weren't like this in his father's day and the crown silvers would nod and listen and make stern grunts of agreement, until eventually the king ran out of steam and bluster. In the meantime, the other nobles, squires, scribes, and healers of the royal party, would trade tales and speculate as to what the wizard Jorinhast would do to save the day in this particular case. Jorinhast, in this particular case, did not have a clue. On one side, he sympathized with the king. The Sembians were a bureaucracy without a strong leader, and as treacherous to deal with as a community of drow. On the other hand, now was a time for speakers, not warriors. If the king could not deal with the Sembians, war loomed on the horizon. If not with Sembia, then somewhere else. The royal magician smiled to himself, thinking of how things truly were in Palaghard's day. Printaller's father almost launched the nation into a war with distant pro Camper soon after his coronation, when a new crown crafted for the coronation was stolen. The king thought the jewelers of pro Camper were responsible, and he mustered the armies accordingly. The true thief, the pirate lord Imerk, was eventually revealed and the crown recovered. It was an ugly, top-heavy monster of sculpted gold, and after a few months it was relegated to the family treasury in favor of the original three-spired crown. Yet that golden monstrosity had nearly started a war, and now, perhaps, the hard-headedness of the Sembians was going to create another one. Jornhast rose, dusted off his robes, and slowly and leisurely headed after the king, one of his own scribes following in his wake. Around the fire a few heads were nodding to each other that the king and the royal magician would butt heads for a while, away from prying eyes, and the wizard would eventually bring the purple dragon back to the negotiating table, and from the look in the eyes of some— that would not be the best thing for Cormier, in their opinion. Jorinhast walked slowly down to the lake, both to enjoy the scenery and to give the king more time to calm himself. The meadows were as close to high summer as they would get, and it was pleasantly cool around him. A light woods of small, stunted fruit trees ran down to the lake. Once it must have been an orchard or a grove planted for late harvesting, but its original planters were gone, leaving only the trees as a living memorial. A waning moon, low on the horizon, illuminated the path sufficiently that the wizard did not need magical light to see his way. Somewhere night-blooming plants had opened for the bats, and their soft, fragrant scent hugged the ground. Jorinhast was among the trees when he heard the sounds of battle ahead at the edge of the lake itself. Human shouts were punctuated by the clang of metal clashing against metal. Jorinhast broke into a trot, his young scribe scrambling to keep up. The two burst from the trees to see that the two crown silvers were already down, and the king himself was locked in combat with a great metallic gorgon. The creature's scaled flanks caught the moonlight and reflected it back in shattered shards. Its massive head was wreathed in clouds of greenish smoke. Jorinhast turned to the scribe and shouted, "'Get back to camp and bring every priest and every man who has a sword to swing.' The young woman hesitated for a moment, her eyes locked on the great metallic creature. Then the wizard's shouted curse at her mazed wits broke her transfixed state." and she went scrambling back up the path. The king was fighting oddly, rushing forward to slash at the creature, and then dancing back again, then dodging aside when the great bull charged. Time and again his blows skittered along the sides of the beast, and in the darkness Jorinhast saw sparks fly as the steel struck against the scales. The wizard knelt by one of the fallen crown silvers. The youth was unmarked, but his face was drawn, and he was gasping for breath. Poison, then. 
Joran Hast laid the young noble's head down. There was little to be done until the healers arrived and turned back to the battle. The king was tiring, and the monster seemed unscathed by his attacks. Again his majesty danced forward, slashed without effect, and dodged back, clear of the creature's horns and breath. Not a gorgon, but some relative, perhaps, thought the wizard. The monster looked as if it could continue the battle until dawn. The king, sweat already pouring down his face, obviously could not. Printaller favored the wizard with a short, desperate look, then dodged out of the way of the beast's poisonous maw. Joranhast caught the pattern of the king's attack. It would be tight, and he did not know if the magic he had would affect the beast. However, he could not wait, and the nobles and knights would arrive too late if he hesitated. The royal magician raised his hand and started to craft the spell as Printaller dodged in once more to strike the beast. His blow had no more effect than the others. When the king jumped back, out of range of the poisons that engulfed the beast's head, he hoped fervently, Joran Hast, let loose his spell. A bolt of lightning sprang from his fingertips and thundered into the beast. The blast of energy struck the side of the creature and spread along its scales, as if it were trying to slit the creature apart. The golden gorgon, or whatever it was, staggered forward for a moment, then halted in its tracks, as if turned to stone by the force of the blow. Printaller's shoulders sagged in exhaustion, and he nodded his thanks at the wizard, panting, "'The monster was waiting for us here when—' Jorinhast held up a hand, and the king fell silent, puzzled. The gorgon was clicking, as if it had swallowed a giant ratchet. The magician of the realm approached the stone-still creature. Yes, it was making the low clicking noise. Now he could see in the moonlight the beast was not a living thing, but rather an automaton or golem in the shape of a great bull. Somewhere within it, something was attempting to repair the damage of the lightning bolt. Wizard and king looked at each other, and Joran Hast raised his hand again, signaling Printaller to stay back. He approached the clockwork beast carefully, expecting it at any moment to spring back to life. Holding his breath, he ran his fingers along the thing's head and shoulders. He found a small tray tucked beneath its chin. He pulled it forth, and a smoking, greenish pile of herbs tumbled out. The poison, obviously herbal in nature, that had felled the two crown silvers. Joranhast stepped back two swift paces and let the toxic fumes waft away in the night air. Then he returned to the creature's side and resumed his inspection. The clicking became louder and more rapid. He ran his fingers along the ridge of the machine's back. There was a small stud at the top of the spine, directly behind the nape of the creature's massive neck. Sweat gathered on the magician's forehead. The latch might silence the clicking, or reactivate the beast fully, or might cause it to explode. Should he wait for the other nobles, the knights, and healers? The creature began to slowly move its jaws, opening and closing them in a jerky rhythm. Within the metallic shell, Joran Hast heard bellows flex, and the mouth hissed to exhale the now-removed poison. Joran Hast cursed, offered a silent prayer to Mistra, and moved the control. The wheeze of the bellows died with the clicking. The beast became inert once more. There were shouts from up the hill as the first of the rescuers reached the abandoned orchard. King Printaller examined the creature. A magical device? Joran has nodded. One not normally found in the wilderness of Cormir. Someone put this here to ambush you. The king snarled. The Symbians! I swear this means war! Yes and no, said Joran Hast. Yes, it probably was the Sembians, or at least one of the merchants. But no, I don't think it means war. They saw this creature as a tool to be used to solve the border dispute. Let us use it to the same purpose. The king looked hard and long at the wizard, then nodded. 
Now the would-be rescuers were spilling down along the shore. The king turned and barked orders for the healers to attend the fallen crown silvers, and left Jornhast to examine his prize. The mage hummed to himself as he peered at the creature, exclaiming as he found small additional latches and hidden panels. He called for the four strongest of the knights to remove their armor and be ready for some heavy lifting. In the morning the Symbians were already gathered at the purple and black pavilion, waiting and asking in thirty-second intervals what the time was. The Cromerians arrived late to five scowling faces. His Majesty King Printaller, by contrast, was all smiles. If he had spent the previous evening battling for his life, he did not show it. "'You are late,' said Codloss gloomily, as if the king were a clerk sneaking past the noon bell. "'Yesterday you spoke of our lack of respect to your claims, and now—' "'Not late, merely delayed,' said the king, beaming as he interrupted the leader of the Sembian merchants. Codloss blinked twice, and Printaller waved back of the entrance. Two of the noble knights of Cormir were wrestling a low-wheeled cart into the pavilion. On the cart stood a large object, shrouded in a great swath of fabric. At one side of the cart walked Joran Hast, a contented grin plastered on his face. The merchants exchanged curious glances. Printaller continued, not giving the Sembians the opportunity to respond. "'Last night—' I went for a walk, to consider your offers and viewpoints. While I was doing so, I came across this in an abandoned orchard not far from here. The king nodded. Jorinhast took hold of a corner of the fabric shroud and hauled it aside with a flourish, revealing the golden gorgon he'd first seen the night before. Four Sambians leaned forward curiously at the sight of the golden bull. One, the ever-quiet Jothala Parr, leaned backward, his face turning an ashen gray. Jorinhast called, "'This is a wondrous creation, some sort of clockwork guard, apparently unaffected by the ages. But we do not know what it is. It—' Old Benesey, the scholar, interrupted just as rudely as he had for the last three days. It is an Abraxas mage. These were automatons created by Chondathan mages, but they could be used by anyone. They were usually activated by an unwilling human sacrifice and served as both guards and assassins. Finally, his brain caught up with his tongue and tripped up his flow of words. He stammered, looked at Jolitha Parr, then stammered again. Printaller broke in. Chondathan, you say? Well, that would explain your knowing about it. I think this must have been an old guard for Sembia's Chondathan borders. Joranhast, have you found out how to operate the creature? The mage bowed low. I believe that there is a latch along the spine here. Jolitha Parr started as if he had been set on fire. That will not be necessary, he protested, his voice rising along the scale with every word spoken. His Sembian fellows, or at least Codloss, Homfast, and Lady Thranka, turned their heads slowly to stare at the spider-like Jolitha. This was the first time the quiet merchant had spoken aloud, and it was as if the golden Abraxas had suddenly broken into song. Printaller went on. I note that learned Benesey here referred to this as a guard— if this is left over from the era of the Chandathians, it could be said that the original settlers of your country recognized the Thunder Peaks as the border between our lands. Lady Thrinka gave the king a small smile, and adjusted her pinch-nosed glasses to regard Printaller with cold condescension. 
you would have us believe that this creature has been sitting unaffected for hundreds of years just so that you might state that the borders of our lands— "'What other explanation do you have, my lady?' said Joran Hast. "'If it had not been left here by some previous Sembians, "'the alternative is that some present-day Sembians put it there. "'Then the question becomes, who and why? "'Is this what you are saying?' "'As he spoke, the spidery Sembian grabbed Lady Thrinka's arm "'and spoke softly and sharply in her ear.' Her demeanor tightened as he spoke, transforming from haughty and superior to tense and worried. She ignored the wizard's words and spoke to Printaller. "'I see your point, Your Majesty. Perhaps we should adjourn for a short caucus, Codlos, to discuss the merits of setting the official borders between our nations.' Codlos made a puzzled noise. "'My lady, we had just gotten started rather tardily, "'and we will start again once we consider this.' "'She rose to her feet. "'Come, you will forgive us this leave, your majesty?' "'Printaller smiled and managed a small half-bow. "'Always, your ladyship.' "'The five representatives and their aides made a quick retreat. "'Printaller turned to his wizard.' "'How long do you think it will take?' "'It depends,' said Joran Hast, "'on whether they come back to accept the Thunder Gap as our mutual border, "'or just head back for Orgelin right here and now.' "'She called me Your Majesty,' Printaller said. "'Twice,' replied Joran Hast, nodding, "'though it looked as if she were gargling slugs as she said it. "'And you noticed Jolithapar? said the king. Aye, said the wizard, and if you choose not to behead him right here and now, I guarantee he'll get a special magical visit later, and none will mistake the message or the messenger. Behead him, thundered Printaller, smiling broadly. The old spider has accomplished in one fell swoop what we've been trying to do for the past three days. I may give him a medal." Twenty-five. Lies, Spies, and Assassins. Year of the Gauntlet, 1369, D.R. We're almost ready, you know. Almost. Just a few more little details, and then we'll have to move very swiftly indeed. Andrin Drakahorn glanced around the chamber once more, and added apologetically, one can't be too careful, you know. The war wizards have spies everywhere, and who knows just whom they're working for. The other noble, one of the middle-aged daunting horns, curled his lips. Vanger de Hast, of course. Andrin's watery blue eyes blinked up at him. Well, some of them, of course, but I've reason to believe that a lot of them are working for other masters, noble masters. Trust me in this. My spies are everywhere, too. His nose almost twitched with excitement. As to why I counsel haste, have you heard what happened to Almer Cormeril and Sorgar Ilance? Both old family patriarchs were found dead in their beds, and on the very same morning. The other noble nodded knowingly. Just a little house-cleaning for those two families. I'm always surprised those serpents didn't father thrice as many daughters as they did to sell them into slavery— "'Guaranteed, gently-born, noble blue-bloods, and all that.' "'Andrin's eyes lit up. "'Now, there's a chance for a handsome prophet. "'Why didn't I think of that? "'I'll have to hire myself some lasses to breed with.' "'The older, taller noble shook his head. "'No, no, you've got to free Cormir first. "'And by the time you're finished accomplishing that high and splendid calling— and how many rich merchants can say they did that, toppling kings and setting new ones on thrones, eh? Other nobles'll have their broods well on the way, in a dozen years or so, 
After all the expense of rearing them and training them, you will be ready to sell and find the market glutted. I suppose, Andrin sighed, visibly crestfallen, and then said with a rush, But I almost forgot to tell you. I've heard that the same men slew both old Almer and the head of House Elance, men working for the same patron somewhere in House Cormayril. The other noble's eyebrows went up. Encouraged, Andrin rushed on. They're saying the war wizards were furious. They thought a few spells would find out who was behind it all once they got hold of one of the assassins. But when they started fishing them out of the harbor, they were headless and positively aglow with dead magic fields. The eyebrows went up again. Dead magic? That sounds like the work of someone a little more powerful than your average war wizard. Andrin seemed to purr with satisfaction. And you know, there's only one man in Cormir who fits this little scenario. As it happens, I was talking with our esteemed royal magician just the other day. A few private matters, you know. The gong by the bath door sounded faintly as if a discreet fingernail had tapped it. Gaspar Cormeril lifted his mouth from the stunningly beautiful woman and smiled coldly. Approach, he called, rolling her aside in the warm, languid waters with a firm hand and reaching for a glass of smoking blue wine, a rare and expensive import from a very distant place indeed, with the other. Sensibly, the lass settled deeper into the waters and nestled into the crook of the noble's arm. The scented waters were still roiling from her movements when the man in dark leathers padded to the edge of the pool, knelt, and murmured, "'News you should hear, Lord. Andrin Dracohorn's been heard talking of the deaths and tracing them to House Cormeril. Gaspar sipped at his wine. "'Has he now?' Well done, Tothtar. Send Elios to watch over our talkative little noble for the rest of the day, and then get yourself something to eat. I'll have something important for you later. He gave the man his serpent smile, nodded in dismissal, and turned back to the willing lass, sliding down into the deeper waters of the pool again. She began to murmur softly. Gaspar let her do so for a very short time, before he rolled over again and pressed a button that flanked the marble lip of the pool. A message gong sounded in the distance, and it had barely fallen silent before another man entered the room and knelt in smooth, practiced haste. "'Lord, command me,' he said. Gaspar smiled coldly." It has become necessary to remove Andrin Dracohorn. Someone is bound to take him seriously, eventually, and see to poor Tuthtar as well, ensure to his everlasting silence forthwith, before he has a chance to gossip in the kitchens. At once, Lord, said the man, and turned with a grin. A pity... "'Gaspar murmured, taking the willing lass into his arms again. "'But I can't have folk around who know too much about two fates. "'Every mouth that can talk of such things is a peril House Cormeril cannot afford.' "'He looked down at the woman. "'As her emerald eyes met his, they widened in sudden fear. "'Another pity.' Gaspar said with a smile, as he pressed another button to summon a second assassin. The man in robes strode past, looking grim. The two guards nodded in salute. When the man was safely gone and a stout door closed behind him, one of the purple dragons muttered, "'That's the first time I've seen Lord Alafandar in days now. Where has he been, I wonder?' The other guard shrugged. Best not to wonder, I've found. He's in there with Dimswart now, though. And by the looks of things, he's bringing along grim news with him. He frowned. I wonder what. Not far away, 
A dark figure peeled itself away from a pillar and stroked her chin. What, indeed? And just where had the sage been? It was high time to get some answers. A black-gloved hand fell to the hilt of a ready dagger. The crown princess of Cormir buried her face in the pillow and sobbed as she had never sobbed before, until she strained for breath and her ribs ached. The handkerchief held beneath her cheeks was sodden, and her hair was everywhere, and she felt sick, yet still she could not stop weeping. Oh, gods, she wailed in frustration. My lady, Onadar's voice came to her and a moment later his soothing hands touched her shoulders. Tanalasta shuddered under him, racked by fresh sobs of grief. "'Princess,' Onodar said gently, "'I have just now come from where the king lay abed and found him gone from the chamber, but the priests there said he yet lived. High lady, there is still hope. My father is dying.' Tanalasta sobbed. Dying! He lies so near death that they've moved him to somewhere secret, and they've forbidden me, me, his only family present, from seeing him. Only our lord, high and mighty wizard, and his two cronies, the bloody-minded sages, can see my father. They'll not let me in to see him until all that's left is a cold corpse. She rose, bolt upright on her bed, and hurled the sodden pillow across the room. The heavy, waterlogged cushion struck an oval mirror as tall as the princess herself and shattered it into a spider web of cracks. Princess, Onadar said helplessly, and she answered him with a snarl of rage that rose into a scream, then thrust her fingers into the next pillow like claws ripping and tearing. Onidar put firm arms around her and endured a few frantic moments of struggling and clawing before his lips found hers, and he began to stroke and soothe and rock her gently. It seemed a long time before she broke free of his kiss, trembling, and said quietly, "'I'm all right now, Onidar. Let me go. Thank you.' Onidar Bleth released her and sat back, concern darkening his eyes, and she managed a wan smile. "'I'm not handling this very well, am I?' "'Lady,' he said gravely, "'I don't think anyone faces the loss of her father very well. We do what we can, as the gods made us, and that is all we can expect and hope for.' He smiled faintly. "'Right now, what I hope for is your smile.' I haven't seen you smile in days. Tanalasta burst into fresh tears, a short shower that ended in a lopsided, sputtering smile. She put a hand on his cheek. You are the sweetest of men, my Onadar. Oh, deceived you too, have I? He teased, stroking her upraised hand. She chuckled weakly, and his lips found hers once more. They rolled over on the bed, and Tanalasta came up alone. No, she said. No, Onadar. Much as I'd like that right now, I can't. I I just can't. There's too much to worry about. Nobles muttering everywhere, rumors of rebels gathering in the king's forest, and even somewhere right here in Suzale. That old wizard gliding around, smiling at me and waving his writ of regency whenever he passes. I can't spend what may be my last few days of life rolling around on beds with you. What if the nobles came in and stabbed us both? What then? Then we'd be together forever, Onadar said lightly, adding hastily when he saw her brows darken in fury. But you're right, Lady Highness and I am wrong to distract you now. Your birthright is this fair kingdom of ours, and I must tell you that I have been very busy these last few days trying to ensure that what is rightfully yours does indeed pass to you. What do you mean? Tanalasta asked softly, her eyes dangerous. I've been talking to all the nobility I can find here in Suzale, 
putting to them the blunt question of their loyalty to you, should Crown Princess Tanalasta claim the dragon throne in the face of Vendredahast as a declared regent, or anyone else who thinks the throne might be his for the taking, for the good of the realm? What did they say? Tanalasta's voice was calm, but the last pillow she'd caught hold of was now a tortured rag in her hands. Most of them offered guarded support, Onodar said carefully, but many of them also complained about this and that which displeases them about the governance of the realm. I sense that if Cormir is to stay strong under a ruling queen Tanalasta, without its war wizards perhaps— Certain, uh, concessions to the nobility may be necessary to guarantee the security of the kingdom. Were they any more specific? Tanalasta asked dully. Some of them want a small say in the policies of the realm, Onodar said gently. A council of nobles that you'd consult with, or something of the kind. Tanalasta frowned. I see. So say the nobles. What of the others who dance ever closer to my father's throne? Onodar spread his hands. Rumors more than hard truth. Tanalasta waved a despairing hand. Rumors, then. Speak. The young pride of the Bleths leaned forward in excitement. Here, then. Your sister, Princess Alasair, has been seen to flee with her war band deeper into the Stonelands, apparently afraid to return to court. She and her nobles rode away from a patrol sent out from High Horn, specifically to speak with them. That sounds like my sister, Tanalasta said with a sigh. What else? I almost hesitate to say, High Lady, because it is but rumor and could well fly false, Onodar said gently. Out with it, Tanalasta ordered, exasperated. The young nobleman bowed his head to signify obedience to her wishes, and said gravely, "'It concerns your mother, Tana. I was trying to find out if it was true before I told you. Queen Philpharel has been stabbed by a would-be assassin's blade in Evening Star, and lies wounded and delirious there, in priestly care. Lathanderites, I would guess. I've heard no word of poison, but—' "'No!' Tanalasta gasped, going very pale. No, not mother, too. Onodar put an arm around her shoulders hastily, but she did not swoon or collapse into tears. He saw her bite a trembling lower lip and feel for a pillow that was no longer there. It was lying, now shredded, at her feet. Gently he put another pillow into her hand, and her slim, soft white fingers— Oh, he knew how soft, dug into the fabric like a falcon's claw, dug in, and then let go. The princess tossed the pillow aside, swallowed, and said firmly, but very quietly, I'm all right. Go on, my Onodar. There's more, isn't there? Her comforter nodded. It's Vendredahast, of course. A spasm of fury crossed the face of the princess at the wizard's name, and then was gone again. Her next words seemed to come with fresh energy she'd not shown before. Yes? Speak! He's been flitting about the kingdom, Onodor said grimly, and walking the halls of the court and the back alleys of Suzale even more energetically these last few days— talking to nobles and giving them promises, spells cast to their order— or just plain gold. Gold from the royal treasury, of course. He's gathering his own following, Tanalasta said faintly. She seemed unsurprised and calm. Her mind was engaged now, calculating what it would cost to buy a kingdom, and, Onodar thought, how much it would cost to prevent that sale. Exactly, Onodar said. And I've heard that both the court sages are off around the realms gathering support, mercenary troops even, for whatever he's planning. His royal regency, Tanalasta said flatly, a wizard ruling the realm. She lifted her shoulders in a shrug. 
Not a bad idea, actually, she added. So long as the rule is just, and the mage mighty enough to hold off the inevitable attacks from rival mages, as the symbol holds off the red wizards to keep her realm of Aglarond safe. Wizards can never be trusted, Tana, the young nobleman said, kneading her shoulders gently. You know that. His touch was bliss for her tight, tired neck and shoulders. The crown princess leaned back into his fingers with a sigh of pleasure. Oh, Onadar, I'll always be here to do this if you ask me to, Onadar murmured, close by her ear. Go on she said. Keep those wonderful fingers at work, and tell me more about the old wizard. She felt Onadar shrug. There's not much more any of us know, Tana. He's just here, and then there, and then gone. We don't have the spells to chase him around the kingdom, or fight him if he notices us following. But one doesn't have to be a sage, even a court sage, to see that he's up to no good. Remember the old tales. Cormir's wizards are loyal only to the crown, not to the one who wears it. In a place of darkness not far away, Donath Marleir took his eye away from his tiny spy hole and nodded. The scion of House Bleth was right. He'd already felt the same thing in his own now cramped bones. Vangerdehast was certainly up to something. The princess sighed. You're right, Onadar. She reached back and gently but firmly pushed away his massaging hands. My thanks for that. But I must get dressed and get out of here. Even if I can't stop wizards from snatching Cormir from me, I need fresh air and a place to walk and to be up doing something. I'm not going to lie in my bed until they come to turn me into a toad or charm me into marrying the noble of their choice or even gods, our Lord High Royal Magician himself. She stormed out of the room, hauling on the cord that summoned her ladies of the chamber as she did so. Step out into the receiving room, Onadar, her voice came back faintly. We're not officially betrothed yet, and I don't want people talking. From Donath's hiding place, the faint sound of Onadar's ascent drowned out her last words. They'd moved too far away for him to hear any more. Donath sighed, raked slivers of shattered mirror from his hair, took a last look through his spy hole, and crept away. Someone else heard the faint sounds behind the wall and smiled. That would be young Marla Ear departing. She might as well follow suit. The lady with eyes like flames spat out the rose she'd been absently toying with during her long, uncomfortable time curled up behind the wing tapestries of Tanalasta's bed. Its stem was almost chewed through. Emthrara, the harper, sighed and dropped the rose— then rubbed at her aching back and slipped away. When a maidservant came into the room a moment later with Tanalasta's discarded nightgown in her arms, she almost slipped on a rose lying on the floor. The servant picked it up and peered at it curiously. Someone had been chewing on the stem. She frowned, shrugged, and then carried it away for disposal, leaving the floor bare and unblemished once more. 26. Death of Dalmas, Year of the Wall, 1227 D.R. Rhodes Marleyear, youngest cousin of a minor relative of a fallen noble house, stalked the streets of Marsember, hunting for the King of Cormir. In its sheath, his serrated dagger wept sweet poison. The fall of Marsember had come within a generation of the establishment of Sembia's western border— once the Purple Dragon established a permanent border with Sembia, the slow, continual tightening of his royal gauntlet around the port city began. Finally, just to stay free, the ruling Marleyear family had been forced to publicly endorse the pirate trade in the city and to declare hostilities against the Forest Kingdom. 
and that's when Dalmas, mighty Dalmas, the warrior king of Cormir, crossed the marshes and took the city of Islands. Rhodes Marleir was nobility in name only. His immediate family was not within spitting distance of the Marsembian throne, but this was the only branch that had not perished battling the invading horde. And now, blade in hand, the young rogue was intent on exacting his revenge. The remainder of the town was in celebration, which angered Rhodes even further. These were the merchants and smugglers and thieves and petty nobles, like the Eldrunes and the Squirrels, who had loudly encouraged the ruling Marley Ears to stand firm against the Purple Dragon. Then these supposedly loyal followers deserted the cause when the king's forces first entered the marshes, and some, Rhodes suspected the treacherous Eldrun household, even guided the Cormirian army through the tortuous byways of the marsh to the city's open gates. Now those traitors tooted silver horns and threw gaudy bits of paper to celebrate their new masters and Marsembers' incorporation into the nation of Cormir. His uncles and great-uncles lay in Marsember bog, unavenged, along with the last of the Janthrans and the Orubeans, mighty Marsemban nobles all who in life would not have allowed one such as Rhodes, born on the wrong side of the blanket to a poor relation, to pass through the door of any of their palatial homes. That did not matter to Rhodes. All he had gotten from his relatives was a noble name, and now, thanks to their bull-headed stubbornness, the power of that name was gone as well. Still, Rhodes had his contacts in the city. Everyone knew Dalmas had taken over the old Marleir Manor as his base of operations a fortnight ago, but it was Halfhand Elos who reported that the newly arrived queen, Jalas Huntsilver, had suddenly taken ill, and the king was abroad in the city. The pawnmaster, Jaka Andros, told him the king was at the cloven shield drinking with his victorious troops. By the time Marleir had reached the shield, another source said that the king had adjourned to the Drowning Fish Fest Hall, and the proprietress of the fish, the old crone Magigan, had noted gravely that his lustful majesty had just left, three empty kegs to the better, with a pair of young ladies, one supporting each arm. For a fee, Magigan would recall where they were going— and for a slightly larger fee, she would forget that fact, and her telling of it, forever, after she told Rhodes. The last of the Marley ears paid the crone's fee, and sought out the apartment Magigan had mentioned. It was on one of the city's outer islands, which served Rhodes well. Half of the city was located on a treble handful of unnamed islands, hunched along the marshy shore. These small islets were linked by innumerable bridges of crumbling stone and sea-weathered wood, which added further to the maze-like nature of Marsember. The narrow streets and bridges of the inner islands were packed with revelers and soldiers. More warriors had fallen in the last two ten days to inebriation and exhaustion than had died in the brief siege of the city's low walls the two ten-day anniversary of the takeover, prompted by the arrival of Queen Jalas and rumor of the king being abroad in the city, had served as reason enough to spark a new wave of revels hard on the heels of the previous ones. The outward island was practically deserted. The last bands of party-goers clustered along its bridges, tossing empty bottles and insults at the barges beneath them. Here the buildings leaned against each other like drunks, and shadows seemed darker and more forbidding in the dying rays of the sun. The address the old crone had given proved to be a two-story, slightly leaning house of stucco and weathered lumber, its roof a rambling ruin of shellacked wooden shingles. The girl was running out as he stalked in. Half-dressed in a light shift of Thescan silk, 
she was clutching a blanket over her bare shoulders. She was small and blonde, and her blue eyes were wide and full of tears. She halted upon seeing Rhodes, then sobbed and fled, her bare feet slapping the cobbles, the blanket trailing after her like a cape. He found the other girl sitting on the second-floor landing. She was dusky-skinned and almond-eyed, with long, dark hair worn loose in ringlets. She also wore only a light shift as she sat with her knees up, clutching an overly brocaded pillow. She stared at the open doorway wordlessly, seeming dazed. Was the king he'd come to slay some sort of devouring, lusty lion who drove his partners to madness? Rhodes edged around the doorway to see a room in the disarray of passion. Discarded clothing of both sexes littered the room, cast over chairs, tall chests, and nightstands. The room was dominated by a single huge bed, with an overstuffed straw tick. Its covering quilts lay thrown to one side. In the center of the bed, tangled in the cotton sheets, sprawled Warrior King Dalmas. Naked and dead, Rhodes Marley ear carefully approached the bed, his hand on his dagger. The huge, muscular body of the king was already turning blue in its swath of sheets. The royal mouth gaped open in one last, endless battle cry, and the royal eyes stared unfocused at the ceiling. Rhodes touched the body with the back of his hand. It was cold and clammy. The last of the body's heat had departed with the king's fleeing life. The young noble cursed. How dare Dalmas die, here and now, before Rhodes had a chance for revenge? There was a subtle change in the stifling air of the room, as if a window had been opened for a moment and then shut again. Rhodes realized he was no longer alone in the room with the dead king. He turned. The new arrival was a broad-shouldered man whose large gut spilled over the top of his belt. He wore red and black robes of vivid hues and expensive make. A mage's sigil in gold thread was embroidered over his heart. Rhodes did not know the symbol, but he knew who the man must be from half-hand's descriptions of the royal court. This was Joranhast, royal magician of Cormir. Rhodes began to stammer that he'd found the king this way, but the wizard swept him aside with one arm and went to the bed. He touched the king at the neck, the breast, and the inside of the thigh. Then he cursed mildly and pulled a small book from his vest. He raised the book and muttered something in an alien tongue. Sparks of light danced around the pages and grew swiftly in brightness and number to orbit the volume like the streaming stars in the skies over Faerun. The wizard laid the book on the king's forehead. The sparks danced, flared once, and then died. Dalmas continued to lie there, blue and stiff. The wizard leaned on the bed with both fists, his shoulders slumped in defeat. He cursed again, longer and louder this time. "'That's it, then,' said the wizard. "'He's well and truly dead. His mighty heart failed him, obviously in a moment of passion. Even the Book of Life could not bring him back this time.' He turned his head to look at the young noble. "'Were you here when it happened?' "'Me?' asked Rhodes, then shook his head. "'I've only just arrived. He was, uh, entertaining.' The young Marley ear pointed his chin at the open doorway. Beyond, the dusky-hued girl was watching everything with staring eyes. "'The only witness?' asked the wizard. "'There was another young lady,' said Rhodes. "'She left suddenly.' Joranhast cursed again and looked hard at the noble. "'And you were here with the girls?' Rhodes straightened his shoulders and looked the wizard in the eye. I am no panderer, mage. I am of the blood of House Marleyir, one of the last, thanks to this man. So you came here, poisoned blade in your sheath, seeking revenge, said the wizard. I came seeking justice, said Rhodes. I regret that I was too late to meet it out. Justice, the old mage spat the word like a curse. 
Is that what they call unthinking bloodlust these days? Rhodes Marley Ear's eyes narrowed. And how did you know where to find him? Joran Hast held up a hand. I came bearing sad news. Her Highness, Queen Jalas, has perished. Apparently in an allergic reaction to some fish served at dinner. Like Dalmas, no amount of herb craft or priest's magic could save her. Both of the rulers of Cormir have perished within hours of each other. I fear for your city, Marla Ear. The news amazed Rhodes. It was as if the gods themselves were saying, in their unsubtle way, that conquering Marsember was not the wisest of moves for the Cormirian crown. He forgot that Jorinhast had not exactly answered his question. Then the mage's last comment registered, and Rhodes asked sharply, "'You fear for my city, mage?' "'Aye,' said the royal magician, his face a mask of concern. "'Once word gets out that both king and queen died in Marsember, regardless of how, there will be a gnashing of teeth and a seeking of revenge.' or, as you would call it, justice. Seven companies of purple dragons walk and drink deeply in this city right now. Tell them their king, their warrior king, is dead, and his queen alongside him. Can you imagine the carnage and rioting that will ensue? For the first time, Rhodes really thought about it. They'll destroy the city he said quietly, seeing in his mind islands that were only ashes, houses put to the torch, the bridges broken, the vultures swooping down. Marsember would be abandoned once more, the royal magician intoned, and its abandonment would not be peaceful. It is well that you had no hand in his death, for revenge would be swift and hard, and no mage or warrior or pirate could shield you. He looked down at the spread-eagled corpse on the bed again and sighed. Even now, I fear Marsember will be devastated by these deaths, and some of the same conspiring merchants who opened the gates to us have crept away during this last ten-day. They might well return after the fury has abated and the city has been torn apart and try to establish their own kingdom. Then Cormir would return, death upon death, year after year, feuds that die not, and children who do. Sometimes the gods play savage jests on us all. Rhodes Marley Ear stared at the wizard, realizing the man was truly sad at the thought of Marsember's fate. He felt tears rising in his throat, and at the same time a curious thankfulness. He'd never stood thinking beyond his own pride before, thinking down the generations and ages of the fates of realms and cities and peoples. No wonder folk thought wizards strange. Rhodes thought of the many islands of the city that was his home, the rat warrens of twisted streets and ancient, decaying buildings, the sagging wharves and inns and taverns and fest halls, all gone in a passion as hot and burning as his own hatred of the king. Marsember swept away. "'What if he did not die here?' Marley Ear asked suddenly. What if you teleported him back by magic to lie beside the queen, and men thought they died together in their sleep? The royal magician shook his head. They would still both have died in Marsember, and enough people heard Queen Jalas complain of the food that the assumption would be that they were poisoned by rebel Marsembians. The fire and rampage would follow inescapably. Rhodes sighed in sudden despair. Then my city is doomed. I wish I'd slain him myself. Then I'd be the only one held responsible, and not all the people of Marsember. A noble thought. Yet dark times will come indeed, said the mage. Unless— Unless? echoed Rhodes. The royal magician of Cormir drew himself up and asked formally, Rhodes Marla Ear, will you pledge your loyalty to the crown of Cormir? which will now pass to Palaghard, son of Dalmas. The young noble looked at the mage, dumbfounded. 
Had the men not heard him confess his desire to kill the king? Knowing, the wizard continued, that in doing so you'd save Marsember from much rioting and ruin, and gain a full noble title and rewards for you and your surviving house? I suppose, Rhodes shrugged, and then their eyes met. He sighed again, drew himself up, and picked up Joran Hass's book from the cold forehead of the corpse. The wizard made a sudden movement and then froze. The Marsemban nobleman handed him his book, looked into the eyes of the mage, and said firmly, "'To save Marsember from seven companies of drunken, enraged purple dragons, I will so swear, I do so swear, if you will protect this city.' Joran has nodded. Done, I hope. Rhodes raised an eyebrow, and the wizard started to pace the room. Dalmas was a great war leader, but only a fair to middling ruler. He was too much the slave to a lust for battle, as well as for other more earthy lusts. By rights, he should have died in battle. We can ensure that if you're willing to assist me. "'Willing? In what way?' Rhodes asked, eyes narrowing. "'His Majesty must be seen leaving this place and returning to his quarters, "'where he will sleep undisturbed through the night,' said the wizard. "'I will teleport back to Marla House with the body and store it, "'say, within the royal carriage that brought the Queen here. "'We load Queen Jalas similarly. "'In the morning the King will be called back to Suzale.' He will go by carriage to be with his queen, and will not take escorts on this safe trip through known country. Regrettably, they are ambushed on the coast trail by known rogues and brigands. How do you feel about the fire knives? Marsember has no love of the fire knives thieves' guild, Rhodes replied stiffly. Then the fire knives it is, the wizard said with a grim smile. The king dies protecting his queen and passes into history as warrior king rather than libertine, and it all happens far from the walls of Marsember, which allows this fair city to drift easily into the arms of Cormir without further bloodshed. Rhodes was silent in response. The plan had more bizarre angles and perilous steps than the trader's market in Marsember. Nevertheless, if all went well, it would work. He asked, "'You want me to impersonate the king? Aren't there laws against such a thing?' "'If caught,' the wizard said with a shrug. "'And Rhodes Marla ear, I pledge to you my aid in getting you out, if you are. Unless someone has the unusual presence of mind to check once and again to see that their drunken monarch truly is their drunken monarch, no one will know. Indeed, if there is any doubt—' They'll likely summon me to determine your identity. Rhodes smiled grimly. And in return, I get my noble house in Marsember? You get your noble rank, said Joran Hast. But too many questions will be asked if it is in Marsember. I don't want to be a petty lord of some sheep path, Rhodes said grimly, folding his arms. What about Arabelle, then? suggested the wizard. A large city with a number of local nobility— far from the easy reach of the throne. Arabelle would be suitable, agreed Rhodes. And it revolts against the crown every hundred years or so. You'll fit right in. The wizard smiled again. Moreover, I can see my way clear to losing enough gold from the royal treasury that, when you're as old and as fat as I, and have sons of your own mind, you can buy any islands you want in Marsember again. "'but you must give me your most solemn oath "'that you'll never speak of this to anyone. "'Not a wife, not an heir, not a crony.' "'Rhodes Marla ear nodded. "'I so swear on my noble name "'on my loyalty to House Oberskir and Cormir, "'and so let me hear you swear "'that you will protect Marsember.' "'More than that,' the wizard replied. "'Dalmas would have looked upon Marsember "'as an irritant removed.' but in the end no more than another trinket of conquest, to be forgotten after it is acquired. Palacard, or rather King Palacard II, is a more thoughtful man, 
I think it will be easy to convince him to improve upon his late father's acquisition, to bring in stone and new construction. I swear I will move him in that direction. Agreed? Royal magician, Rhodes said softly, you have yourself a deal. I will be true to this before all the gods you care to summon. Joran Hast clucked disapprovingly. God's summonings? I leave that sort of truly dangerous nonsense to young nobles. Folk think them strange, you know. Rhodes chuckled helplessly. Joran Hast scowled at him. Stand still, he said, or I'll have to shock you senseless and put you in bed with Dalmas there, to try to get you into his likeness. The young noble stood very still. The wizard peered at him and set to work, slowly cloaking Marla Ear with the seeming of the king. When the last spell was done, Rhodes examined himself in a cracked mirror and then looked down at what lay on the bed. The match was perfect, rendered by an expert who'd known the original subject from birth. "'Don't talk while you're on the road, for that I cannot fix now,' said the royal magician. "'Limit it to grunts.' That was about the level of the king's speech when he was drunk, in any event. One last thing, said the king, with Marley Ear's voice. Are you going to do this same magic for the queen? Joran Hast paused. I suppose so. I'll recruit some serving girl for the impersonation. Someone of strong will, like yourself. Many of the court know of the queen's illness, but almost none of her death. One of the queen's servants would be missed, said Rhodes. You have a suggestion? asked the wizard. Rhodes looked out the door. Following his gaze, Joran Hast saw the dusky-skinned woman. She was still sitting there, eyes and ears open, and had been watching them, not daring to make any sound by moving. Her eyes were very large and dark. Lass, Joran Hast said, Know that I am the royal magician of Cormir, and hold the power in my hands to cook dragons to ashes. He raised one of his hands meaningfully, and added with a smile, On the other hand, I also have the power to transform young wenches into queens. It took only a little coaxing to convince the young woman to throw in with the plan, given the choice between horrible death now or at any time in the future if she spoke out, and nobility, a manor house full of fine gowns, with good food in plenty, servants, a swan pond, and the ear of the royal magician to pursue any interests that might come to her, to say nothing of a husband, if she could see eye to eye with the darkly handsome young man she'd seen change into the king before her eyes. She looked at him now and frowned. Strip, she told Rhodes calmly, and put on all the things he tossed around the room. You're the king now, and none of what you're wearing fits. Looking down, the young noble saw that she was right. His clothes and dagger went onto a sheet, and the body of Dalmas was rolled onto it and then wrapped up in a tight bundle. The wizard glanced around the room, nodded, and made a quick, intricate gesture. He... The shrouded corpse and the girl began to glow with a soft radiance. One last thing, he said as the glow spread and gained strength. Dalmas was well loved in Arabelle. You might consider putting up a statue for him. When I hear of improvements in Marsember, I shall, the young noble replied tartly, then grinned in real pleasure for the first time he could remember. The radiance rose to blinding intensity, and then abruptly faded, leaving him alone in the upstairs apartment. Marla Ear checked the room over for any fallen royal jewelry or other evidence they might have overlooked that would tell a nosy Cormirian that his king had been here and died here. He found nothing. The temporary king closed the door on the squalor of the room where Dalmas had died and headed down the stairs. The king had been, well, was, a taller man than he, and it was more difficult than he thought it would be to maneuver his new body down to street level. Fortunately, Rhodes thought, the original king had been drunk. A few staggers would be forgiven. 
He met the other girl, the blonde, at the doorway. She was creeping timidly back in to see if the drunken monarch had truly died in her arms, and she nearly leapt out of her skin when confronted with his majesty, hale and hearty, seeming none the worse for wear. Marla Ear kissed her gently on the forehead, then winked and weaved off into the city on his way back to the official royal residence at Marla Ear House. There'd be other lasses to kiss on his journey. If he did this properly, many eyes would see and remember King Dalmas this evening, and in the morning he and his queen would board the coach to take them back to Suzale. And in a week's time, there would be mourning across an entire realm for the fallen crowned heads of Cormir, and a new noble lord and lady sitting at ease by a swan pond in Arabelle. 27. Deals. Year of the Gauntlet, 1369 D.R. The old nobleman finished speaking and fixed the wizard with a level eye, trying to determine if the wizard had truly been listening. "'Legitimate concerns,' Vangita Hast repeated the old noble's words gravely, nodding, and meant it. Albeiran Dauntinghorn had a remarkable skill for seeing clearly through dishonesty, deliberately obtuse courtly phrases, and misleading impressions. Unfortunately, that's precisely what the royal magician of Cormir did not need right now. He was going to have a lot of hasty and hardy work ahead of him, as it was, to keep the court from becoming a graveyard of nobles wearing daggers in their ribs over the next ten day or so. The nascent factions seeking to remake Cormir had their respective bits between their teeth, and were starting to pull on the realm, trapped between them. The image of Cormir as the helpless victim being torn apart between four horses was all too painfully accurate just now. Vangita Hast gave old Elbaran his best confident smile and told him, "'You have my word that, if I am named regent, I will bring the matters you raise before the open court and see that they are dealt with directly, rather than festering unattended through the months ahead.' They exchanged the curt nods of old, wise equals who dealt with each other in mutual respect, then parted. The court wizard turned along the Hall of Honor, where the names of common soldiers who had died valiantly in the service of the realm were graven on the stones of the wall, and headed for Gemstar's Hall, where there were bound to be some nobles muttering together about the dark future of Cormir. It was time to fill a few more gullible heads with promises of what could be theirs if a certain wizard were made regent. He was halfway there when a page in the tabard of palace service hurried up to him, bowed, and said in a voice sharp with excitement, "'Revered Lord, Lord Onadar Bleth would speak with you in the flame-dance hall at your earliest convenience. He says the matter is of utmost urgency to the security of the realm.' "'Of course it is,' Vangita Hass said almost soothingly, and added, inclining his head in dismissal, "'My thanks. I shall attend Lord Bleth directly. If you have been charged to bring him a reply, you may inform him so. If not, spare yourself the run. I shall not keep him waiting long.' The page bowed and ran off toward the palace. "'Of course,' thought Vangita Hast, and looked up and down the Hall of Honor to see if he was being observed. The page dwindled into the distance and turned down the east stair. There was no one else in sight. The wizard nodded in satisfaction, laid his hand on a particular inscription on the wall, and spoke a certain word. The block seemed unchanged, but his fingers sank into it as if it no longer existed. He reached in, plucked a certain ring, a pendant, and an armlet from the small cloth bag that he knew would be there, and drew them forth, speaking another word that made the stone solid again. Donning the three items, he resumed his walk, heading not for Gemstar's Hall any longer, but for the palace and the soaring hearths of Flame Dance Hall. The flames would be illusory during weather this warm, but their endless leapings were fascinating to watch nonetheless. 
It will be best to get this over with, now that he was protected against poisons, normal missiles, steel weapons of all sorts, and the effects of hostile gases. It would be most indecently hasty to try to strike down the royal magician of all Cormir, leaving the land mageless once more. But then these ambitious young nobles seem to care not a whit for the safety of the realm, nor for rules, courtesies, and conventions. Truly a wonderful future lay ahead for the kingdom. Two bellerjacks nodded to him respectfully at the threshold of Flame Dance Hall, and threw the doors wide. The old wizard strode in calmly to find only one figure waiting for him, with a decanter and two glasses. Vangita Hast smiled slightly as he heard the doors close softly behind him and walked steadily forward. So this day finds you desirous of converse with the wise old mage of Cormir, does it? he asked cheerfully. Well then, speak. I bring both time and interest to hear you out. Those piercing brown eyes locked with his, and the thin lips beneath the thinner mustache twisted slightly. That is convenient, Lord Wizard, for I find I have matters of crucial import to the future of the realm to discuss with you. Vangertahast stopped a few paces away from the young noble and raised both of his bushy brows. How so? A man who spent so much of his time in recent years hunting boar and deer carries matters of crucial import about with him? And undiscussed? Onadar poured himself a glass from the decanter, amber and sparkling, old, fine, flame-kiss, by the looks of it, and said almost wearily, "'Whatever you may think of me, Lord Vangerdehast, I am no longer a boy, but a man. Moreover, one affianced to the future Queen of Cormir. I have the ear of the Crown Princess, and eyes quite able to see the future ahead of us all.' Pray do me the courtesy of dispensing with the old wise one patronizing the self-important puppy act. It demeans you more than it does me. Speak, then, Vangita Hast said calmly, shaping something in the air behind him with one hand. Onadar laid a hand on the hilt of the court rapier he wore. Casting spells when discussing affairs of state is a dangerously bold breach of courtesy he said, gliding a step forward. Vangerdehast finished his gesturing and sat down calmly on the empty air, as if reclining in a comfortable chair. He made a flippant gesture of dismissal with his fingertips and said, "'Lad, casting spells is what wizards do. If you don't like being around castings, don't summon wizards into your presence as if they were your servants. And of the two of us here—' I shall be the judge of what court courtesy is or may be. All these veiled threats and posturings demean you more than they do me, to borrow a much overused phrase. Onadar's mouth tightened, but he let go of his sword. Facing the wizard, he struck a pose. Probably unconsciously, the wizard judged, these well-muscled noble sons with their sleek good looks— started doing such things the moment they noticed that the world held women, and said, "'I'd like to dispense with all the fencing between us for an hour or so.' Vangerdehast raised an eyebrow and gestured at him to continue at his pleasure. The wizard would attend to his words. Onadar raised a matching brow of his own, drew a deep breath, and said, we are prepared to accept you as regent of the realm, if, and only if, you agree to certain conditions. We? Are you speaking for the princess? Surely not, without her writ or herald. Or are you speaking for your father, and your older brothers, Fairn and Lothtar, or the entire house of Bleth? Onadar's mouth tightened again. I speak for myself and for the nobles, both within my family and without, who stand with me on this point. Rest assured that I can muster to support me more nobles of Cormir than any other person in the realm, including, my lord, yourself. Do you want to hear my conditions, 
or shall I inform them that you are a mad old tyrant best removed from Faerun forever? Vangetahast smiled. The youth spoke of my conditions, not our conditions, and failed to notice the slip. The wizard nodded. I do indeed wish to hear them. Perhaps we can deal together for the continued good governance of the realm. Brantara, we're here. The small disturbance of whirling lights and roilings of the air in front of the young noble promptly grew two burning eyes, then sighed. They were within the palace itself, in one of the innumerable hiding holes and hidden passages. This one had seen only a few booted feet disturb the dust. The spectral appearance sighed again, a soft, feminine sigh. It seemed to say, were all the nobles of Cormir as excited as young boys, creeping around and whispering? Was this all she had to work with? That is good, the burning eyes said instead. At the sound of her voice, the five men in their gaudy court dress tensed, drawn swords glittering in their hands, all gulped and drew in breaths. The woman who was using the name Brantara went on. Are you ready to forge a glorious future for Cormir and for yourselves? The boldest of the nobles, Ensren Emerask, the one she'd first contacted, took a nervous step nearer her mystic portal and stammered, y Yes, lady, we are. Then hold out your cloak under my eyes, well below them. Tentatively, Ensrin did as he was bade, and the whirling lights so close above him spat out something. He flinched, but managed to catch it in his cloak. It rolled over once, twice, and stopped. A ruby, as large as his thumb. The radiance pulsed again, and another stone joined the first. Three more joined it before the voice said, "'One for each of you to start with.' Earn them now. How, Lady Brantara? Go to the shrines just established in the palace, where Crown Princess Tanolasta worships. She will be on her way there shortly to kneel in prayer. Slay her. Someone gasped, and someone else swallowed noisily. The room was suddenly full of nervous shiftings and the flashings of moving blades. Ensrin then did the bravest thing he'd ever essayed in his young life. "'Kill the crown princess?' he asked. "'Yes, and bring away her head with you, to hide in the place where first we met. Strike now. The princess must die this morn. It's best if your attack comes at the altar of Timora.' when the princess is kneeling, far from guards or alarm gongs. Only one priestess should be in attendance. If you tarry, be warned that the chamber consecrated to Tyre is staffed by several heavily armed war priests of justice. Ensrin swallowed, raised his blade in salute, and quivered in excitement. Lady, it shall be done. Aye, the others echoed in a ragged chorus. The eyes of fire looked around at them all, and the voice of Brantara said, Good, do this, and the wealth I promised is yours. You'll never have to lift swords or anything else again. Go. Ensrin nodded sharply and drew a black silken mask from a belt pouch. As he drew it on, the others followed suit, and the little sphere of whirling lights sighed again and faded away. Five masked men boiled out of the room and hurried along darkened back passageways of the palace. It was too bad for the lone purple dragon, who happened to round a corner in front of them. Swords plunged into his face and throat without hesitation, and he fell against the wall and then slid to the floor without making more noise than a gurgle. Dealing death, it seemed, was very easy. 
Back in the hidden room, the last motes of Brantara's light finally faded away, and something promptly moved atop an armoire in the corner. A moment later, a woman in dark mottled leathers, who wore a locket on a ribbon around her throat, dropped lightly to the ground and hurried to the door. The nightmare, young nobles rushing around the palace with blades ready in their hands, and the will to use them, was beginning at last. Emthrara raced down the corridor, drawing her own blade as she ran. If the gods smiled for once, perhaps she'd not be too late. At the first corner, the fallen form of a purple dragon lay sprawled. A hulking form, his back to Emthrara, rose up from the body, the spilled blood spreading around the man's feet in gleaming ribbons. The harper rushed toward the man, raising her blade for a thrust that would slay him before he had time to react. She was delivering that deadly thrust when the man looked straight up at her. Emthrara shouted as she saw his face, her sword in mid-swing. He ducked, but it was too late. She half-checked her swing, and instead of biting into flesh, managed to strike the hallway corner. Her sword left a pale, chalky streak where it clanged against the metal. Rolligan, she shouted. "'You didn't!' "'Of course I didn't,' said the turret merchant, looking down at the fallen purple dragon. "'Whoever did pass this way recently? The body is still warm, and no one else has found it yet.' "'Then who did this?' asked the harper. "'And more importantly, where are they now?' said the merchant, pulling from his belt a long, wickedly curved knife. What say we find out? Onadar smiled silkily. Hear me, then, wizard. I, the nobles who stand with me, and my lady, the princess, will accept you as royal regent of the realm for a brief period of clearly proclaimed duration— during which you will involve the princess constantly in all of your decisions, so that she can learn how you govern the kingdom. We will not accept any regency of more than five winters in length. Have we any dispute on this? The royal magician shook his head in agreement. Your words thus far simply define what a regency is, a definition I have no quarrel with. He smiled thinly. So I'm sure there are more conditions— just one, Onodar said coolly. One that a mage who likes authority so little and counsel so much should have no difficulty at all in accepting. A regent's council of a dozen or so nobles who have the right to overturn or stay your decisions by a two-thirds majority vote. And who will choose these nobles? And how will they be unchosen? The wizard asked. Onadar frowned. Unchosen? If council members do not serve for finite periods and then leave office, you do not have a council, Vangerda Hast said pointedly. But a dozen or so petty kings, a realm under such chaos would be ungovernable and is something I'll never agree to. Your alternative? A two-year term for each councillor, followed by two years in which the same woman or man could not serve. Every two years, each councillor can nominate one candidate for the council. Each local lord of the realm can nominate one candidate. I nominate one. The lord sages Alafandar and Dimswart each nominate one. And each living member of the immediate Oberskir family who is able, or of age, to speak for herself can nominate one candidate each. A simple majority, not a two-thirds count, will serve to appoint a candidate to the council. Onodar's eyes narrowed. What if we vote in more than a dozen councillors? Then the council grows, at least temporarily. And if less than a dozen can be agreed upon? Then I shall name one person to the council— the marshal of the realm, or senior officer of the purple dragons, will name one, the two sages will each name one, the oberskiers will each name one, and so on, until we have our dozen or more. These namings would be binding appointments, not one-man-one-vote proposals, and the only beings in all Faerun who could refuse them would be the named candidates themselves. While the council sits powerless? That's hardly fair. 
Ah, but knowing that such a fate awaits the realm, the council will have to agree on some candidates rather than simply refusing everyone proposed as their successors. And if they refuse? Vanjita Hast shrugged. Then I ignore them, and their vetoes fail, as they will in any case whenever I resign my regency and an Oberskir takes the throne. Need our ruler be an Oberskir? The wizard shrugged. If you want to remain in the forest country, technically the answer must be yes. The original elves who kept this land and entrusted it to the Oberskirs might take a dim view of other hands being found at the helm. Onadar sneered. Spare me the fairy tales, mage. Keep to the serious. Are you telling me that after all these years the elves would return and press a claim against a land we've ruled for thirteen centuries? Vanjur de Hast did not answer, but instead let the question hang in the air for a long moment. The point had been made. Onadar did not know if the old wizard was telling the truth. Indeed, there was much the young Bleth did not know. The noble looked deeply into the hearth, then turned with the agile grace already displayed on many a dance floor. Let us agree, for the moment, as an abstract point of debate, that we accept your view of council servitude and powers and your contention that one of Oberskir blood must lead us. He smiled softly and turned to fix the mage with a steady, searching gaze. Tell me, then, is one born directly from the seed of an Oberskir king, not of Oberskir blood? You speak, in this case, of the many King Azun has fathered, or is rumored to have fathered, Vanjur de Hast said calmly. Yes, they are of Oberskir blood, and stand in precedence ranked by senior birth date, behind all of the pure house of Oberskir. If I... The sages, the wizardess Laspira, and the major priests of the realm agreed to by us and the high heralds we shall call in, if such a determination ever becomes necessary, and not before then, can all agree on the lineage of each bastard candidate. We alone shall investigate such claims, not a whispering cabal of nobles. And I warn you, young Lord Bleth, that if we are ever forced to mount such an indelicate investigation, we shall thoroughly delve into, bring to light, and proclaim throughout the realm every illicit birth connected to every noble house in the land. The royal magician smiled faintly. Nary an escutcheon shall remain unblotted, to quote the old saying. Onidor made a gesture of uncaring dismissal. Fair enough. Who, in your view, is to name our first council? Vanjur de Hast replied promptly. I could ask nobles to nominate themselves and put them to a test. Those who pass are councillors. Those who fail will be dead. A test, Onidar said darkly. A dangerous quest, no doubt. Or face-to-face -face personal spell duels with you? Both of those seem excellent proposals, the wizard agreed brightly. Which do you prefer? Stop playing with me, mage, Onidar snapped. So, say we agree to your vote of heralds, and the council forms, and they vote you down on something. What then? I accede to their wishes, Vanjita Hast replied. But continue to formulate policy for the realm. They are to act as reins on me, and the princess under my tutelage, not as commanders over us. Moreover, voting us down does not make her an unprincess, or oust me from my office as royal magician of the realm. Onidar nodded slowly, stroking his chin. I can see us coming to an agreement on this, he said slowly. Tell me, what do you really think of such a council? A good notion, the wizard said. It's high time some of our nobles saw the decisions a ruler faces clearly, rather than through the bellyaching, self-serving blinkers most of them habitually wear. What? The wizard held up a hand. Don't roar at me, young Bleth. You wanted plain speech, remember? He waggled a finger. Besides, I need to know your answer to a question. And that question is, Onidor Bleth snapped, still visibly angry. 
Our council and regency are installed, and both run more or less smoothly, let us say. The wizard leaned forward to fix Blath with a searching gaze. What happens if, after five years, Tanalasta is no more capable of taking up the reins of power than she is now? And who would judge such a thing? Onidar replied softly. We both know that she'd never measure up, in your eyes, to what a monarch of Cormir has to be. It's nice to know that you already know what we'll both think five winters hence, Vangita Hass said dryly. No wonder every last noble in the realm thinks he knows exactly how to govern Cormir. Onidar Bleth sighed and set down his glass. You can never stop teaching the fools that the gods set all around you, can you? The wizard almost smiled. It's one way to spend a life, he said mildly. The young noble shook his head, sighed, and then said briskly, In answer to your question, the council would see to it that the crown princess ascended the throne in any event, proclaiming the situation throughout the realm. I doubt even a lord high wizard could last long if every last hand in the kingdom was raised against him. No matter where you slept, there'd always be a forester or farmer or good wife, skillet or something in hand, to smite you down. Vangertahast raised his brows but said nothing. The young noble smiled triumphantly and added, One more thing. I know that one of the Oberskir family treasures is an item that protects the mind of its wearer from sorcerous influences. I want Tanalasta to wear that item, and I want it examined by a neutral wizard, one not from this realm, to be sure that it hasn't been tampered with. I want him to ascertain and tell all of the council the precise limitations of its powers, and I want enchantments that duplicate those powers placed upon items worn by all members of the council, including myself. I'm afraid that, as one of those arrogant young nobles you speak of, I can't find myself ever linking the word trust and the word wizard. He gave Vandra de Hast a saccharine smile and picked up the empty glass. Something to drink? The wizard shook his head. Everyone seems to be buying his poisons from Westgate these days, and they always make things too salty so they can water down the stuff, because folk are driven to drink more of it. Onidar's lips tightened. I don't like your inference, mage. Whether you like or dislike what I do or say is immaterial, noble, Vajra Hast replied easily. I am trying to govern a realm, not win fawning popularity contests among young noble boys. Yes, Onidar said softly. That's precisely what you're trying to do, govern a realm. And for the good of our realm, I am going to stop you. Wizards have twisted the lives of all in Cormir long enough. Ah, that grandest of phrases, for the good of the realm. It can cover everything from outright murder to poisonings, smashing down buildings, setting the country to war, or starting plagues, and has. The wizard's tone was biting. When someone says he's acting for the good of the realm, it labels him either a self-righteous fool or a self-righteous villain. Which are you? Onidar's nostrils tightened, and he strode forward. I trust the lore you were taught was specific on the subject of the last regency, wherein the faithful regent refused to give up power after his time had passed. Oh, yes, the mage replied softly. My tutelage on that was thorough. I remember the tales of the last regency very well. Onidar stepped back a pace, face paling, and in his hiding place behind the hearth surround peepholes, Doneth Marleyear shuddered for the same reason, the ice in the old mage's voice. 28. Dragons, Red and Purple, Year of the Rock, 1286 D.R. King Salember stalked the halls of Castle Oberskir, bellowing for the courtiers, for his guards, for the servants. 
None answered his summons, and no one knelt, awaiting orders, at any corner he turned. His footfalls rang heavily through the stone halls and echoed in the distance. The guards were gone from his doors, the servants from their hiding holes, the fawning courtiers from their appointed places. Where were the scribes, the healers, the pages? Where was his court? They could not all have left him, he thought. Defections had been rife, true, but he'd kept the rest of the rabble in line, and they could still win. He had led the country for nine years and led it well. Cormir stands strong, he bellowed, just as he had done in so many speeches before. The echo came back to him mockingly. Couldn't the people see that things were better now under his regency? Had been better, at least, until the upstart prince started making trouble. Everything had been knocked askew by this upstart prince. Work was undone, crops unharvested, deals unmade. Even the castle itself was filled with projects half accomplished before the servants fled. Tapestries were half hung, shields of treacherous houses pulled from the wall but left lying when they fell. Salember passed the Blue Maiden, a favorite statue, resting beside its plinth, waiting for the workers to lift her up to the pedestal. Salember cursed at the sloppiness of the staff, along with their weak loyalties. Salember paused by one of the great gallery windows overlooking the city. The sun was westering, and most of Suzale lay at his feet, already cloaked in the deep shadows of early evening. There were fires in the city tonight, fires unnecessary for so close to Midsummer Eve. They marked the sites of battles between his faction and that of Rygaird, between the Reds and the Purples, between those who served the rightful ruler and those who followed a pretender to the throne. The flames of burning buildings made him think of red dragons against the shadowed city, but the spiraling smoke reminded him of purple dragons in the dying sun. Out there in the city, and in the countryside beyond the walls, the factions were sparring and battling. In the streets of Arabel and swampy Marsember, in forested Deadlook, and mountainous Highhorn, the country was riven. The purple dragons were torn apart, with units and mages taking opposite sides. The battle brotherhood had been shattered into a hundred individual mages, all of whom had headed for their towers and lairs. Even the churches, the Helmites, the Lathanderites, the Mistrans, were riven by the choice. And all because some folk would fling aside a capable sitting regent for the unproven whelp of the previous king. Nine years ago, Salember's brother, Azun III of the forest country, had died, leaving behind a son too young to rule a nursery chamber, let alone a kingdom. Jorinhast came to Salember then with the offer of a regency, a temporary rule until Crown Prince Rygaird was of age. Salember stepped up to the dragon throne, a position he'd never sought, and he'd served for nine years and served well. People were living better, imports were up, and the depredations of orcs, goblins, brigands, and dragons sharply on the downswing. So, after nine years, it made perfect sense to keep the same steady hand at the helm. But no, the traditionalists, the monarchists, the mired-in-rules old thinkers resisted. Rygaird demanded the crown, then fled into the wilderness to marshal his own forces. He took the banner of the purple dragons with him. Salember flew the red dragon, a color of battle and blood, over the castle. Salember removed his heavy crown and set it on the sill of the gallery window. He'd taken Palagard's crown from a century ago as his own, and the ornate, gem-encrusted helm weighed heavily. He sighed. When the purples were crushed— then perhaps the old crown would be fetched from the vaults. Yes, when the rebel purples were crushed and Rygaird routed from whatever burrow he'd squirreled himself away in. When Rygaird's purples were finally destroyed, everything would fall back into place, and at last affairs in Cormir 
would get back to normal, and he could forge ahead to make the land ever mightier. Cormier stands strong, he muttered, bringing his fist down on the sill slowly and gently. Like a storm giant, he must be careful, he thought, lest his great strength break things around him that he held dear. A distant sound came down the hall, a single short slam or thump booming along the bare walls. The red dragon king turned and shouted, Jorinhast, is that you? The blue maiden looked up at him, calm and unchanging, from the floor beside the plinth he'd ordered her placed upon. How long ago had it been? A ten-day now? A life-sized, sculpted maiden of smooth blue glass, sitting gazing up at the dragon coming to devour her, the sages said. Her hands were too large, and her feet, too, some folks said. But Salember liked her strength, her courage, to sit naked but for a cloak held against her, awaiting doom. That was the sort of spirit more folk in Cormier should show. Besides, the sages said the maiden was linked to the good fortune of House Oberskir, and should never be smashed, disgraced, or lost. He'd have to give that order again, and get her up on the plinth where she belonged, without further delay. If he could only get the damned servants to answer his call. Joran hast? The wizard would still be there. He was tethered to the crown like a mongrel dog, as all the royal magicians, crown wizards, and lords of magic of the past had been. Yes, he, Salember, had found that in Beer Robble's original books. The wizards were magically bound to protect the crown. Others had forgotten that, but not wise old Salember. Whatever else happened, the royal magician would be loyal. But Salember's voice echoed down the halls to no response. Cowards, thought Salember. No fire in the belly, no passion in the heart for a good fight. All the daunting horns and marla ears and wyvern spurs retiring to their country holdings to wait out the storm. True silvers, crown silvers, and hunt silvers. They were cousins to both him and Rygaird, yet they mumbled their loyal oaths and equivocated and minced when pressed for troops and aid. Salember held the high ground, the crown and the throne and the castle, and so the nobles remained loyal at first. Then, slowly, they started to drift away, not to Rygaird, of course, never to Rygaird. They valued their own hides too much. A few traitors had died horribly as examples. Salember had used his gold well, and the fire knives were very effective at creating examples. And yet the cowardly nobles went on drifting away. They swore their fealty and tugged their forelocks, and then hide for the countryside, taking their students, scribes, and servants with them. What kind of kingdom could shine with such weasels, such men of straw, as its backbone? Salember shouted again, an incoherent bellow. There came the clear sound of a door closing and latching somewhere in the distance. A servant, seeking to hide from his sire's wrath, or had Joran Hast finally returned? You'd think, with all the magic at his fingertips, the old mage could find the errant prince with the simplest of divinations. But instead, the old wizard was continually abroad, overseeing this outpost, or tracking down that lead, or reporting on such and such a battle. Salember padded down the hall and slowly made his way down the stone spiral staircase to the main floor. His tired footsteps echoed ahead of him. To the right was the throne room, the hall of the dragon throne. Probably some loyal courtiers and captains were already gathered there, waiting to be reassured by their liege that all was proceeding smoothly, that the rebels were on the run. To the left were the four chambers of the great swords— Salember turned left. The captains and courtiers could wait. The king was sure that Joranhast or one of his predecessors had ensorcelled this part of the castle, making the air heavy and muffling all sound. Even when the castle was bustling and vibrant, it had a tranquil, 
hushed nature to it, like the nave of a great temple to helm or tempus. Visitors once streamed here to see the great swords, but there were no visitors today, nor had there been on any day for weeks past. There were no visible guards either. Here, on velvet plinths, rested the four great blades of Cormir. Ansrevar, the blade of memory, was the first, a large crude sword that harkened back to the days of wilderness and elves. Simelazer, the font of honor, upon which the treacherous nobles had sworn fealty, was as broad as the blade of memory, and etched along its blade with archaic runes. Orblin, King Duar's mage-forged sword, with which he rallied the kingdom during the pirate exile, was a thinner, more modern blade. And Rissar, the wedding blade, small and delicate and finely shaped, was used for marriage vows and blood promises, so much like Cormir today, ornate, gaudy, and ineffective in a real fight. Salember lifted the crystal dome and removed Orblin from its cradle. Somewhere in the far distance a single gong rang, but there came no scurrying of booted and mailed feet, no hue and cry of guards, no panic among the Battle Brotherhood's wizards, and no manifestation of guardian creatures. Orblin was covered with fine runes, lightly etched into the blade. Salember had to hold the blade up to the light to see them clearly. The magical inscriptions seemed to twist and writhe as he watched. After all these years, Orblin had held its edge and its sharpness. Salember slid the unsheathed blade into his belt. Yes, now was the time for true battle. King Salember had the crown, the throne, the castle, and the blades— he had the loyalty of the remaining troops and the support of the people, bought by nine years of peace and prosperity. He cared little for the false friendship of the nobles. Once the purples were crushed utterly, those nobles who survived would come crawling back for his approval and forgiveness. Some he would spare, others he would make examples of. Now to the hall of the dragon throne. Now to rally the troops and impress the remaining nobles. Now to ride to destiny and strike at his foes in their lairs. Even before the rebellion, Salember had remained too long in the castle, overseeing accounts and treaties and forecasts. And for too long after Rygaird declared his revolt, had he stayed within, protected by stout walls and powerful magic. Now was the time for the Red Dragon to be unleashed on the countryside itself, he thought, and he smiled at the prospect. No guards flanked the doors of the throne room, just as no guards had protected the chambers of the great swords. Had they all finally fled, or were they in the city, battling fires and treacherous purples? The doors stood open. The throne room was one of the oldest parts of the castle, the heart of the Oberskir family's lair for over a millennium. To one side stood the great sealed stone tomb of Beorobel himself, its surface worn smooth by the touch of a million hands over the ageless years. To the other side was the low rise of steps that led to the throne itself. Sometimes there were two chairs on its highest step, for king and queen. At the moment there was but one. There were three figures standing just shy of the top level, a woman and two men. As he stepped into the room, Salember wondered if they were real or merely some magical vision. Jorinhast was there, of course. Where else would the royal magician be, save here, protecting the crown? Yet Rygaird, the treacherous pup, was also here, dressed in the white and purple of his rebellious band, and Damia True Silver, most cowardly of the cowardly nobles, Rygaird's confidant. The woman's belly was swollen with child, and Salember remembered Lord True Silver himself begetting her with another whelp ere he died in battle. Had Jorinhast brought the conspirators here for sentencing and punishment? 
he should have teleported them directly to the deepest dungeon instead. The wizard looked haggard and worn, as if he had spent the last three nights sleeping in roadside hedges. His shoulders were slumped with age and care. The battles had taken their toll on him as well. "'You are here at last,' he said. "'We must end this and end it now.' The old wizard stepped down from the dais and positioned himself to one side, between the king and the rebellious prince. The wizard wanted a parley then, for all the good that would do. "'Greetings, uncle,' said Rygaird, his young face struggling to look somber and serious. "'And to you, nephew,' said the king, "'you have come to your father's house to surrender yourselves and end this bloody folly?' "'I have come to my father's house, yes,' said the prince, "'and I seek to end this folly. "'But I am not here to surrender, but to talk,' Joran Hast put in. "'I convinced Rygair to seek peace with you. "'We have come from a bloody battle near Walloon, "'where the red and purple factions beat each other to corpses thick upon the ground, "'to no resolution. "'If we continue this bloodshed, there will soon be no Cormir to rule, Rygaird added. Already the Sembians are making restless noises about protecting trade, and agents of the Black Network and the Thavian wizards cross our borders freely. This must end. Agreed, Salember replied coolly. I am willing to accept your surrender. Your men will be spared. You, of course— We'll have to accept exile in Waterdeep or the Dalelands. The young prince's face reddened, and he sputtered a curse. Behind him, Damia placed a gentle hand on his shoulder, and he collected himself. Surrender my throne, he said at last. Your throne? mocked Salember. Nay, may I remind you who has guided this country through nine years of peace? Who has sacrificed his own life for the good of the nation? Who has spent all his waking hours of time and energy living up to the Oberskir name? The same hours of your youth that were spent hunting, adventuring, and gallivanting about, while I have done the real work? Do you think I'd entrust this great realm to an untried child? Salember's face had turned beet red by now and the king felt the fire of renewed energy rising up within him. No pup of an upstart was going to waltz in and steal the crown from him without a fight, Rygaird said. The Obarskir line has always passed to the oldest suitable direct male candidate. There have been exceptions, and Obarskir queens have ruled when no male has been available. For nine years there has been no child of Azun Third suitable. Now there is. And uh, now you expect to gain a full kingdom, as if it were a present for your seventeenth birthday? snarled Salember. Rygaird's face reddened again, but he held his voice calm. While you were secure here in the castle, with your account books and courtiers and your petty intrigues, I was out in the land itself. You call it gallivanting but I see it as learning about my country. I have hunted in the king's forest and drunk deep with the soldiers of Highhorn. I have dug the good ground with farmers, spoken with smugglers, fought brigands and goblins, learned language from wandering elves, and my accounts from visiting Sembians. A well-spent youth, snapped the king. I know my people and my land. I am ready to take on my father's burden, finished the young prince. I do not want to fight you for it, but fight I have and will. Do not, I entreat you, divide our people more than they already have been. A pretty speech, Salember spat. Did Lady Damia help you? No, young nephew, you have insufficient knowledge of court politics. The courtiers would eat you alive. From the looks of things, it is the courtiers who were eaten alive in this castle, Rygaird drawled, or fled to our camps, or hid themselves until we two could come to agreement, Lady Damia put in. 
We thought, Lord Salember, of recognizing your wisdom with a continued advisory role for you, perhaps a barony or dukedom of the kingdom. I should surrender the crown to a child for a handful of crumbs and a smattering of titles, Salember snarled, the fire coiling like a serpent in his belly. I admit your experience would be invaluable in— Rygaird began. Salember cut him off. In cleaning up after your mistakes, nephew? In supporting you as king? In doing all the work and gaining none of the credit? It does not have to be immediate, uncle, said Rygaird calmly. Three more years of regency, then a smooth changeover. No, Salember shouted. You will get the crown only when I have no earthly need for it. Surrender to me here and now, young prince. If you truly love this country as you profess, prove it. Rygaird's eyes blazed with anger. I do love the forest kingdom, he said, voice rising. And honor my ancestors. Yet, uncle, you must step down. Can't you hear the sounds of men dying, the sounds of the realm ripping itself apart? We cannot survive with two kings, one rightful and one temporary. Agreed, shouted Salember, and turned to Jorinhast. Kill them, wizard. Silence wrapped the four of them like a cloak, the echoes of Salember's orders rebounding from the walls like ripples of water. Jorinhast looked at the king stonily. "'Excuse me?' "'Kill them!' bellowed the king. "'Kill them now. "'This is our best chance to end all of this destructive nonsense now.' "'Prince Rygaird came here on my assurance of personal safety, sire,' the mage said calmly. "'Rygaird moved to stand in front of Lady Damia, "'and his hand drifted to the hilt of his peace-bonded blade. Salember's eyes burned with fury, and his own hand now rested on Orblin. "'I am your king, and I demand your obedience. Kill the pair of them. A snake without its head cannot long survive.' Jorinhast looked at the young noble and pregnant noblewoman on the dais, then back at the king. Salember's face was a mask of rage now, spittle flying as he shouted. Jorinhast looked at his king and said simply, No. Salember's face was as crimson as a red dragon's now, the fire surging through him. I found Bayrobble's records, mage. The elves have forced your kind to serve the crown. You must follow my orders. You must deal with the threat to the crown. Kill them. Jorinhast blinked at the raging king and said quietly, "'Sainted Beorobel was forced to serve the crown, yes. Amadahast, Thenderahast, and I, we served through choice and through loyalty. Loyalty to the crown, but also to the king and the people and the country itself. Let it end here, sire. Even Ilthar, the insufficient, knew when to step aside.' Salember was no longer listening, for the fire pounded in his temples and his ears, and in his heart something snapped loose from its moorings and catapulted him to action. With an incoherent scream, the Red Dragon King pulled the blade of King Duar from his belt and charged the pair on the dais. Jorinhast stepped forward as the king charged and whipped out a massive hand, grabbing Salember's face with widely splayed fingers. The mage barked a few ancient words, and a tomb-like carrion smell swirled through the chamber. He let go of his king. Salember stumbled forward a half-step and fell to the floor, Orblin skittering away on the flagstones in one direction, Palaghard's gaudy crown in the other. The carrion stench returned again, and this time Salember's tattered scream was borne on the whispering wind. Rygaird bolted down the dais stairs and knelt by the king's body. He's dead. I said Jorinhast softly. I had to deal with the threat to the crown. 
The mage held his arms before him, hands interlocked in the opposing sleeves, as if hesitant to show the deadly weapons again. The king is dead, said Damia True Silver. Joran Hast nodded and pulled from his robes the crown, the original elven crown of Cormir, slender with its three amethyst-studded spires. He handed it to Lady Damia. The young prince knelt, and the noblewoman placed the circlet on his brow. "'Long live the king,' said Damia. "'Arise, King Rygaird, the second of Cormir. Would that your coronation had been a celebration, but your kingdom has need of you.' Rygaird stood again, and Jorinhast saw that his eyes were wet. The young king's voice was firm, however. "'You have my thanks, wizard.' "'I had to deal with a threat to the crown,' repeated Jorinhast sadly. "'I am sorry there was no other way. "'He was my friend as well as yours. "'Let him be remembered in his strength, not in his madness,' said Damia, "'as if finishing a litany. "'Yet you have killed a king,' said Rygaird solemnly. "'And for that the sentence is death. "'I hereby commute that sentence to eternal exile.' You will leave, Suzale, wizard, and never return to it again. Jorinhast opened his mouth, then shut it again and nodded. None will trust a kingslayer, regardless of his motives, said Rygaird, and none will believe me to be truly a ruler if I keep Salember's chief plotter as my own. Jorinhast nodded again and said, in tones almost of relief, "'As you wish, sire. "'I follow your orders out of my loyalty to the crown. "'I will gather some things and then be gone.' "'The mage retreated to the door of the great throne room. "'Hold one moment, wizard,' said Rygaird, "'and the mage paused by the doorway. "'Sire, Cormir has always had a wizard, "'but now will not,' said Rygaird carefully. "'In your exile,' "'Find and train the best young mage you can find. "'When I marry and produce an heir, "'I will send word far and wide "'to where you cannot help but hear. "'And I bid you then send your pupil "'to become my son's tutor. "'Cormir can survive without its wizard, "'but not for long. "'In this I command you.' "'Joran Hast bowed deeply. "'As you wish, my liege. "'And thank you. Rygaird added softly, "'Thank you for the crimes you committed in the name of the crown.' Jornhast's eyes were as wet as those of the new king. "'I do my duty out of loyalty and love,' he said roughly, "'and I will teach my pupil to do the same.' And though no one saw him leave, Jornhast was never seen in Suzale again." 29. Treachery. Year of the Gauntlet, 1369 D.R. O Lady of Fortunes and Mysteries, the priestess said reverently, Hear us! Striking the silver gong just inside the door, she threw off her sea-blue cope to reveal vestments of shining silver, took three slow, measured paces forward, and knelt, she touched the silver disc at her throat, the symbol of her goddess. Timora, hear us. Behind her came the soft rustle of the crown princess, removing her own overrobe and slippers. Gwyneth remained on her knees until Tanalasta joined her, murmuring her own, Timora, hear us. Gwyneth reached out as she did every morning to clasp the hand of the heir to the throne. Tanalasta's grasp was firm this time, yet thankful, not the trembling clinging it had been on earlier days. Such a contact was not actually part of established ritual, but the crown princess need not know that. Gwyneth had thought she needed it that first day, when a pale and visibly grieving princess had come to the clergy of the goddess, 
and almost pleaded for the consecration of a temporary shrine so that she might have swift access to divine guidance whenever she felt need of it. High priest Manarek had agreed without hesitation, with an eye to the future favor of the dragon throne, but Gwyneth knew, and had a shrewd suspicion, that Tanalasta did too, that the old patriarch had no intention of any shrine to the goddess being temporary. No matter, the silver discs, symbols of the goddess Timora, were hung along the walls and the site consecrated. The crown princess of the realm got on her knees to Timora every morning and evening, and the clergy of fair fortune were well content, even with the establishment of a companion shrine of Tyre, the lord of justice, barely a room away. However devout Tanalasta really was, she did seem to find comfort in the prayers. She was obviously seeking guidance, and her visits to the little room with the altar did give her some peaceful time alone every day, time without Vangedahast glowering at her, or young Bleth murmuring in her ear. Tanalasta cast a sidelong glance at Gwyneth, and the priestess gave her a quick smile before she broke their hand-clasp and rose to begin the supplication. If the goddess granted it, she might come to know this one as a true friend in times to come. Lady of favor, she began, seeking that whole-hearted nearness to Timora that devotion required. Hear now the— There was a sound in the passage behind them, the quick and frantic sound of booted feet running, lots of them. Whatever could it be? Were these soldiers coming? Gwyneth's heart sank. Had the king died? Her duty was clear. The supplication must be seen through. She raised her arms to the altar, and Tanalasta screamed. Gwyneth spun around in time to see the crown princess fleeing, wild-eyed, past her, trying to get around behind the altar, trying to escape from the five masked men with glittering blades who were flooding into the chamber. Their eyes were on Tanalasta, and they held murder in them nobles, to judge by their rich clothing, and coming fast. They cut down a young priest at the doorway without even slowing, and Gwyneth was unarmed. Lamineth, Timora, Gwyneth snarled, flinging up her arms. The foremost noble slashed viciously at her, and she ducked low, swayed away from his flashing blade, and then launched herself into him shoulder first. As the breath whooshed out of him and his feet left the floor, she got in one good punch, discovering with satisfaction that his codpiece was only soft gilded cloth. The man made a strangling sound as he and the priestess crashed to the floor together. By then her spell had filled the room with whirling discs. Her desperate shout had snatched all of the platter-sized holy symbols of Timora from their hooks on the walls and animated them to her will. She sent them slashing, edge on, against the rushing men. She was rewarded with shouts and startled curses. Princess, she called, rolling away from the man she'd felled. My mace lies beneath the altar. Defend yourself. One of the nobles barked out a contemptuous laugh and leapt past one of the discs, heading toward the priestess. Gwyneth glared at him and brought a disc swooping down sharply from the air overhead. She'd only a few moments more before this magic ended. It was enough for this foe, at least. The disc sliced into his hair and the head beneath, and the man gasped, spat blood, and went to the floor, still wearing a goggle-eyed look of surprise and pain. Another noble was rushing past toward the altar, and all of the discs were falling now. The power of the spell expired. Gwyneth ran to intercept the man. The princess cowered low behind the holy table. A dagger flashed end over end across the room and thunked into the back of the attacking noble's head. He staggered, wobbled, and the priestess was upon him, snatching the man's own dagger from his belt as she moved quickly inside his sword arm. Gwyneth drove the hilt of the stolen dagger hard into its owner's temple and then shoved him against the wall. 
Turning to see what new peril she might face, Gwyneth found herself staring at the bloody point of a blade as it burst through the front of an elegant silk shirt. Behind the dying noble, as he sagged, was a face she'd seen before, a woman with eyes like two merry flames and hair the hue of honey, who gave Gwyneth a merry smile and said, Catch! as she tossed the noble's kosh into the air. Gwyneth gave him Thrara, the harper, a smile in return, plucked the falling weapon out of the air, and spun around to see to the safety of the princess. Tanalasta was dodging around the altar, dragging behind her a mace she obviously found too heavy to use, with a snarling noble in hot pursuit. Even as Gwyneth cried out in alarm and raised her hand to hurl the dagger she still held, someone else— a merchant in battered boots, who was waving the longest knife she'd ever seen, vaulted the altar and crashed solidly into the noble. The knife flashed once as they went down together, and there was a short, wet, gurgling sound from behind the holy table. She wasn't surprised to see that only one man rose again, and that it wasn't the one who wore the mask and fine clothes. The last of the nobles, the one Gwyneth had struck in a sensitive place, had risen behind the priestess, soared up, and read rage for the Timoran in his eyes. Gwyneth did not see him, but Emthrara did. The lady Harper shouted a warning, but nothing was going to be able to stop that blade in time. And then Emthrara saw another figure rise up behind the noble, the altar stool raised in one trembling hand, white to the lips, crown princess Tanalasta of Cormir brought her improvised weapon down with all her strength. The noble's sword went one way, and his head snapped to the other, blood spraying from the force of the blow. The impact left the noble's head no longer round, but it managed to make a rattling noise before plunging heavily to the floor with the noble's dead body. The princess stared down at what she'd done, gasped, and promptly emptied her stomach in revulsion. Her shoulders were still shaking as more armed men, priests of Tyre and purple dragons, all waving ready weapons and glaring around at the carnage, burst into the room. "'What happened?' one of the guards demanded and strode forward with one hand out to roughly grasp and spin about the sobbing woman in front of him. He stopped abruptly when she turned of her own accord, and he recognized her face— white it might be, and blue about the lips, but he could not mistake the face of the heir to the throne. The eyes in that famous face were wet with unshed tears. "'We—I was attacked by these traitors,' the princess said, her breathing suddenly fast, "'and all of these other folk slew them for me.' "'Other folk, high lady?' Tamalasta glanced around. The merchant and the woman with the sword had vanished as suddenly as they had appeared. Only the priestess of Timora stood with her. The grim-looking priestess now stepped forward and said firmly, "'Her Highness prevailed against these men, blade to blade and eye to eye. Let word of this travel throughout the realm, that justice and right have made the crown princess victorious in battle against five experienced fighting men.' who also happened to be foolish nobles. They found the fate that awaits all traitors. The eyes of the guards and priests looked at Gwyneth, and then turned back to the princess. "'What really befell here?' a grizzled purple dragon asked bluntly, rising from the blood-smeared flagstones where he'd been examining the man Emthrara had run through. Tanalasta gave him a wintry glare. "'It was—' "'Just as the Holy Lady has said,' she snapped, and she turned away to kneel before the altar. "'Now, if you gentle sirs will clear away that carrion, my prayers are unfinished.' "'Well said, Your Highness,' Gwyneth whispered as she knelt beside the royal supplicant. Tanalasta surveyed her with a sidelong glance and whispered back fiercely, "'When I rise from here, I'm going to expect some answers.' 
Go nowhere until I give you leave. Gwyneth smiled and bowed her head. Of course, she murmured, and she lifted her voice to sing the first call to the Lady of Fortune. The eyes behind the azure mask almost seemed to glow with interest. And what else did Bleth propose? Donath Marleyear shrugged. It had been a long, cramped day for him, skulking in this hiding place or that in the palace, and the mage seemed serenely unconcerned with the palpable villainy of the royal magician. I've told you all, he said, a trifle sharply. He made it clear he'd not accept an endless regency, and warned Vanjudahast that he'd raise the whole country against the wizard if he tried any such thing. He frowned. But you seem to be missing my point. The Lord High Wizard was agreeing to all this, it seemed, and fighting only over the details of how this council would operate. Both he and Bleth seemed to think of the princess simply as a... a pawn to sit on the throne and do as either a wizard regent or a council of nobles tells her to do. Vanger de Hast is as cold-hearted as all these scheming nobles. He doesn't care about the Oberskiers at all, any of them. He claims he serves the crown, but that seems to mean that he just wants the realm to stay stable while he goes on wielding the power he has now, no matter who is, in name, ruler of Cormir. The woman in azure robes nodded almost absently. Many have said such things, through the reigns of a host of Oberskir monarchs, and the service of more than one of the faithful mages this realm has been blessed with. And yet, time and time again, the wizards have served Cormir with staunch and shrewd deeds when it was required. Vanger de Hast seems quite capable of looking after himself and Cormir for the time being. I'm more interested in what Onadar Bleth said to Tanalasta, at his tone of voice and facial expressions as he uttered those words. Let's go over it again, slowly, and in as much detail as you can recall. Don't invent or embellish just to please me. I know that I'm asking for more than you can remember. Just give me all you can. Donath did, and it took a long time, more than time enough for the young noble to begin to wonder just who this woman who hid herself behind an azure mask was, and what she was really hoping would happen in the days ahead. It was easy to claim that one loved Cormir and was working in loyal service to, or in the best interests of, the realm, but who judged such things, and why wear a mask to do them? That last question stayed with him, and he grew quiet enough that the mysterious lady in the blue mask told him to go to wherever his lodgings were and get some sleep for as long as his body needed. If he were reeling with weariness when something important did happen in the hours or days ahead, he'd hardly be able to do anything useful about it. Donath nodded curtly agreed, with every appearance of weariness, and took his leave. He was careful to stumble along the street in case she was watching. When he turned the corner, the scion of House Marleyear promptly sprang onto a rain-barrel, used it to reach a balcony, and from there took a perilous leap onto a roof by way of a carved gargoyle rain-spout. She might leave by a spell." or another of those mysterious tunnels that these northerly reaches of Suzale seem to be positively riddled with. But he shrugged. She might also simply walk out of the place. If he could only get to its roof, so that he could watch both its front entry and the back way. Donath hurried, and, just in time, fetched up at his destination in panting haste. She went out the back way, of course. He watched which way she was heading, keeping low and immobile until she was out of sight, and then moved. He was going to have to be very careful if he hoped to keep her in view and escape being spotted. Whoever this blue-masked mage was, she was certainly no fool. He'd suspected all along that she was noble-born or connected with nobility or the court itself, and that she'd get to the promenade before long. 
and he was right. Crouched in the lee of a potted pricklethorn bush that was decorating the steps of some grand townhouse or other, Donna saw the lady in blue turn out of the side street he was watching and walk briskly along the promenade toward Eastgate. She wasn't going out of town. No, she'd turn off westward before the gate and head back into the nobles' quarter on the pleasant hedge-lined street that crossed Lake Azun by that beautiful arched bridge. Yes, there she was. Donneth raced along the top of the ornamental wall that separated the holy ground of Denier from the meadows of the rich merchants next door, down to the edge of the lake. He just had time to crouch down behind the last sculpted stone book, spread open forever on its wall-top pedestal, when she stopped on the bridge and looked back and down the lake, scanning the gardens. For him? She looked down at the gentle waters for what seemed like an eternity to Doneth, but was probably only a short time, enjoying the evening stars swimming in Lake Azun. Then she turned and went on down the far slope of the bridge, heading for— Donneth squinted, and finally climbed right up onto the stone book to see properly— Wyvern Spur House. Yes, she was glancing up and down the street, up at the sky, and then she went inside. Donneth clambered hastily down from his perch, and almost fell as a calm voice from just below him said— Yes, a lot of folks seem to find that inscription particularly interesting. He stared down into the kindly eyes of an old, bald priest, who nodded a grave greeting and said, Personally, I think the next one over is more profound, but then the variance of opinions is born of the strife between the gods that gives us all life and striving. What do you think? Donneth Marla Ear looked desperately from book to book, seeing that both of them sported, amid spots of bird droppings, long and carefully carved inscriptions, half seen in the moonlight. He didn't have time for this. I think, he said carefully, looking at the grass of the lawn outside the temple wall and glancing up that long sword, that the future of the realm depends upon my acting now and thinking later. And with that grand declaration, he hurled himself backward off the wall, hopefully out of reach of any spell that the priest might use against uninvited night intruders. He landed running. He heard only a single faint, dry chuckle behind him as he hurried along from dock to garden seat, to fence, to the next dock, and so on, until he finally reached the rising stone wall, topped with large stone spheres that joined the bridge parapet. He was gasping by then, but for Donneth Marla ear there could be no rest until he uncovered one more secret allegiance, just one more. His feet took him to the crest of the bridge in a rush, and then he slowed, noting that Wyvernspur House seemed to have no guards, and to be darkest on the lakeside. The imposing edifice of the Cormerals across the street, however, seemed to bristle with watchful guards, several of whom were already staring his way. He gave them a casual wave of greeting, as if they were old friends he'd expected to see, and turned along the shore beside Wyvernspur House, as if he were strolling along a way he knew well. As he'd hoped, a footpath wound along the water's edge. He slipped past a prowling cat, ignoring the brief snarl of greeting it made, and vaulted the low wall that marked the Wyvernspur boundaries hoping he'd triggered no alarm spells or deadlier guardian magics. He crouched tensely on a cobbled garden path, amid gardens where water chuckled endlessly over stones somewhere nearby, moving only a few quick steps to be away from the place where he'd first intruded. But nothing happened. No guards or seeking spells came his way. After a long time he relaxed. He was being overly fearful again. It seemed even nobles couldn't afford to cover every inch of their holdings with defensive magic. Right, then. Donneth Marleyear took hold of his scabbarded sword to keep it from knocking against anything and glided forward. 
A window sat invitingly open, framed by garden flowers, and occupied by an orange tabby on the sill. He eyed the dark room inside, narrowly, looking for guardians. Surely it wasn't going to be this easy. But it was. The cat on the sill stretched, yawned, thought for a moment, and then bounded away into the night gloom of the garden, leaving the sill unoccupied. Donneth was up and over it in an instant, crouching on bare flagstones in the dimness beyond. This was some sort of plant room, leading into a servant's stair. Dark, narrow, and offering a high window with a ledge. There seemed to be no cat in residence up there just now. Donneth found the servant's footholds on the wall, spaced so that someone shorter, older and grumpier than he, could reach the window occasionally to wash it and use them. He hadn't even settled down to think of his next move before he heard the voices. A man and a woman in the next room, talking with easy familiarity. He knew the female voice, Lady Blue Mask. Donneth became an intently listening statue. Cat, the nobles can't all be base, black-hearted villains. I'm a noble. You're a noble, too. Lady Blue Mask, what had he called her? Cat, sighed. Gilgi, my own, it doesn't take all of the nobles to hack our country down into war. Almost all of them, with any influence or more money than fear, are up to something right now. Who knows how many quiet little deals are being hatched over wine around this city right this minute? None that I know of, came the reply. Gyogi, Gyogi Wyvernspur, of course, the adventurer, one of the country squire nobles. His voice continued, and there may be none at all. Say you're right, Cat replied, and there are none at all. That still leaves the two factions we do know of, without any chance of mistaking what they're up to. Agreed? Giyogi sighed, and Donneth heard liquid splashing into a glass. Agreed, he said. Anything new with those? Well, Cat said, as glasses clinked together, the only news out of the palace today is that five nobles grew so impatient that they tried to murder the crown princess this morning, cutting her down at prayer. Donneth stiffened, and almost cried out in astonishment before Cat's next words dumbfounded him. She slaughtered them all. Tanalasta! Giyogi's voice was a cry of disbelief. Donneth echoed it silently. A harper and a friend of hers, plus the priestess at the altar, did the killing, I believe. Gwenath spoke to me after all the purple dragons had finished huffing and snorting and looking grim all over the place. So, which nobles? Young blades, all of them. Ensrin Emarask, a daunting horn, a creth, an Ilance, and red Belorgan. Him. Ha! Huh. Any chance to kill anything he'd be in on it, Giyogi said disgustedly. They were all carrying huge rubies, Cat added. No, not the secret society of men who carry huge rubies, her mate protested with mock incredulity. Say it isn't so. Don't, said Cat affectionately. Rubies or no? They're dead. That leaves us with all the usual villains. Onadar Bleth and Gaspar Cormayrol and their nobles' council. An idea silently supported by at least some members in all the oldest, largest houses, and feared by the minor nobles, who know they'll be left out of all decisions. And profits. Exactly. Everyone from the Hunt Crowns to the Yellanders wants the council. Even the Ilances have set aside their old feud with the Cormayrals to be in on this, and upstart houses such as the Flint Feathers are pushing the council as their way of gaining respect among the heavy houses. They all, even the three so-called royal houses, see it as a way out from under the tyranny of the Oberskiers. 
"'Into the tyranny of their rivals and neighbors," said Giyogi. "'A tyranny that will undoubtedly soon spill over into open violence "'when various stiff-necked families seek to get even with each other "'over you-voted-against-me grudges.' Five months?' Cat asked, considering. "'Nearer three. Giyogi nursed a thumb under his chin. And that's assuming that the big houses, who stand to lose everything they've gained if the country is plunged into war, try to keep tight reins on things. If just two of the large old houses get annoyed at the same time, and don't work hard at keeping the peace, we could have massacres, and then raids, and then full-scale battles in a month. That's right. Lift my spirits. Even the young lion I recruited to help me get to the vaults seems to be going sour, Cat said bitterly. In the darkness, Donna's lips twisted wryly. Tell me who stands on the side of the wise old regent. Well, they're the wyvern spurs, said Giyogi brightly. And? Well, they're the wyvern spurs. Giyogi added, in mimicry of his own breathless tones. "'Go on,' Kat said, a clear warning to become more serious in her tone. "'Uh, most of the nobility with country estates and holdings, the daunting horns, the scatter hawks, the immer dusks, the indimbers, the rowan mantles, house in desim, and the rally horns, but not the roaring horns, who want king or council and no ruling queen.' Could that have anything to do with the fact that the Roaring Horns detest both the Bleth family and the wizard Vangerdehast? Cat asked with a smile. Never, Giyogi said, with mocking shock in his voice. No noble house of this realm would ever sink to such a short-sighted, personally vindictive level, not when they can proclaim such actions as part of a grander, higher-minded policy of supporting only what is best for fair Cormier. Speaking of what is best for fair Cormier, Cat asked, how is our guest in the basement? Giyogi shuddered. The guest in the basement, he declaimed grandly, is fine. I, however, am frazzled, distinctly frazzled. See? He shuddered dramatically, then sighed and said in tired, serious tones, "'Restless and ill-behaved children are less problem. Our guest does only three things, and all of them all too well. Demand, argue, and worry.' He sighed again. "'I'm going to be very glad when all this is over.' Cat wrinkled her nose. "'I've hated all this deception and spying on perfidious nobles from the very beginning.' she said firmly. Giyogi sighed. I feel the same way, but you must remember that we're proceeding exactly as Vangertahast planned, and he's been at all of this a lot longer than we have. And quite successfully, too, Kat said, dealing smoothly with the mundane work of statecraft as the royal magician for years, while crafting spells and making alliances behind the scenes, all in the name of service to the crown. He's smooth, Giyogi admitted, filling his glass again. I'll give him that. Smooth as a greased basilisk, or something similarly smooth. In his dark window, Donneth nodded grimly. Good old Vangertahast was the true villain, then. The shadow behind all of the troubles now besetting Cormier. Of course, if his magic had laid the three royal hunters low— that same magic could keep the puzzled priests and baffled sages from curing his victims. There was a sudden flash of light from outside. Donneth looked out the little window to see what had caused it, and smiled, slowly and grimly. The gods did have senses of humor and justice after all. Here was the fat old spell-hurler himself, come calling on his conspirators with a big smile all over his face— this would save much chasing about and creeping through wizardly defenses, the young Marley-ear noble thought, reaching for his blade. Vangerdehast had appeared out of the now-fading glow by magic, 
transporting himself from the palace, and was humming pleasantly as he swung wide the door of Wyvernspur House and strode in. Moving hastily, Donna's shadowy form dropped down from a balcony and silently slipped in through the slowly closing door, blade glittering in hand. It had been a frantic few minutes of running and clambering and lurking to get here, while the stout wizard strolled leisurely among the garden plantings, seeming highly satisfied with Cormier in general, and himself in particular. Yet he'd made it, and the fat fool hadn't even noticed the noise or the shadow, the shadow that had skulked long enough— Donneth raised his glittering blade and took two cat-like, velvety-soft steps forward. He did not hold with putting steel into men from behind. But with wizards, all principles were laid aside. The death of Vangerdehast would end a threat to Cormier as grave as anything the legendary Bayerobble had ever dealt with. If a mage had to die by a surprise thrust from behind, then so be it. "'Die, wizard,' he murmured inwardly, not quite daring to say it aloud, and his blade flashed down. "'Let it be swift, let it be now, and let it be for Cormir.'" 30. Adventurers. Year of the Grimoire, 1324 D.R. The royal magician thundered on the inn door with his fists, the thick frame nearly rattling loose from its hinges. Balin, he bellowed, "'we have to get on the road!' On the other side of the door there were sounds of giggling and hushed urgent whispers. Vangita Hast shouted, "'Get out of there now, or I swear I'll teleport you to your father, along with any guests you may be currently entertaining.' The whispers were replaced by the sounds of hasty movements. Vangerdehast counted to ten. Then he counted to ten a second time. He was up to eight on his third counting when the door cracked open, and Crown Prince Azun, son of Rygaird, and the fourth Oberskir to bear that name, squeezed out. He opened the door only sufficiently to allow his growing frame to pass, and held the door shut behind him with one hand, tucking his shirt into his breeches with the other. "'Do you have to shout, wizard?' asked the prince in groggy exasperation. "'It's the only proven way to get words through your ever-thickening skull,' the mage replied. "'Unless, of course, you'd rather I took to suddenly manifesting in your sleeping quarters with attendant flashes of fire and smoke.' Prince Azun, traveling through his own country as Balin the Cavalier, muttered something definitely unroyal, and then said, "'Give me ten minutes to gather my gear. Make it five minutes. That way you won't get distracted again by the young lady.' Azun grumbled an assent, and six minutes later he was out in front of the inn, yawning loudly. His pack was on his back, his short sword sheathed on his belt, and a shapeless, wide-brimmed hat covered his head and most of his features. At nineteen winters old, the young noble was already broad-shouldered and handsome. Soon he'd have to make use of magical disguises to avoid being recognized at once. The larger and more portly Vanger de Hast was similarly attired and equipped, save that he had a short walking staff instead of a sword. Azun had no doubt that the leather-shod walking stick held more magic than any gnarled staff wielded by a more powerful mage. "'Where to today, O oh learned elder?' asked the prince. "'Evening star.' said the mage. It's about two days' jaunt from here. I thought we'd walk half today, and rough it overnight, and make the town by dusk tomorrow. We could make in a single day if we rode, the prince observed, not for the first time. Aye, said the wizard, and we could travel in comfort if we took a carriage, and we could make it in an instant with a spell. But with a spell, we'd miss the countryside, and with a coach, we'd not meet anyone else in our travels, and with horses, we'd not have time to talk, he added meaningfully, and for me to help you review your lessons, the young prince grimaced. 
One day, you know, I'll have my own band of heroes and adventurers, mighty warriors all, and we will ride horses. So you will, said Vanger to Hast with a smile, and you'll be able to tell your brave companions about every bend in the road and every inn in Cormier, because you saw them all on foot as a boy. Boy, spat Azum, my father was king at my age. And with Timora's grace, you'll be spared the pain that he had to go through, wizardless and alone, retorted the wizard. So tell me, O oh learned young one, what other kings of Cormir took the throne at such a young age? Azun grumbled and rummaged through his memory as the two set out, leaving the old owl bear inn behind them. The wizard chose a path along the banks of the star water, as opposed to doubling back to the main road itself. It was little more than a footpath that followed the course of the river, meandering along beside it beneath the shade of early summer leaves. Azun recited the names of the nineteen young kings and seven warrior queens, starting with Gantharla, and of the four recognized illegitimate kings. He listed the current noble houses with ease, though he needed prompting to recall all the names of the dead houses that had ended through lack of heirs or loyalty. He recalled perfectly the lyrics of the song, The Cormites Boast, including the lewd ones which he had learned the night before from a bard at the old owl bear. Of course, eventually the conversation would come back to sore feet, tender calf muscles, and the pain of traveling overland on foot and incognito. "'I still don't see why we can't tell anybody who we are,' Azun complained, shaking his left boot while on a rest break. A single small pebble that had pained his footsteps for the past quarter of a mile dropped out. Two reasons. The first is safety. I shouldn't have to remind you that we're far from war wizards and purple dragon guards and the relative safety of home. I can aid and protect, but I cannot be all wise or all vigilant. So our best protection is secrecy. Enemies of the crown think the Oberskiers cling to their castles and high society. We should do nothing to dissuade them from that view. The young prince waved away the explanation. That one he understood. The elder mage was certainly being a mother hen about the dangers abroad in the kingdom, but at least Vangetahast now let him journey forth from the castle for these little forays. Secondly, when you wear a crown, the rest of the world is transformed. People tend to tell you what they wish you to hear, as opposed to what you need to know. Truths are shaded, identities are hidden, and facts are concealed. Would any troubadour dare teach his king the racy lyrics of the Cormite's boast? This was the argument Azun was prepared for. So what you're saying, he said sharply, is that the king has to seem something other than he is in order to get to the truth? That he has to deceive his own people? I am saying that no one is what he seems, said the portly mage, and the king should recognize that fact and plan accordingly. That young waitress at the inn, for example. Azun blinked. What of her? I noticed she was rather cold and aloof to you last night. Obviously the situation had changed by this morning. I trust you did not, by any chance, happen to let slip that you were more than Balin the Cavalier last night, after I retired? Azun reddened slightly, and shrugged his shoulders. Perhaps I did. I can't remember. He straightened his shoulders and added, We were drinking parsnip wine as if that explained everything. Ah, but that's exactly the point. We are traveling Cormir on foot, not for my health nor for yours, but to understand both the land and the people, and even the most good-hearted may not be what they seem, and even the coldest may warm to the glow of the royal crown. They traveled for another two hours in the bright forest of morning, breaking once for another boots-off rest and once for an early dry lunch. Vangita Hast lectured on the history of Evening Star and the monster-haunted halls that reached through the gorge north of the village. 
This region had been his own playground back when he was a boy. It was here, he would point out, that he'd first decided to become a wizard, and there, he would note, that he was later taken on by Joran Hast, the last royal magician of the court. "'I haven't heard much about Joran Hast,' said Azun, "'save that he backed the wrong side during the reign of Salember, the rebel prince.' "'That and more,' said Vanger de Hast. "'Actually, he killed Salember when the rebel prince threatened to kill your father and your grandmother, True Silver. "'Then your father thanked the mage and banished Joran Hast from the court. "'Cormir was without an official mage until your elder sister was born.' and I was sent for to act as her tutor, and yours as well. However, King Rygaird has withheld the official title of royal magician from me, as is his right. Yet, if your teacher saved my father, began the prince, Joran Hast killed a king, said Vanger de Hast. A bad king, but a king nonetheless. I think your father was worried it might become a habit, and there are lessons here. "'Such as?' Vanger de Hast sighed. "'Returning to Suzale twenty years after Joran Hast left, "'I saw that the kingdom had survived being officially wizardless quite nicely. Thirteen centuries of careful and not-so-careful building "'had left a good foundation that two passing decades could not demolish. "'But small things had cropped up. "'The weakness of the battle wizards, the growth in power of the thieves' guilds, "'the erratic politics of Arabelle, and the shady dealings of Marsember, "'all things in themselves, but with great future consequences if they were ignored. "'Your father chose not to ignore them and sent for Joran Hast's pupil. "'In this your father showed great wisdom. "'A lesser king might see Cormir's prosperity and decide it did not need an official wizard after all.' "'What happened to Joran Hast?' asked Azun. "'I think Joran Hast was right, you know,' said Vanger de Hast, ignoring the question Azun had asked. "'He had to make a choice between a mad current king and a young, untried, would-be ruler. "'He made the choice, and in so doing, he knew he would be banished for his actions. "'Yet he spared your father any need to slay Salember, even with the excuse that he was defending himself.' Joran Hast was willing to make an unthinkable choice if it was what was good for the realm. That's an important lesson for both of us. Azun was about to press the question of Joran Hast's eventual fate again when he heard shouts from up ahead. Two people were running toward them, shouting and waving their hands. An older man and woman, just past their middle years, wearing dressing gowns and sandals. Not the sort of garb one chooses for a hike in the woods, thought Azun. Ghosts, cried the man. Our house has been possessed. They've taken over, the woman gasped, and driven us from our home. You appear to be adventurers, licensed by the crown. You must help us, said the man. Let us be calm, replied the wizard soothingly. I am Borel the Proficient, and this is my young companion, Balin the Cavalier. You say you have ghosts? We are but humble farmers, said the man. We've been living on an abandoned estate a mile up the trail, rebuilding the house and clearing the old fields. That's when the old nobles came back, the woman added, tears forming in her eyes. "'screaming and moaning, and drove us from the house.' "'Which nobles?' asked the disguised prince. "'The old man blinked. "'I don't know. There was no indication, "'and there are so many noble houses in Cormir. "'But it was a right fine building. "'It must have belonged to aristocrats. "'And the fact the ghosts have returned proved that.' the woman added almost triumphantly. Only nobles care so much for their property they come back from the dead to protect it. What do these noble ghosts look like? Vanger de Hast asked quietly. The couple stammered as one, and then the old man's voice trailed alone out of the confusion, admitting, We've not exactly seen them. No? Oh, 
But they put up a horrible racket, the woman exclaimed, leaping in, down in the basement and up in the attic, making dreadful moans and cries for vengeance. For three days and three nights we've huddled in our beds, but we could find nothing amiss in the light of day. We found one of the chickens dead this morning, brutally slain. We had to flee for our lives. Sounds like something worth investigating, said Azun. Vangerta Hast shrugged. There are hauntings aplenty in this forest country. All too much history assures us of that. But still, our duty to the crown, that document we signed when the king allowed us to pass through his lands, Azun began, smiling. The wizard waved him to silence. Well, if it's on the way, and they're not going to move Evening Star in the meantime. The young prince added helpfully. Vangerda Hast gave him a look, and Azun fell silent. But he did not stop grinning. The manor house was only about a quarter of a mile off the Starwater Trail. The man gave them directions, but the couple would not leave the main path, declaring they'd go nowhere near the house until the two adventurers had cleared it of all risen spirits. The house itself was fashioned in a style some called Cormier Sprawl. The main house was a four-square, sturdy block of field stones on the ground floor, and brick for the floor above, thickly covered with ivy along its southern face. On three sides, additional wings had been built of stone or lumber or unfinished wood. The result looked like three houses had collided in the depths of some dark night, and no one had bothered to disentangle them since. Over the door was a faded and battered heraldic device. "'Gold weathers?' said Azun. "'Gold feathers,' corrected the mage. "'A minor house from a few hundred years back. They fomented an unsuccessful rebellion in Arabel years ago, and were stripped of their rank and lands. Those commoners have clear title to this land just by occupying and clearing it.' The immediate surroundings had been cleared, but the fields beyond were still overrun with brambles and young trees. There was a coop, but no chickens or other animals on the property. Azun thought that strange, and mentioned it to venture to Hast. Aye, said the wizard. Perhaps our ghosts have an interest in live chickens and goats. I wondered the same thing myself, said a voice from above them. The speaker swung down from the branch that had been her perch. She was almost as tall as a zoon, but slender and as lithe as a panther. She wore leather trousers that hugged her muscular thighs and calves, and a loose cotton blouse with a heavy leather vest that did nothing to conceal her charms. Her auburn hair was braided in a whip-like tail down her back. Her eyes were bright and green, and she carried a thin, double-bladed sword. Vangerda Hast started to move forward, putting himself between the newcomer and the young prince, but Azun stopped him with a hand. The wizard looked at his liege and saw that look on his face. Eyes determined and serious, mouth in a wide smile. It was an obscure look, and Azun got it when faced with a new challenge, or a new woman. The woman held her weapon at her side and said, I am Kamara Brightsteel, errant adventurer and solver of mysteries. And you? Her voice was husky, and she rolled her R's slightly. The accent made her all the more attractive. Balin. A wandering cavalier, Azun replied, and his manservant and instructor, Borl. The young prince ignored the fat mage's harrumped protest and went on. We met the inhabitants of this homestead on the road, and they said there were ghosts here. I think I also saw their ghosts, the young woman said. I saw them leaving in haste. Vangita Hast raised an eyebrow, and she continued. There were a couple of men, or at least man-like forms, moving around the sides of the house. I think they were gathering up the chickens and goats, but I didn't get all that good a view from my hiding place. Three or four, I'd say. They didn't look like anything special. So you think, prompted the wizard, 
I think a pack of brigands came upon the house and chased the couple out with spooky noises and rattled chains. They can't have much spine, or they'd simply have killed the two. I think they're nothing more than chicken thieves, with perhaps a little more imagination than usual. Then let's clean out that nest of chicken thieves, said the wizard. Let us do it, Azun said, still wearing that look. I mean, Kamara and I. It'll be good practice for me. Why don't you go back to the trail and fetch the old couple? By the time you return, we should have taken care of this little problem. Azun expected Vanger to has to argue, but instead the wizard stared off into the forest for a time, his mouth a firm, straight line. At length he said, Very well. I bow to your adventurous spirit. Be careful now. And with that, the wizard padded back down the path, leaving the pair alone before the house. Kamara watched Vanger de Haas's retreating back dwindle into the distance. Funny old man, she said. Mage? Scholar, replied Azun, sticking to the story they'd crafted at the outset of their trip. There was no need to brag of Vanger de Haas's abilities in any event. I am the warrior of the pair. And a brave young warrior at that, Kamara said gently. Her eyes sparkled as she spoke. A silence fell between them for a moment. The man and the woman stood facing each other. Azun stared into the young woman's eyes. They seemed like jade coins from some distant and forgotten empire. Somewhere in the distance, a hawk cried out. Azun broke the locked gazes first. We should take care of our ghosts. The woman managed a small smile. Indeed, it would not do for your scholar to return here, to find us mooning about with brigands in the house. Side by side, the pair ascended the porch steps of the old manor house. The front door was unlocked, and a zoon went in first. The interior was fairly typical of a country house— a slender hall ran from front to back, dividing the ground floor in two. All the doors along the hallway were closed. On the right would be the dining room, and behind that a kitchen overlooking cooking pits behind the house. On the left would be a sitting room, parlor, or library. The bedchambers would be upstairs, reached by a narrow wooden flight of stairs. Azun tried to imagine brigands getting the goat up the stairs. He shook his head. They must be hiding the livestock somewhere else. The building was too quiet. Even if the livestock had been shoved in the basement, they would make some noise. There would be the soft sounds of their calls, or at least the slight shifting of floorboards as they moved about. Kamara hung close behind him as he entered, and he could feel her soft, warm breath on the back of his neck. Had the brigands taken the chickens and left? Mentally, he figured the time it would take Vanger de Haas to return to the main trail and bring the old couple back. More than enough time to get comfortable with a fellow seeker of adventure, and perhaps enough time to let slip one's true identity and reap the benefits of that admission. Kamara shut the front door behind her as Azun opened the door on the right. As he thought, it was the dining room with another door beyond leading to the kitchen. The furnishings were sparse but of high quality, probably the salvageable remains of the original gold feathers stock. A great table dominated the room, and the walls were covered with cabinets, all open, their contents spilled on the floor. In the center of the table, a box of silver flatware, another legacy of the gold feathers, was rudely overturned, the knives and forks carving fresh scratches in the deep polish. The thieves came after chickens, but did not stop for the more valuable silver, thought Azun. Perhaps they were still in the building. He held his breath and looked at Kamara. She hung back from the dining room and was scanning along the hallway. Her muscles were tense, as if she expected an attack at any moment. Azun brushed past her and tried the door opposite, which should lead to a parlor or sitting room. The door was stuck, and the young prince had to shoulder it open. Something heavy and wet slid along the floor, pushed out of the way of the door, 
leaving a crimson streak on the floor behind it. It was a goat, a dead goat in the sitting room, propped against the door. Azun had found the missing livestock. The sitting room had been turned into an abattoir, its old furnishings covered with blood, fur, and feathers. There were a trio of old goats, including the billy goat, that partially blocked the door. Their throats had been torn out by crude daggers or teeth. The chickens, great black hens with crimson bellies, had their necks snapped and were strewn about the room. Some had been half-eaten, but most had been slain and discarded in an orgy of slaughter. Feathers blotted the sticky pools of blood. Azun began to say something to Kamara, something about these invaders being more than mere brigands or even ghosts, when he heard her growl behind him. He turned and realized what the supposed ghost had truly been. Brigands had never been inside the house. Someone else— some thing else had created the bloody carnage in the sitting room. Kamara growled as her shoulders slumped and narrowed, her jaw elongating into a fang-toothed muzzle. Her eyes went from jade coins to cat's eyes, as bright and sharp as the claws erupting from her fur-covered hands. Her flesh grew orange fur, striped with black. Kamara was a weird tiger. She dropped her sword and leapt, snarling at the young prince, paws outstretched, slavering maw open. Azun shouted and ducked beneath the leap, desperately bringing his blade up as he did so. The steel raked deeply down her chest and belly, jarring his arm. Then she was over him, carried into the blood-stained room by the force of her leap. Azun wheeled and saw the tiger woman kneeling among the slain goats and chickens. She held her split belly together with one paw, and the young prince could see the slashed sides of the wound he'd made, crawling, meeting, and flowing together, healed. Lycanthropes could be only affected by silver or magic, and Azun had sent his magical support away. Kamara crouched again, and Azun's free hand lashed out, grabbing the doorknob and pulling the door shut in the weird tiger's face. A moment later, the boards above its central cross-brace splintered under the force of her charge, and with a horrible tearing sound, the boards gave way. Cruel black claws batted the air inches in front of his face. Azun staggered back. His sword was useless, and he could never hope to outrun the transformed lycanthrope. By the time Vangitahast returned, the heir to the dragon throne would be in the same state as the chickens in the sitting room. Kamara was ripping apart the door and would be through in a matter of seconds. Then Azun remembered what he had seen earlier, and he fled from the hall. When Kamara tore apart the last of the door and sent its remnants spinning from their hinges— she found the young royal's sword lying abandoned in the hallway. The front door remained shut. Her prey was still somewhere in the house. There was a noise, the shifting of weight on floorboards directly ahead. The dining room. Kamara sprang across the narrow hall and into the doorway directly across from her, and caught a thrown steak knife in the ribs. The cut was shallow, but it burned like acid. Silver! The quivering blade was silver, a legacy of the gold feathers. She hissed, spat, and jarred the blade loose. Two more daggers, crudely thrown but accurate, caught her in the arm. Kamara the weir tiger howled in pain and threw herself at her assailant. Azun stood at the far end of the table, the spilled silverware arrayed before him. He managed to dig one more thrown knife into her thigh as she vaulted the table. She came within striking distance, and he lashed out with his hand, catching her full in the side of the face with a silver teapot. Kamara sprawled to one side, wide of her mark. Already a hideous swelling had erupted from where the pot had struck. The knife wounds were not knitting. Blood seeped through her shredded blouse and leggings. Azun readied the teapot for another attack. It would not be a battle he'd brag about, but it would be one he would win. The weird tiger seemed to recognize that as well. 
She leapt up, and Azun raised the pot in one hand and a knife in the other. Kamara snarled. But instead of pouncing on the waiting prince, she leapt for the window, smashing through it to land heavily on the porch beyond. Azun charged forward, but by the time he reached the empty frame, she was gone. The young prince saw a flash of something orange disappearing into the trees. He sighed, retrieved his sword, and checked the rest of the house. There were no robbers, ghosts, or weir tigers left in the building. By the time Vangerdehast returned with the old couple, the young prince was sitting on the front porch, head between his hands. The old couple shouted in alarm when they saw the smashed window, demanding to know what had happened. Azun sighed and explained. "'Your ghost was a weir tiger who wanted your livestock. So she drove you off, then killed your chickens and goats. There were no real ghosts here, only a hungry predator. I drove it off. It won't likely be back, but you should get some silver weapons just to be sure. Be careful going into the front room.' It's a bit of a mess. So warned, the couple hurried into the house. The woman shrieked and then sobbed, and the man made comforting noises. I can't leave you alone for a moment, can I? Vangita Hast asked softly. How was I to know? The young prince protested. You weren't to know, the wizard said severely. But you should always be cautious. The pair remained at the old gold feather manor for the remainder of the day. Azun removed the rest of the shattered parlor door and used the boards from it and some additional lumber to patch up the front window. When they reached Evening Star, he'd sent a carpenter for the door and a glass glazer for the window, compliments of the crown, to make full repairs. Vangerdehast helped the old woman clean away the carnage in the parlor room and dress the chickens and goats. One of the goats made an excellent dinner at the close of the day, and the old woman proved to be an excellent cook. The weird tiger did not return. They talked late into the evening, the old man telling tales of when he was a lad, when the kingdom was torn apart in the war of red and purple. When he started to nod off, the old woman told her guests where beds had been made ready for them shook her husband awake, and the couple retreated to their own room. Vangerdehast and Azun sat by the last dying flames of the hearth fire. Neither moved to put more wood on the waning blaze. "'You're right, you know,' said Azun at last. "'Right about what?' said the wizard, his eyes red and tired beneath half-closed lids. "'No one is who he seems.' said the young prince, stretching. And, while I should not be paranoid about it, I should be aware, and therefore wary. A lesson learned, said the wizard. The day is not a total loss. Azun rose from the hearthside and went to the door, waving his arm to loosen a bruised and tired shoulder. You know, he said thoughtfully, it's amazing that our morning discussion had such an immediate reinforcement. If I didn't know better, I'd swear you planned all this just to drive home a lesson. The young king-to-be shook his head, half-smiled, and was gone, leaving the stout wizard sitting beside the last cooling coals in the hearth, alone with his thoughts. Then there's hope for you yet, boy, Vangerdehast said softly to the embers as he rose stiffly to seek his own bed. There's hope for you yet. 31. Loyalties, Year of the Gauntlet, 1369, D.R. Our shy crown princess certainly showed some fire, Rolligan remarked, raising his glass to his companion in the snout room. I guess we'll just have to get a stool into her hand more often. "'As she governs Cormier, you mean?' Emthrara responded with a smile, clinking her glass gently against his. Rolligan nodded. "'I'm getting just a trifle too old for such frantic scramblings as this morning's little fray.' 
You're getting just a trifle too fat, you mean, Mthrara replied, shaking her head to tell an approaching patron that she wasn't interested in dancing just now. The man held up three golden lions, hopefully, but she continued to shake her head. He raised his eyebrows and pressed on through the crowded, roving dragon, in search of a lady who'd say yes. Rolligan watched. The patron's trip was not a long one. "'At least the threat to the throne is ended,' he said, licking his lips and gazing into his glass appreciatively. "'This threat to the throne is ended,' the harper corrected him. "'There'll be others, knowing our valiant nobles.' In a place much darker and quieter than the roving dragon, where two hallways met in a little-used back corner of the sprawling royal court, a young, cleft-chinned nobleman stood talking to nothing, keeping his voice low. "'I'll ask you the same thing I asked Vangedahast and Gaspar Cormeril, Imeril Emerask, cousin to the now-deceased Ensrin, said calmly. "'What's in it for me?' "'Loyalty to Cormir?' the woman's voice came back to him. A bright future for the realm? Imeril shrugged. Grand goals bandied about all too much by folks seeking justification for small and dirty things they want done right now. Offer me something I can have and hold for my loyalty. A typical noble son of Cormir, said the voice that came out of the small, whirling cluster of winking lights. Imeril shrugged again. I prefer to see myself as slightly more honest than most. I don't bother to hide the same feelings that drive most of my fellows. We see others enjoying wealth and power in return for things done, or silences kept, for the crown. Why should we not have the same things? Why, indeed, if I fill your hand with rubies right now, "'Will you serve me?' Imeril hesitated. "'I need to know just a bit more about you first. "'Am I hitching myself to a lich, writing age-old wrongs, "'or a dragon seeking an even more ancient revenge on the realm, "'or a red wizard seeking to gather an entire kingdom of slaves, "'or some other arch-mage out to smash a realm for mere entertainment?' "'This is something it would be better if you did not know,' the voice told him. "'But let us share a few secrets. "'Tell me who stands with Vendrida Hast, and I'll tell you what, not who, I am.' "'Fair enough,' Imrel said, glancing around. "'The daunting horns, most of them, the rowan mantles, the rally horns, the scatter hawks, the immer dusks, the winter suns, the wyvern spurs, the indimbers, and house in desm. Hmm, the voice commented. That certainly seems like a muster of all the far flung and obscure household names among the nobility. Imeril shrugged. Many are country squires and come to the court once a year at most. Most of the city nobles, the true nobles of Cormir, stand against Vangedahast. As a group, they are greedy or stupid enough to think that they can trust each other and rule the realm better than an Oberskir backed by all the war wizards. The recent and sudden demise of Andrin Dracohorn should be proof enough to even the most stone-headed that they cannot— but a lot of us believe what we want to believe, and not what the world shows us to be the truth. He raised his voice a trifle and said, And I believe it's my turn to be shown some truth now. What are you? A human woman, skilled in magic. So much is obvious. I expected something more than what has already been established. Fair enough, the voice from the light said. Know, then, that I once shared King Azun's bed, and— Had a son by him, Imeril said calmly, which is why you want all the Oberskirs slain. 
Lady, so much is also already apparent. I trust you know that approximately half the Cormirian noble sons of my age are reputed to have been fathered by our purple dragon. There was a little silence, and the voice was distinctly colder when it came back to him. I have heard something of the sort. How many nobles will have to die, then? Lady, Imeril said gravely, you can't have enough rubies to manage all those killings. Besides, I myself am said to be as— The bolt of roaring white death that snapped from the winking lights then left— only drifting white ashes, and a sharp burnt smell at the place where the two hallways met. An instant later, the little group of whirling lights flickered, faded, and was gone. When the purple dragon's sword captain, Larith Guller, came striding along a minute later, his sword half-drawn and peering about for whatever might have caused the roaring sound, all that remained was the reek of fiery death. He stopped, sniffed, frowned, and shook his head. More magic. Someone, or two dueling combatants, perhaps, had died here. He'd never thought the court in Suzale would become a more dangerous place than the battlefields of the Twegan Horde. But it had. Perhaps it was time to retire and settle down in one of the quieter dales and brew beer. Guller sighed and went back to his post. He knew he'd never leave this land, whatever happened. He just hoped his bones wouldn't soon be tossed into some pit in Cormirian soil. He wanted to see the realm at peace again before he died. Donath Marleyear gasped and reeled as his descending sword suddenly came alive with sparks from end to end. He was still trembling helplessly when the young man with the glass in his hand set it down on a side table— loped to him, and removed his sword, then kicked the front door shut, and took Donna's throat in the crook of one elbow. Vangida Hast, smiling faintly, said, Two daggers at his belt, and one in his left boot. Deft fingers plucked out the indicated weapons and tossed them away. They landed with steely slidings atop the discarded blade, and Giyogi Wyvernspur said pleasantly to his prisoner, "'Come and sit down. "'Cattle, oh, have you met my wife, Lady Cat Wyvernspur? "'Sorry, should have introduced you straight away. "'Cat'll be most upset if Vanji has to fry you with some spell or other, "'tends to ruin the furniture and leave nasty stains and what not. "'Unhand me,' Donna snarled, struggling to get his breath. "'He drove a vicious elbow backward.' but it seemed to strike some sort of tingling barrier. Ah, uh, ah, uh, Giyogi reproved him. Play nice. Wizard, Donath roared, ignoring his captor and trembling with a rage that suddenly threatened to consume him. You have betrayed your king, the crown, and Cormir. You have brought the realm to the brink of war. The royal magician raised his eyebrows. There is a fire in our young nobles that I sometimes wish could be kept alive as they grow older, and much wiser. Still, I am pleased to see that you can distinguish between the differing calls of monarch, rulership, and realm. Very few of your fellow blue-bloods can. I assure you, Donath Marleyear, son of a family which has demonstrated expertise in determining loyalties, to be sure, that I am acting for the betterment of all three. "'Spare me your lies,' Don spat as Giyogi sat him down in a chair, smiled like the gracious host he was, and wordlessly offered Donneth a glass of wine. The young noble struck it sharply upward, so that its contents splashed into Giyogi's face. He then launched himself across the room, tearing out the dagger from its sheath in his sleeve, a dagger that Vangertahast did not know of. Lady Wyvernspur rose, lifting her hands and starting to mutter words, but Donath had already looped one long arm around the royal magician of Cormir and brought his dagger to the old man's throat. It struck some sort of barrier, and fire blazed from it. Donath ignored the sudden heat and pressed it in harder. Deceased young Marleyear, 
I have no interest in slaying a loyal son of Cormir. The pain was excruciating now. Doneth leaned into it with all the strength in his shoulders and snarled, If such a great threat to the realm I love is destroyed, the loss of my own life will be worthwhile and gladly given. Gods, I wish I heard such heartfelt words from more men of Cormir, said an admiring voice from somewhere off to the left. Doneth raised his eyes from watching his dagger tip turn slowly red, inches from the wizard's hairy, scrawny old throat, and saw a single, shadowy form standing in an inner doorway. The watcher took a step forward and smiled as the lamplight fell across his face. Doneth gasped and dropped his dagger. His hands slowly fell away from the wizard, who rubbed his nose, shook himself, and went straight to the wine bottle on the side table where Giyogi, who was wiping at a nose that still dripped wine, had left it. "'You're getting old, Vangine,' the man at the doorway said gravely. "'Old and forgetful,' Vangidahast replied, raising the bottle and not bothering with a glass. "'Perhaps I should start considering my own replacement, eh?' Doneth was staring at the man by the door. When he could finally speak, he asked, "'But—but but if you're here, then what's going on at the court? Who's trying to rule Cormir?' "'A lot of folk, lad,' the royal magician said with a smile. "'A lot of folk. The reasons lie in the past. But to see the unfolding of their fruit, we must adjourn to the palace. Bring your sword. By now, they'll all be waiting for us there.'" 32. Gondigal, the Year of the Dragon, 1352, D.R. The watchfires burned in a rough crescent along the hilltops south of Arabel. Each fire marked a thousand men, purple dragons, local militiamen, adventuring bands, and mercenaries. All were poised and ready for the assault on the rebellious city, come the dawn. Arabelle itself lay like a sparkling gem against a dark and dusty field of paddocks, tilled fields, and caravan grounds. Within its walls, the city blazed with light, the light of its own watchfires, of torches and lanterns, and of candles and magical radiances. Despite their shine, the surrounding watchfires would be visible in the city like a row of low, reddish stars. Neither the people in the city nor in the camps were getting much sleep this evening. In the largest camp, the king's pavilion rose like a hulking purple mountain against the stars. Beneath its highest peak, the war leaders were gathered. Paunchy Baron Thomdor and balding Duke Baru anchored one end of the table, their faces hard twins of concern. Aside from a narrow aisle, left bare along either side of the table, the room was crowded with chairs occupied by mercenary captains, militia leaders, and war wizards. Their attention was on the long, linen-covered table, littered with papers, messages, reports, and diagrams. In the center of its clutter, wrought by magic but appearing as if sculpted of alabaster, was a three-dimensional model of Arabelle itself. At the table's head, in a low, carved throne of duskwood, sat King Azun the Fourth himself, seventy-first of the Obersker line, face furrowed, hand reflectively stroking his beard. The royal magician, Vangidahast, stood to one side of his liege. He was the only one presently on his feet, and when he was addressing the gathered commanders, he would stalk the length of the table. For the moment, he stood bent over Azun's right shoulder, looking every bit like the king's pet raven, perching. "'We know he's in there,' said the king, eyeing the sparkling white model of the caravan city. "'He, his men, and those who have flocked to his banner in the past three months,' Thomdor replied grimly. His forces had spent those three months chasing the self-styled bandit king over most of northern Cormir. Eight days ago their prey had alighted in Arabel, crowned himself Gondigal I, with a crown snatched from a Sembian tomb, and dared any other man to take that crown from him. 
No one knew Gondegal's origin, though he claimed the blood of kings ran in his veins. One thing was certain, as even Thomdor had to admit. He was a determined and charismatic leader of men. Time and again the baron had drawn up for an attack, only to have the forces he faced melt away into the fog and the forest. And with every near defeat, Gondegal's legend grew and with those exciting tales had grown his supporters. On the first of the year he was unknown. Now, three weeks after Midsummer Eve, he had encouraged Arabelle to revolt once more and made it the seat of his own nascent empire. In his declaration, Gondegal had laid out his new, nameless kingdom as running from the Wyvern Water northeast to Tilver's Gap, and from the desert of Anorak, southeast deep into Sembian territory. In reality, he ruled only as far as his sword would reach from the saddle of his ever-moving war-horse, but that did not lessen the effrontery of his demands. The Purple Dragon would not allow half its territory to suddenly cleave to a new ruler, even one as charismatic as Gondegal. That declaration had been seven days ago, and for seven days Arabelle had held its breath as the new king readied his defences. For seven days the forces of loyal Cormir, bolstered by allies who stood to lose land to Gondegal's kingdom, tightened the net around Arabelle. "'Whoever he is, he served in uniform somewhere,' said Duke Beru, pointing to the alabaster model of the city." He's worked wonders in a handful of days. All three gates have been fortified, and he's built outrider towers to cut off blind spots along the walls. Guard patrols have been doubled, water taken in from rivers in every jug and cask for miles around, and ballisti have been spotted in the major towers. This is no uprising of frustrated merchants. This foe knows his business.' "'And all he need to do is hang on to the city long enough to cement his hold on it, and he has us,' added the baron grimly. "'He literally only has to repel the initial assault. If we settle into a long siege, we'll be hurting Arabelle itself.' "'And what of the people of the city?' asked the king. "'Arabelle has revolted so many times before that they have it down to an art form.' said the duke bitterly. The merchant livestock and caravans have been pulled north, and the paddocks are empty. Gondegal will likely have mages in the outbuildings or missile-armed troops. Most of the townspeople have emptied their basements and are willing to wait out the duration there. The temples have been stockpiling food and water for a long time, it seems, and triple guards stand over all the wells." One of the mercenary captains, a rough barbarian from the lands north of Flan, broke in with a snarl. Bah! Then let us burn this ready fortress to the ground and slaughter all within its walls. Let their pyre be a warning to others who might think to thwart your king's will. A silence descended on the table, as if a lid had banged closed. Vangertahast broke away from the throne and drifted down along the table until he stood next to the barbarian captain. The mercenary looked to other faces for support, but found none. All he saw was shock and indignation. Vangertahast put a heavy hand on the barbarian's shoulder. "'The reason,' he said, pressing down with a grip like the tightening gauntlet of an armored giant— is that the folk in that city are Cormirians, regardless of who leads them. They will be treated as loyal citizens of the realm until such time as they choose to actually raise arms against the Purple Dragon. "'But if they are in rebellion, haven't they?' asked the mercenary, wincing, his words cut short by the increasing pressure on his shoulder. "'They are our people,' said the wizard through clenched teeth. Half the army would desert if they had to fight their own brothers and cousins. We will treat them accordingly. He released the mercenary captain, who exhaled and rubbed his shoulder. The mage had more power in his hands than mere wizardry. As has been said, Arabelle rebels with astounding regularity, said the king softly. 
Yet it has always returned to the shelter of the purple dragon's wings. One thing the long history of this land has taught my family is that creating grudges only perpetuates our difficulties. He met the eyes of the mercenary captain and added, Let me remind everyone present that this attack is no excuse for pillaging and looting. No one is to set any fires except by order. If the person fleeing from your sword is a civilian, he is a target you will not strike at, molest, or maim accidentally. I'll consider that clearly understood by all of you. See that your men also clearly understand the punishment they'll face if they forget such things. One of the militia leaders piped up. Can't we convince just one of these loyal Arabellans to open the gates for us? The king shook his head. They are cowed by Gondegal's swords and his popularity. Once battle is joined and we rout a few of his stalwart swords, the populace will rise on our side, but for the moment all of them are lying low. The folk here are fickle, but dependably so. One of the wizards asked, What about the noble houses? Have they thrown in with Gondegal? Baru spoke up in reply. A few of the minor houses have, the Immer Dusks and Indesims being the most prominent. The Marla Ears, the largest Arabellan house, have remained loyal. Most who bear that proud name are under house arrest now, keeping a few of Gondegal's troops busy guarding prisoners rather than manning the walls. Most of what we know about what's going on inside has come from the Marla Ears, added Thomdor. Magical reconnaissance has been largely ineffective. On that note, said the king, this is the battle plan for the morrow. Vanjertahas nodded and waved his hands. A series of purplish blocks appeared on the table outside the walls of the model city. As the wizard spoke, the blocks moved toward the walls. The militia will form on the left flank and mount a faint attack on the high horn gate and northwest wall, while the mercenaries will make a sally against the south gate, more to draw fire and force a committal of defenders than to earnestly take the gate. The bulk of the army, on the right flank, will move along the long southern wall. The intent is to make Gondegal's forces think the bulk of our army is moving to the east gate to attack there. In fact, the forces under the duke will move farthest east, the forces under the king will stand to the center, and the forces commanded by the baron will assemble at the western end of the front. Small blocks detached from the larger ones and swept around the city to east and west. Light cavalry will break off at this point and cut off both east and west gates to provide an impediment should Gondegal's forces choose to bolt. They will include a few war wizards. Our main body of forces will hold the majority of our mages, the baron, the duke, and his majesty. A series of small flashes appeared along the southern wall in front of the largest block. The war wizards will bring down the wall in this area with lightning bolts and instruments of blasting. There is a potential for severe damage in the buildings immediately north of the wall, so while the first wave secures the area, the forces who are to penetrate the city must get past any ruin and move swiftly. Later we can examine the fallen buildings for survivors. Goodbye, wink and kiss muttered Thomdor, thinking of his favorite tavern, located on the far side of the wall that was to be breached. With the walls blown, the wizard continued, the main force will split up. Thomdor's men will take the south gate and let the mercenaries in. Together, they are to cleanse the breached area of hostile troops and hold it, in particular, holding any relatively unblocked streets and emptying the buildings along those streets in case a route of retreat is needed. Baru's forces will enter the city and move to the east gate to take it. But even more importantly, to contain any enemy troops mustered there. The king will lead the main body across the city to the citadel of Arabel to surround it and to try to force its gates. If we surprise them, 
and moves swiftly enough, it is likely we'll snare most of Gondegal's army in the city proper before they can regroup at the Citadel. And if they do manage to gather at the Citadel, asked the mercenary captain, Gondegal can hold out in Arabelle indefinitely, said the king. But unless he has substantially more food, plans, and men than we think he does, he cannot hold the citadel for long if we hold the city around it. The signals you already know. Pass on the orders to your subordinates, and let all see to their weapons and prayers. We'll march before the sun crests the horizon, and launch the attack at dawn. A messenger in bright mail arrived to say the allied Symbian troops had arrived and were already complaining about their accommodations. The king smiled thinly and declared the meeting at an end. Chairs scraped and men rose, talk rising in the usual babble. The purple dragon pointed at his two cousins and at the wizard. They remained as the others went out. A solid plan, said the king. "'Working with your suggestions,' the wizard said. "'Mated to the thinking written down in the court war files, "'there are table-sized piles of plans for attacking Arabelle. "'Even during years of peace, "'it was a common practice for military scholars "'to attack a model Arabelle with tin knights and dice.' "'Azun glanced at the city model, "'then folded his hands before him and steepled his fingers.' The question is, he said slowly, what happens afterward? General amnesty, Thomdor replied. We get Gondegal and his chief subordinates and hang them for their crimes, then use the treasure he's looted for reparations, added Baru. Troops will remain in Arabelle, ostensibly to repair the wall, said Vangita Hast, but should remain thereafter in any case. Arabelle is a frontier outpost. It should have sufficient protection. Agreed, said the king. Cousin Thomdor, you will head up the Purple Dragon forces based here afterward, much as Baru controls the High Horn forces. Both cousins nodded. What of the nobles? asked the wizard. What of them? asked the king. The talk in the court lays the weakness in Arabelle at the collective feet of the Marla ears said the royal magician. All we know of Gondegal's preparations has come from the Marla ears, Thomdor said with a frown. Old Jolathan Marla ear risked a pair of daughters as messengers. The Marla ears are not to blame, said Azun. If anything, our own complacency brought us to this pass— wherein a charismatic impostor king can raise an army in a fortnight and seize a city in a season. True, but you know court politics, Vangita Hast replied. Bleth, in particular, has reminded me of his contribution to this venture and of his great interest in seeing the Marla ears fail and a true Cormirian family have their seat in the city. Lord Bleth wants it badly. Lord Bleth will have to be disappointed then said the king. My cousins are right. It would be unfair to punish the Marla ears after they risked so much for us. Besides, if I install a Bleth or anyone else who still thinks true Cormirians means born and raised in Suzale, I'll have another revolution on my hands before the decade is out. Anything else? There was nothing else, and the king retired to his personal tent, while the two cousins peered at every detail of the white stone model, pointing and plotting. Vangita Hast left them to it, and wandered to the southern edge of the camp, away from the city. Here the posted guards were widely spaced, and the shadows between the fires deeper and larger. Night held sway, however many swords were gathered under it. He waited, counting the stars in the southern sky. After about ten minutes, a voice hissed from the darkness. Black sword. Meets green shield, the wizard replied. To make red war, the darkness responded and broke away from the shadows to stand before the wizard, one of Vangita Hast's spies. Let the royal cousins depend on nobles for information. Any wizard worth his contrips 
had his own methods and his own servants. The spy was a young woman in dark cape and leathers. Nothing gleamed upon her save an oversized golden ring on one hand. Her dagger's sheaths, one on each hip, were wrapped in dark leather. Her face was soft and cherubic. "'My lord wizard,' she said, "'I bear news.' "'Speak,' said Vandra de Hast. "'Gondegal is gone,' she replied, almost chirping. "'Gone? How so?' "'Vanished, faded away, evaporated with the summer dew,' the spy said happily. "'How comes this to you?' asked Vandra de Hast. "'Through one of his captains,' said the girl. "'Or rather, one of the sword captains he left behind. "'Gondegal, a half-dozen of his closest aides, "'and the treasure he's pillaged for the past three months, "'all have suddenly gone missing from the Citadel. "'The surviving captains have their collective undergarments "'in the proverbial knot over this, "'but for all their hunting about the city, "'up roof and down cellar, there is no sign of their heroic master. "'And what are their plans in the absence of their leader?' asked Vandra de Hast, smiling in the darkness. "'The mages who allied themselves with Gondegal have already left the city by their own powers. "'The remaining leadership is split. "'But the larger faction supports freeing the Marley ears to plead for mercy with the king on their behalf.' "'Vandra de Hast patted his wide belly with both hands.' "'Return to the city, then, and pass this message on to the Marla ears. "'There will be a general amnesty, provided the gates are thrown open to the king at the first approach of his forces. "'Gondegal's men should be waiting, unarmored and unarmed, at the base of the citadel. "'The king will pardon all who are there, but hunt down the rest to their deaths. "'Can you get that message back?' "'Without a doubt,' said the spy." I go. In good fortune, the wizard murmured and watched her fade back into the darkness. His eyes never could follow her far. Gazing into the night, Vandra de Hast permitted himself a broad smile. Then, mastering his face and emotions, he turned and strode back to the king's pavilion. As before, Gondegal had chosen to run rather than fight. But this time he'd left a city behind, a city that would laud the arriving king as a savior and forever crush the bandit king's hopes for an empire. Not a bad little war. Arabelle regained, and its loyalty ensured for the next generation, with not a drop of bloodshed. They'd have to check with the outriders, of course, but the wizard believed his spy. There would be no report of any horsemen fleeing the city, no signs of any foul play among Gondegal's supporters, no bodies turning up mysteriously, and in the morning they'd form up as planned, in full array, and go ahead. But instead of death and falling walls, the gates to Arabelle would be swung wide, and the city would be spared. The king would get flowers instead of swords. But, Best to tell Azun alone about this, the wizard reasoned. If a surrender did not occur, the army of Cormir would have to proceed with the attack. Men braced to fight would respond well to celebration, but men expecting a surrender would not be ready for battle. Vandra Hast's route took him through the wide circle of outward-facing purple dragons, who passed him through with silent nods of recognition. He proceeded around the pavilion and along the back of the king's private tent. The low light within cast the shadow of the royal occupant onto the canvas. No, two occupants' shadows, silhouettes moving and merging. Through the tent walls he heard gasps, heavy breathing, and soft sighs. The wizard cursed to himself, even on the eve of battle, in the middle of an armed camp, Azun could not keep his obrascir blood from boiling over. There have been enough misadventures over the years to teach any king a little prudence, but the hard-headed kings of Cormir never seemed able to care about the danger inherent in trysts. Vandra Hast circled the tent. A single guard was posted before the hoop-arch tunnel that led to its door. 
The noise and shadows were not obvious from this side, facing the crowded camp, and the wizard thanked Timora for the king's good sense, or blind luck, in choosing his bedroll spot. The guard was fresh-faced and young, a new conscript from some country town. "'Tell the king to contact me as soon as he is done,' the royal magician said in a loud, brisk voice, then lowered his tones and added, "'And see that the young woman is escorted quickly and quietly from the campground as well.' The youngster goggled at the elder wizard as if he had suddenly spoken of flying dogs. "'Done?' asked the youth, his voice cracking. "'His Majesty was retiring for the evening "'and dismissed me from his quarters. "'There was no woman there then, "'and none have passed me since.' "'Vangita Hast looked at the boy, "'but could discern no lie on that set, firm, loyal face. "'He peered to the right, "'and the guard turned to look that way as well. "'With a snarl, the wizard brushed past the guard on his left, and the confused youngster snapped a quick protest and then trotted into the tent after the wizard's fast-moving back. The king's personal sleeping quarters were at the back of the tent, behind a fabric screen that muffled both sound and light. The wizard burst through these and cursed at the sight. King Azun was lying on the raised divan he always used on campaign, his armor and robes both set aside. Astride him was a woman who wore an open red gown, and not much else. She had one hand raised, and that hand bore a bone dagger, ready to plunge into the king's chest. Vangita Hast's curse slid into a snapped spell, simple magic quickly effected. A gust of air filled the tent, booming its sides outward and hurling the red wizardess from her perch. The wizardess was on her feet in a moment with the grace of a panther, backing away from the divan toward the edges of the tent, keeping a zoom between herself and the wizard. The young guard had the presence of mind to snatch at his belt whistle and sound an alert. "'A murder is foiled.' said the wizardess, but a greater theft has been made. She put her hands on her hips and smiled at Vangerdehast. Tell your king that Thay thanks him for his gift. Vangerdehast pointed at the woman, and spears of blue fire lanced out at her. She shouted some brief words, then became a swirling, fading mist. The magical missiles scorched tent fabric or seared grass, and shouts arose from the guards. Suddenly angry purple dragons with swords in their hands were running into the tent from all directions, shouting, The king! The king! A sudden, silent flash of light made them halt and blink. Its source was the belt of the royal magician. Men of Cormir, he snapped, I order you, in the name of Azun, to stop trampling the king's gear and forthwith search the camp and the grounds around, moving out as far and as fast as your legs can carry you. Look for a sorceress in a red gown. Bring her back alive if you can, but bring her back. A Thavian, tall, barefoot, long black hair. Take custody of any woman in camp that you do not recognize as one of this company. Bring all such to the pavilion. Go. They'd find nothing, Vangerda has knew, but at least their departure would let him get a look at a zoon before it might be too late. Men in armor streamed around the wizard for a moment, and then he was alone with the king. A zoon seemed unharmed, but mazed in his mind, not seeing the wizard bent over him and mumbling when shaken. The effects of a magical charm. Vangerdehast touched the brow of his sovereign with his fingertips and muttered words that should unwind any spell in the Thavian arsenal. King Azun IV grunted, grimaced, and grabbed at his forehead. The shattering of his thrall apparently bestowed a cranial punishment akin to a hangover. What, what happened? the king muttered, blinking in the lantern light. A Thavian assassin, Vangela Hast announced. She's been driven off. She? asked the king, frowning. Then, slowly, he nodded. She? Yes, 
she appeared out of nowhere, all shimmering robes and soft scents. She had a name. Brandy? Brannon? I thought she was a dream. A nightmare, Vanger de Hast replied softly. The king shook his head firmly. I hate assassins. Apparently clearing out the fire knives was not enough. When we are done here, we're going to have to outlaw assassins and red wizards to boot. But we're not done here, said the wizard softly, spreading a blanket over the tired monarch and calling to mind a spell of magical purification and another of shielding. First Gondegal and Arabelle. Then we'll take on red wizards and assassins. We'll take on anything that threatens the crown or Cormir, whatever its origin. Trust me on this. The king smiled sleepily. Good old Vanji. Trust me. Trust me on this, said the fat wizard, his voice carrying the strength of iron. As always... Thirty-three, at the brink, year of the gauntlet, thirteen sixty-nine, D.R. The hall of the dragon throne was one of the oldest parts of the court. Oberskiers had walked here for more than a thousand years. Tall, fluted pillars ran down both sides of the lofty chamber, supporting a wooden gallery added by Palagard the Second in one of many renovations performed on the site over the years. Between the lines of columns, in the open area that was usually crowded with murmuring courtiers, stood the great sealed stone tomb of Beerobel the Mage, its surface worn smooth by the touch of a million hands over the countless years. Facing it was the lowest step of the short, curving flight that led to the high dais. On that bright-polished height stood two arch-backed chairs of state for the princesses of Cormir, and between them the filigreed throne of the Dragon Queen and the taller, simpler, far older dragon throne itself. All of them were empty. "'Why are we here, love?' Crown Princess Tanalasta asked, nestling against Onadar's shoulder. Something about their lover's stroll felt wrong. They had never come near the throne room before. Some folk are going to meet us here, and if all goes well, something important is going to happen, Onadar Bleth murmured. The dark-paneled doors partway down the room opened, and a group of young nobles strode in. Gaspar Cormeyrel led them, and behind him, Tanalasta recognized Martin Illance, Morgago Dauntinghorn, Reth Crownsilver, Cordrin Huntsilver, Bregor Truesilver, and others. Tanalasta stood very still. This has the look of a meeting of state, she said, and stepped quickly to a bell pull to summon guards. The cord came away in her hand and fell to the floor. It had been cut through with a sword. No alarm sound. That is not right, Tanalasta said, and three quick strides took her back to Onadar to pluck at his sleeve. Onadar, what's happened? Why are we gathered here? The road ahead for Cormir must be chosen, Onadar said, turning to face the high dais, as if he expected more figures to suddenly appear there. Your father has died, he added shortly. We think he died some time ago, and that foul wizard, our royal magician, hid that fact from us all, hoping to take the throne before you could be crowned. Tanalasta reeled and then clung to him, fighting down sudden tears. Azum, Papa, oh merciless gods, her mind flooded with memories of a smiling bearded face, hands gently helping her to toddle her first few steps, or sweeping her up onto a saddle so high that she shrieked in fear. Or Onidar must have known that the wizard was going to appear by the throne. He was watching, hard-faced, as the air shimmered and glowed on the broad step below the thrones where men knelt to be knighted and envoys to plead. When the light died away, three men stood on that step. 
the fat old royal magician of Cormir, and on either side of him a grim noble holding a drawn sword. Lord Giogi Wyvernspur was on the wizard's right, and young Donneth Marleyear on his left. Tunnelasta stared up at them through helpless tears. What was going to happen? Was there going to be a fight? She turned to ask Onadar, only to discover that she stood alone. Her lover had walked back to stand with Gaspar Cormeril and the other young nobles. The crown princess looked from the trio by the throne to the confident line of nobility, and a sudden chill shook her. Father, she cried silently, come back. Cormir needs you. I need you. A voice cut through her anguish, a crisp, measured voice that struck her like ice water. The fates of our king and his two cousins have left a perilous lack of authority in Cormir, said the wizard Vanger de Hast, particularly in light of the current dispositions of Princess Alasair and Queen Filfero. The whereabouts of both remain unknown. We can only presume they are in hiding. Moreover, Crown Princess Tanalasta is, by her own words, unwilling to take up the crown at this time. His words echoed around the room. One of the nobles stepped forward and raised his head to speak, but the royal magician went on. I will act as regent until the princess is willing to assume the throne. If, at the end of five years, she has not done so, we shall meet again. The wizards, high clergy, and nobles of the realm, all together in council, to debate the future of the realm. Until that time, there will be no council of nobles or anyone else in Cormir. I shall assist the princess in making ready to ascend the dragon throne, and she shall marry her fiancé, Onodar Bleth, during this time if she desires to do so. I hold here, the mage raised a piece of parchment over his head, a writ of regency signed by Queen Filfero. It names me, rightfully, what I now claim myself, Regent of Cormir. Tanalasta stared up at the wizard, torn between grief and loneliness, and now, in the midst of that loss, a rising rage. The old wizard was seizing Cormir as his own, and it was all her fault. She could have stood strong against him. She could have insisted on his kneeling to her, but she had not, and now it was too late. But why had father left her so unprepared? And where was Alasair? Where was Mama? Stolen away, as if by magic. Magic, of course. In the face of such dark power, how could she hope to lead the realm? Eyes swimming with tears, Tanalasta turned to face the line of nobles again. The next words would surely be theirs. "'You are sadly mistaken, Lord High Wizard,' Onadar Bleth said coldly into the waiting room. "'And as usual, you sadly overreach yourself.' On their slow, numb way down the room to look at the nobles, Tanalasta's eyes fell across the doors the nobles had come in by, and there she saw a shadowy figure step forward and wave to her. Tanalasta almost fainted. There was no mistaking that face— those gestures, and now a finger going to lips to counsel silence, and a grim motion to hold on. Tanalasta bit her lip hard enough to draw blood. The figure was already drawing back into the shadows beyond the doorway, when she managed to marshal enough control to manage a careful, regal nod. "'Look at yourself now,' Onadar Bleth was saying, "'as we do, alone, save for a few misguided lackeys of minor houses. Yet you stand making demands and issuing orders with only your own pride to give them any authority. Wizard, you remain in Cormir only at our sufferance, and you will be allowed to stay only if you accede to our rightful demands. We need no skulking, manipulating regent, but our proper queen." His shout rang back echoes from the high ceiling of the chamber, and was answered by a second roar of approval from the nobles who stood with him. 
The inexperience of the princess will be addressed by a guiding council of nobles, whose deliberations will be open for all the folk of Cormir to hear. My dear Tanalasta and I will be wed forthwith, and, as consort to our queen, I shall chair the council and ensure that it acts in a just and honorable manner. Onadar stepped forward, eyes alight with excitement, and pressed on. In return for your peaceful agreement to this, Lord Vanjurdahast, you will be permitted to keep your title and be awarded a seat on the council, though your secretive and disloyal war wizards must and shall be disbanded. The time of Oberskir kings who rule without regard for the people, trusting in the murderous spells of their own private pet wizards to keep them in power over a populace that fears and hates them, is past, and such days will never return to Cormir. The people shall be free at last. As if they'd waited for his words as a cue, a rabble of other courtiers, joined by a few clergy and high-ranking court officials, burst through the double doors at the end of the hall and surged forward, their boots thunderous as they passed through the paneled doors. They surged forward, voices rising, and the nobles already in the room turned to see what this new disturbance was. In time to see a concealed door open in one of the pillars down the hall, and the sorceress Cat Wyvernspur step forth. Her hands were already raised, a wand clutched in one palm, and her mouth moving. She turned, faced the advancing throng, and suddenly waved her hands outward dismissively, and the foremost priests and courtiers ran into an invisible barrier. Said barrier did nothing to hamper sight or sound, but permitted nothing solid to pass through. Thrown caps and daggers tested it for a few moments, but Cat had already turned to calmly face Bleth's nobles already in the room her arms crossed. One of said nobles, Martin Illance, clapped a hand to his sword-hilt, looking meaningfully in her direction, but she caught his eyes and shook her head ever so slightly. Illance's hand fell away to his side once more. "'More foul magic!' Morgago Dauntinghorn snarled, and the words had scarcely left his mouth— when another secret door opened in another pillar, and a grim line of purple dragons strode out to stand with drawn swords, barring the way of the conspirator nobles. A grim Larith Guller led the soldiers, and the center of their line was anchored by his superior, Hathlan Talar. Most were battle-scarred veterans, but at the end of the line stood a new recruit, uncomfortable in his stiff new uniform, but whose sword twitched with eagerness. All the purple dragons bent their burning eyes on the luxuriously dressed young nobles. "'More foul magic indeed,' the royal magician said into the deep silence. "'Think for a moment.' of just how well a hundred nobles would fare if they were ever sent against a hundred war wizards. Onadar Bleth smiled crookedly, and said in silken tones, I have done so, and have an answer. A blade that I am confident can cut down a hundred war wizards. He raised his hand and made a quick, intricate gesture as he called, Hear us, Lady Brantara. Attend us, Red Wizardess of Murbant. A moment later, as everyone in the chamber watched in breathless silence, a cluster of moving, winking lights appeared at Bleth's shoulder, and a low, purring voice that carried from end to end of that hall spoke out of it. Greetings, Vanger de Hast, royal magician of Cormir. Call me... Brantara, call me your nemesis. Long have you wondered who it was who shielded rebels and contrary nobles and outlaws from your seeking spells, and who protected them against your magic of rulership and punishment. 
I stand ready now to shield all the other nobles of Cormir who desire such protection from you and your petty magelings. I am the bane of the war wizards. I am the one who has frustrated you for so long. Vangerdehast shifted and stirred on the step where he stood, but said nothing. The triumphant voice rolled on. You think these were your masterminds, these clever young nobles, unable to see beyond the ends of their swords? Mine was the hand that stole the Abraxas from your precious vault. Mine was the skill that took your king's will on a night eighteen years ago in the sight of the walls of Arabel. Mine was the body that bore the sun who will be your next king. Onadar Bleth's head snapped around in surprise. He gaped at the sparkling, circling lights as the voice from the heart of them added, No, nobles of Cormir, that the war wizards you fear so much will be shattered within the season and gone utterly soon after, as I and those mages loyal to me ensure that each war wizard is hunted to extinction. There was a brief but sharp chorus of gasps and murmurs from the courtiers crowded up against Cat's barrier. The next words spoken, though they were soft, cut that noise off, as if a knife had fallen across their throats. And who will protect Cormir against the red wizardess and her wizards, then? Vangita Hast asked mildly, taking another step down from the throne. Giyogi and Doneth moved with him, their eyes watchful. "'Protect Cormir against me,' came the low, rich voice out of the lights. "'Why, I know and love the realm well. "'I have borne a son by King Azun to prove it, a future king.' More murmurs, and even some laughter, came from the crowd of watching courtiers just inside the entrance to the hall. The gathering of lights hissed a deep curse, and the laughter quieted, but the murmurs continued. Even the densest courtiers realized the minimal value of an unrecognized son of Zoon. Alasta cast a look at the doorway where she'd seen the figure that counseled her to silence and then looked away again. "'This land has had enough of kings,' Onadar Bleth said firmly. "'And despite what you have just heard her say, this red wizardess and I have a solemn agreement on this point. I know not the measure of Thavians, but noble families of Cormir keep their word and expect others to do the same.' "'Do they?' Vangerdehast's voice was as soft as silk, or the edge of an over-sharpened dagger. I am pleased to hear of this new shift in their natures. Onadar Bleth showed anger for the first time, tossing back his head to glare up at the old wizard. Don't bandy words about falsehoods with me, wizard. For over a thousand years and more, the Bleths have served the crown of Cormir well, fighting and dying for their country. Yet somehow the Oberskiers they served so loyally managed to overlook the Bleths time and time again. One can grow used to being taken advantage of, but one need not grow to like it. Now the blood of the Oberskiers has run weak indeed, and the Bleths shall be overlooked no longer." Now will come the ultimate service to the Oberskiers and to Cormir, the fusion of the proud lineage of Cormir's two oldest families into one bloodline, a bleth bloodline that shall not hold the dragon throne in a tight-taloned tyrant's grasp, 
but share rule over the forest country with all of its people. He turned to the crown princess and smiled coldly. The power I have come to love. Tanalasta's lips trembled for a moment as she struggled to find the words she wanted to say. But when she did speak, her voice was firm and high and clear. I am shocked, Onadar Bleth, to learn that you love me only for my station and lineage and the power you can wield through me. Do you care so little for Tanalasta the woman? There was triumph in the young noble's eyes as he looked into hers and shrugged. It matters little if I love you or you me, he said callously. What matters is that the power of the Oberskiers be dashed down, and the wheel of time move this land into brighter, fairer times that all citizens can agree with. The old Cormier died with your father, its last king. There was a gasp and stir that rose almost to a shriek, as the figure that had skulked in the shadows of the doorway strode slowly and purposefully into the room. When the watching crowd saw the crown glittering on its head, their cries died into instant, heavy silence. "'I find your presumptions a trifle premature, young Bleth,' said a voice that everyone in the room knew. "'And I order your surrender. Kneel to me, your true and rightful king, Azun Oberskir, a man who—' despite your best efforts, is not dead just yet. Onadar Bleth turned white and swallowed. He looked quickly around the room, as if seeking ways to escape, and then drew himself up proudly, eyes blazing. No, I am no lesser man than you. Why should I kneel to a man whose time is past and whose morals demean us all? Why should I kneel to a man who should be dead? Why, the low voice from the lights at Bleth's shoulder purred, should you kneel to a dead man? A coldly, darkly beautiful female voice rose into view among the whirling radiances. It was a face Vangerdehast had seen before, the night before the fall of Arabelle. From its eyes leapt two red, ravening beams of light, the noble, standing with Gaspar Cormeril, screamed and ducked for cover as the magical beams cut through their ranks and stabbed at the king. The rays burst into raging flames upon striking an unseen barrier. The eye-beams clawed futilely at a barrier that shielded the grimly smiling Azun and washed out along it, revealing the true dimensions of the barrier. The barrier was anchored at three points— one point was the sorceress Cat, who held aloft a small white oval, a talisman of protective power. The other two points were in the hitherto empty minstrel's balcony, high above the king, where two people rose stiffly, holding similar talismans. One of the two in the balcony was a harper, with hair the color of honey, and eyes like two dancing flames. Emthrara. The other was a bright-eyed, unshaven merchant dealer in turret tops and spires named Rolligan. Ripples of Brantara's ruby-red radiance rushed across the barrier now, streaming toward the three ovals at its extremities, and then reflected back, like ripples in a small fountain, to its center. The flames, meeting there, flickered, pulsed, and burst forth as a great reaching tongue of fire, which roared back at the face in the light, with frightening speed and fury. The red wizardess screamed. Her features vanished under the onslaught of her own returned magic, and sobbing howls of pain echoed off the vaulted ceiling of the hall for a moment before the lights winked, flashed, bright again, and the agonized face was gone. In its place stood something gleaming and golden, something that stood like an upright, motionless bull. "'The Abraxas!' a dozen voices exclaimed in horrified unison. 
Onador Bleth smiled tightly and said, Thank you, Wizardess, for restoring my clockwork toy. It needs a human soul to power its magical engine, and my Lady Brantara has thought even of that. He placed his hand along the back of the golden beast. There was the sharp click of a switch being thrown, and Onidar pointed at Gaspar Cormeril. "'I have need of your noble spirit, Gaspar,' shouted Onidar. Gaspar Cormeril screamed. The noble allies who previously stood alongside him now scattered like frightened fowl in a barnyard. Gaspar pawed at his ornate vest and pulled forth a large ruby, given to him days earlier by his friend Onadar Bleth. Green and crimson flames erupted from the gem, spreading along his chest and arms as if they were coated with oil. Gaspar writhed in helpless, rising agony as the mystic fire consumed him. The green, flickering flames grew into a green snake of crackling, magical force, a twisting, questing rope of radiance that climbed over the heads of the nobles and then descended like a vengeful arrow to strike the Abraxas. Strike and be absorbed. The golden bull pulsed with green light, and the flames left the tottering, shriveled body of the stricken noble, infusing the Abraxas with life energy. Gaspar Cormeiro fluttered like a dry leaf caught on grass in a high wind, and then collapsed into dust. Not even his bones survived to hit the floor. The Abraxas rattled, shook, and moved, raising its head and shifting its shoulders with a heavy clank. Its head began to turn, and Onadar, fairly leaping with glee, pointed and shouted to direct the automaton at the king. This time there would be no mistake. Forgotten on the dais, the royal magician of Cormir quietly finished casting a spell and let his hands fall, a grim smile on his lips. Suddenly the crown princess burst into motion in a swirl of robes, racing to stand in front of her father. No, Onadar, you must not do this. Onadar's intent, ruthless expression, did not change. "'Join me, my love,' he hissed between clenched teeth. "'Throw off your heavy past, and join me in a brighter future. "'I will comfort you, care for you, protect you, "'in a way that these others never will.' "'Tanalasta recoiled from the look in Onadar Bleth's eyes, "'but her gaze did not leave him. "'She looked neither at Vangertahast, nor at her father, nor at the assembled, trembling nobles. Instead, her mouth formed a smooth, thin line. No, she said simply, I will not. Stop this madness now. His glittering eyes shifted from her in an instant, dismissing her, and turned back to his quarry, Azun, who stood calmly and quietly, watching the metallic doom come down upon him. Tanalasta raised her hands, as if she could stop the steadily advancing Abraxas, and shouted, "'Onadar, stop this! Don't!' Onadar lifted his lips back from his teeth in a wolfish grin, and a hissing began. The poisonous breath of the Abraxas rushed out, swirling like smoke, but did not reach the terrified princess." Instead, it struck something hard and hitherto unseen in the air before it, something large and curving. The smoke-like breath of the beast stole outward along it, revealing the great curve of another barrier, this one a sphere that enclosed the Abraxas, and with it, on a dar bleth. On the steps below the throne, the wizard Vangertahast's smile tightened. Giyogi looked at him. Just for an instant, he saw the glittering stare of the ruthless hunter in the old mage's eyes, and from below them came the raw sound of Onadar's disbelieving scream. The Abraxas breathed again, and the sphere could be seen clearly now as deadly vapors swirled within it. It was moving with the clanking monster, proceeding slowly down the hall of the dragon throne toward the king. Tanalasta turned an instant before the magical shield would have touched her. She stepped backward one step, 
then a second, and rushed into her father's embrace. Azun's arms went around her and held her firmly. Behind her, Onadar's scream broke off into choking, frantic hacking sounds that went on and on as the smoky sphere advanced. Tamalasta turned in the king's arms to stare at it in horrified fascination. Her treacherous fiancé was going to die, but would he be the only one? Were they going to be able to stop this golden clanking horror? Was it her imagination, or was the sphere growing smaller? The Abraxas hissed again, and through the rising smoke of its breath she dimly saw Onadar bend double and blindly stagger away, only to strike the far side of the sphere. He clawed weakly at it, and then slid down into the swirling smoke. The sphere was drawing in around the golden monster. Up on the dais, Giyogi and Donath both caught sight of sudden sweat bursting into being on Vangerdehast's brow. They turned to the old wizard, opening their mouths in identical protests of concern. The sweat was running off his old nose and dripping deft spell-weaving. On the dais, between Wyvern Spur and Marla Ear, Tanalasta noticed Vanger de Hast sagging like a man gravely wounded. Cat lifted her hands in shaping gestures, and Vanger de Hast shouted as folding up in violent, wrenching contortions. "'What can we do, Sir Wizard?' Donath hissed, but Vanger de Hast set his teeth and made no reply. His eyes were steady on the sphere below him, the sphere that was dwindling rapidly now. It reached the edges of the Abraxas itself, which stood hard and golden against it, though only for a moment. Then the golden automaton bent over sideways with a deafening crack of shattered metal. Tortured golden plates shrieked in protest as the sphere closed inward steadily. There was a splash of crimson as the body of Onadar Bleth was broken along with the golden creature. Then there was another scream, the inhuman scream of crumpling metal. Something tugged at Tanalasta's hands. It was Cat, placing the oval talisman into the she closed the fingers of the crown princess around it, gave Tanalasta an encouraging smile, and stepped a pace away, raising her hands in a quick, deft spell-weaving. On the dais, between Wyvern Spur and Marla Ear, Tanalasta noticed Venture de Hast sagging like a man gravely wounded. Cat lifted her hands in shaping gestures, and Venture de Hast shouted a single tortured, almost unintelligible word. The sphere vanished, consumed in a sudden ball of flames. Tanalasta flung a hand over her eyes, an instant before the fire became blindingly bright. Then the hall of the dragon throne rocked under the force of a blast that hurled flames up in a roaring column to scorch the ceiling, but touched nothing else. Cat Wyvern Spur whose spell had directed the flames harmlessly upward, reeled back into the Oberskiers, father and daughter. Azun's other arm found its way around her as well. The spent sorceress sagged against the king's shoulder briefly, then immediately disengaged. The ragged panting of the magess was suddenly loud in a chamber that had grown silent again, all within the hall of the dragon, royals, Spellcasters, purple dragons, and nobles were silent for a moment. The sphere was gone, leaving only a scorched circle on the marble tiles. Onadar Bleth was gone. The Abraxas was gone. And on the steps beside the throne, the old wizard rose unsteadily, his hands on the shoulders of two faithful nobles. Vanger de Hast cleared his throat and roared, the king is restored to us. Long live the king! The ceiling echoed back the royal magician's words, and they rolled out and down the room. Someone in the crowd of nobles cried, Long live the king! Other voices joined in an instant later. The king! The king! Long live the king! 
A zoon, roared the purple dragons, their swords flashing straight up in salute. A zoon! Long live the king! The chant was spreading beyond the room now, resounding through the palace as wandering people flooded toward the hall of the dragon throne. Long live the king! The roar echoed around the hall like thunder, and then an old noble burst into tears and went to his knees. Azun, lead us. Long live the king, the chant came again, but it seemed to be coming almost entirely from outside the chamber now. Inside the hall, man after man after high-born lady were going to their knees, and another, and then another, until only the king, Tanalasta, and Vangidahast remained on their feet. Donneth dropped to one knee, but kept his sword ready and his wits sharp for one last attack. Donneth let his gaze drift to the face of Azun, who was smiling quietly and nodding to noble after noble, and to faces in the line of purple dragons, and then to the smiling face of the crown princess. The heir to House Marleyir looked at that face thoughtfully for a long time. He knew that both Lord Wyvern Spur and Vangidahast had noticed his intent gaze and followed it to its destination, and he did not care. Gods, but she was fair. He could kneel to a woman like that. Donneth drew in a deep breath, noting that Tanalasta had not yet wept for her lost love, Onadar. Perhaps there was hope yet. Donneth Marleyir heir to a stained family name, sprang to his feet. Long live the king, he roared like a lion, raising his blade in flashing salute. Azun's head turned in time to see Giyogi's blade flash up to join Donath's, and then the old man between them giggled like a schoolgirl. Sudden mage fire shaped a sword in his hand, too. The three blades swung up together, as Cat, Azun, and Tanalasta laughed as one, and the three men on the steps thundered, Long live the king! Long live Cormir! The echoes of their shout were so thunderous that only Giyogi and Donath heard the old wizard's muttered addition, This ought to be worth a feast. Epilogue Year of the Gauntlet, 1369 D.R. The conspirators, real and incidental, were gathered in Griffin's Blade Hall. The king's sickbed had been removed, and the original furnishings replaced. The windows that had been sealed for fear of contagion were now flung wide, and below them the city of Suzale was spread out like a blanket, leading downward to a cool blue sea that mirrored the sky above. Somewhere down there a bell was tolling, long ringing peals that cascaded through the streets. "'The king lives,' said Cat Wyvernspur, nodding her head towards the bell's joyous clangor. "'Long live the king!' The king, in question, was playing chess with Cat's husband, Lord Giyogi. Giyogi would stare intently at the board for many minutes, then carefully nudge a piece to its new location. Azun would then stroke his beard twice, reach out, and make his move. Giyogi would sink his chin into his hands and return to his intense concentration. "'How's the game going?' she asked, stroking Giyogi's shoulders. "'Totally engrossing,' her husband replied. I've tried every variation in the book, but I can't crack his defenses. Worse, every time he repulses one of my assaults, I'm in a worse position. He's won three games so far, and in this little slaughter, I'm down two turrets and a purple dragon already. Cat smiled fondly at the top of her lord's head, exchanged a solemn wink with the king, and took up a ewer of wine before sauntering over to where Vangidahast, Donneth Marleyir, and Tanalasta were deep in conversation. The royal magician looked over at the game in progress. "'How is young Lord Wyvernspur doing?' "'Badly,' said Cat, 
pouring herself a goblet of blood-red wine. He's baffled by the king's masterful defenses. Should I let him in on the secret? asked the mage, his eyes twinkling. Secret? Azun never plans out his moves in chess, said the wizard. He just moves what catches his fancy at the moment, thinks of a move, does it on the instant, and, bless my soul, it's usually right. Cat chuckled. Oh, don't tell Giyogi. His Majesty beat him twenty-seven games straight when we were keeping him in the basement. My poor husband was up half the night memorizing chess variations of the masters of old Impiltur, just on the chance of getting one more game in. I think he'd be crushed if you told him. Giyogi let out a curse, and the king answered it with a mighty laugh as he took the noble's queen and forced checkmate. "'Looks like he's crushed anyway,' said the wizard, loudly enough for the two combatants to hear. "'It was a Thescan double-counter gambit,' said Giyogi mournfully. "'I didn't stand a chance after the tenth move. "'One more noble crushed beneath the heel of the purple dragon,' Azun said, smiling. "'It's good to see you up and around again, sire,' said Doneth. "'But I'm puzzled as to how you were cured. "'It was my understanding that no magic worked against the venomous disease in your blood.' "'Ah!' But that's exactly the point, said Vandra Hast. The blots of disease in the Abraxas's venom were all enwrapped in their own dead magic zones. Spells couldn't reach the disease itself through the zones, and so His Majesty could not be cured by magic. But those very zones held the key to defeating the disease. Donneth looked puzzled. Warming to the task, Vangerdehast went on with the enthusiasm of a proud crafter of magic. We bled his majesty, then enchanted the blood we collected, a simple spell, Nystal's magic aura, that would just turn the blood magical, except, of course, the parts of the blood surrounded by dead magic zones. The disease, precisely, then we worked up a spell to teleport enchanted blood to another container. That left the diseased blood, with its tiny dead zones, back in the original container, since it could not be affected by the spell. Then we infused the king again with the purified, magic-free blood. Doneth shook his head. But you couldn't do that with all the royal blood at once, or his majesty would die. And such a process is like diluting wine. The taint grows thinner and thinner, but there will always be some scrap of disease left. Again, correct, the wizard replied. But eventually, the healthy blood overwhelmed the tainted, and the body of the king began to heal naturally. We had to effectively replace all of the blood in the king's body twice before his natural resistance could deal with it. Doneth goggled. But that must have taken days. I can't think of anything else so time-consuming. And painful, added the king, taking a seat with the others around the table. Giyogi, still shaking his head, moved to where a cat perched. She handed him a goblet of wine, and he held it in one hand, rubbing her bare shoulder absent-mindedly with his other hand. It is not, Azun said feelingly, a process I care to repeat. Nor will it be, the Lord High Wizard responded. Now that we know the process, we can craft a spell to duplicate its effects in manifestation. And as much as I want to take credit for the process, it is almost entirely the work of Dimswart and Alafandar, our devoted sages. I'm afraid I was caught up in other things. No, said Tanalasta with a solemn smile. You were too busy scheming and dreaming up plots against the crown. And successfully, I might add, said Cat. Don't blame our good wizard too much, child, said the king. When I was a lad, one of the lessons he taught me was that things are not always what they seem, and that the most evil people can put on a good face if they are after something— while this blood process he's so gleeful about was going on, I was as weak as a kitten. 
So I gave Vanjurdahast orders to keep everyone in the dark and let him spin out all the dark intrigues he could think of, so long as he didn't bring all-out war to Suzale or bring the palace down around our ears. Separating the wolves from the sheep, Giyogi said brightly, or the wheat from the chaff, or the mill from the floss, or whatever. Ay, said the king. The power of the Cormerals, the Bleths, and the others whose acts were treasonable is now broken. Their lands are seized, their titles are stripped from them, and some will be exiled. I'll not be slaying more folk than have already died, however. That's one lesson I've learned from Vanjurdahast and his forebears. The realm is stronger than any one man and it's always best not to bleed away the best of its stock in wasteful executions. "'I've made it known,' Vanjurdahast added silkily, "'that any interpretation of this clemency as a weakness of the monarch would be a mistake, almost certainly a fatal mistake. However, letting the threat of execution hang over a man seems quite a useful tactic,' Azun agreed." Those who supported the traitors, but were not immediately involved in the plot, have either recanted, or are heading for Sembia, Westgate, or Waterdeep, with all the haste they can muster. And those who recanted, or denied their allegiance to the conspiracy, know they are being watched, Cat put in. Knowing that, they are going to be on their best behavior, trying to prove their loyalty like the youngest and most enthusiastic of knights for the next few years. And they will not be the only ones, Vanjur de Hast added slyly. I made it a point to personally thank the families who sat on their hedges, blowing neither hot nor cold, as the realm almost pitched into the abyss around them. "'Particularly the supposedly loyal Hunt-Silvers, Crown-Silvers, and True-Silvers. "'I'm sure they'll spend the next few years trying fervently to prove their loyalty to the Crown as well. "'And what of those who passed your little test?' asked the Crown Princess, "'her eyes darting to meet those of the old wizard. "'Those who risked life and limb when they were convinced Lord Vanjurdahast was a traitor.' She lowered her gaze to the floor and added, As I did. One of Vanjurdahast's large and hairy-backed hands closed over hers. Lady Highness, he said gently, How could you have thought otherwise? The wizard rose and struck an actor's pose. After all, I learned how to act from the best tavern dancers in Suzale. My performance, I'll have you know, was peerless, simply peerless. Tanalasta tried not to laugh, then snorted helplessly, and then roared. Vanjurda Hast blinked at her, affecting an air of innocence, and Azun's rich mirth rolled out to join them. When at last she could speak again, Tanalasta asked, Seriously, father, what about those who remain true, like Marley Ear and Giyogi? And Vanjuta Hast's mob of agents, including the Harper M. Thrara and that turret salesman, the king snapped his fingers. Rolligan, a royal writ absolving them from any charges, should do the trick, particularly for the Harper and the merchant. And there are absences to be accounted for and holes to fill, continued the king. For instance, with the passing of loyal Thomdor, I need a new military commander in Arabelle. It strikes me that any candidate for such a post should be brave, loyal, and come from a local Arabellan family, so that the city will never go into rebellion again. Young Marleyer, are you up to the task? I? asked Marleyer, dumbfounded. I, I, he slid from his seat, dropping dazedly to one knee. "'Are you sure, sire?' "'We'll save the ceremony for later, in front of the full court,' said Azun with a smile, leaning forward to clap the young man on the shoulder. "'But you'll be a good warden of the eastern marches. 
It's good to see someone care so deeply about Cormier. Moreover, your naming to that title will send a message to a number of people about their own place within my kingdom. And as for you, Lord Giogi, please, sire, said the wyvern spur lord, raising a restraining hand. I am quite content with my life in immersy. I desire neither a military post nor a rank. Good to hear it, for I was going to offer neither, said the king heartily. Baru's place at Highhorn needs to go to someone with fighting blood. Perhaps that bishop of the Black Blades, Gwyneth. Don't take offense, young wyvern spur, but I don't think even the most capable courtiers could survive you for long, or rather your unique method of crashing head-on into problems and wrestling them into submission without ever understanding them. There was a general round of chuckles. Giyogi reddened and ducked his head. "'By the gods, I wish half my nobles were as much fun as you provide,' Azun murmured, then straightened himself and boomed, "'Nay, Wyvern Spur, into your hands I give the Cormeral lands in toto, which should quintuple your income, as well as your responsibilities. I hope you are up to it. "'He'll have a little help, sire,' said Cat, taking her husband's hand. Giyogi opened his mouth and then closed it again without saying anything. He tried the process over again several times, and then helplessly poked Cat with a finger. She looked down at him fondly and said, "'Your Majesty, Lord Wyvernspur, is so honored that he's speechless for the moment.' There were chuckles all around once more. Azun raised his glass in salute to his dumbstruck noble and added, I look forward to playing chess with you again in the near future, too. Even Giyogi managed to chuckle, a rueful one this time. I have one question, said Tanalasta, curling her feet up under her where she sat. Once you knew you were going to live, did anyone else know about it? "'Well, I had to tell your mother,' said Azun. "'It wouldn't do to have her find out that I was alive through court gossips.' "'And I sent word to Alasair,' added Vanger de Hast, "'through my war wizards, so she'd not worry, "'and wouldn't come galloping home to defend the throne "'against the forty or so nobles who were already riding with her.' "'So what you're telling me,' Tanalasta said to the wizard, her tone firm and her voice level. Is that I was the only one of the immediate royal family who did not know my own father was alive and expected to remain so, and I wouldn't have to take the throne at all? Well, you might have told Onodar, and, well, said the wizard, before trailing off into silence, that silence suddenly held sway over the entire room. The crown princess leaned forward. "'Another of your little lessons, eh, mage?' Tadalasta pressed. Vanjita Hast cleared his throat. "'Your Highness, as much as I respect your abilities, I have a duty to the crown, and as such must protect it as best as I can, whatever the personal cost. "'And I can't be the shy, dutiful daughter forever,' said the princess quietly. She sighed and then lifted her chin and added, "'I cannot afford the luxury of being a royal wallflower. I've decided I must develop my own self, my own strengths, and my own goals.' She stared into the old wizard's eyes and added, "'If I do not, I'll always be a pawn, regardless of any apparent power I hold, and no matter what crown I wear.' "'Well, I wouldn't put it in quite so many words,' Vanjita Hast replied, reddening and pointedly ignoring the smile that was growing on Azun's face. "'I would,' said the princess, crossing her arms. "'Since this whole matter began, I felt unprepared and unready, unprepared to deal with my father's illness, unready to deal with the vicious fights that promptly erupted among the nobles.' and unwilling to take the throne on my own. That will have to change for Cormir to continue. 
and you, wizard, will help. Vangerdehast stood up and bowed low to her. When the crown princess calls, I will do everything in my power to advise and to aid. Tanalasta shook her head. No, I'll not be your puppet any more than I should have been Bleth's. I want your real help. Long ago you and my father went traipsing all over the kingdom, did you not? Uh, yes, said the wizard carefully. It was necessary for a prince to truly know the realm and its people. And not a princess? asked Tanalasta sharply. Vangerdehast shrugged. Well, I suppose we could make a few trips. You'll need some proper walking boots and warm, sensible clothing. And you should know the bath water in the wilderness will be colder than you're used to. He seemed to remember something and added brightly, There may be weird tigers. Azun looked at the ceiling, but Tanalasta thought she saw the beginnings of a smile at the corners of his mouth. "'But I'm told my snoring isn't all that bad,' the old wizard continued. "'And these old bones can still carry me a little way. "'But you already know most of what I could teach you— "'history, accounts, genealogy, and the like.' "'You can teach me magic,' said Tanalasta flatly. "'In all his years with Vangerdehast, Azun had never seen him stammer.' The royal magician's eyes opened very wide, and he stammered now, his mouth flapping as he tried to get out the words. Oh, ah, uh, oh, w well, there's never been an Oberskir mage before. Then it is seriously overdue, said the princess, and you're the one who said that the kingdom needs both spells and swords to keep afloat. So what say you, mage? The wizard looked rather helplessly at the others. Donath Marleyear stared at him intently, face carefully expressionless, but eyes leaping with excitement, urging him to say yes. That one was going to be a diplomat, the wizard thought, and looked elsewhere. Giyogi patted Cat's hand and raised a goblet in toast to the idea. Azun spread his hands and said, "'It is your decision, royal magician. "'Of course I can refuse my eldest daughter nothing.' "'Vangerdehast let out a deep sigh, "'one that seemed to come from the core of his being. "'He blinked once, then smiled faintly. "'Very well,' he said, raising his own goblet. "'Once more into the breach, for crown and for country, "'for king and for queen, and most of all, for Cormir. 